Today we got a story time of a spoiled kid who thinks his dad actually owns the school. Like his dad is the CEO of the school, owns it, therefore he can do whatever he want and do whatever he wants to other people. Yeah, so uh, this is a pretty crazy story, so sit back, relax, subscribe to the channel if you're new. Leave a like on the video to claim your free nothing, as always. And with that being said, let's just jump right into it. Alright, so at the subscriber school, there's a kid who we're going to call Billy. And uh, Billy was a, was a spoiled kid. He was your standard spoiled rich kid. You already know how it is. And as most spoiled rich kids, his parents literally gave him anything he wanted, which kind of d diluted and destroyed the whole like idea of money, the idea of value, the whole idea that you can't just have everything that you've ever wanted. And also, he's never had to work for anything. I mean, here's the thing. There are parents of like that have a ton of money, but they still make sure to instill the right values in their kids. Like they're still making sure that their kids are getting summer jobs if they want something. They're making sure that they're not paying for everything. And if they are paying for something that it actually makes sense, like, oh, my kid needs to eat. Okay. It's like, oh, my kid wants diamond, I don't know, studded cane or something. I, I don't know, man. Then obviously they wouldn't, they wouldn't buy that. But unfortunately, Billy was a spoiled kid and his parents didn't really care. So anyways, right, one day, um, Billy must have been riding back with his dad. And this part of the story is a little hard to tell because obviously the subscriber was not in the car with Billy. But it was just like overheard from different rumors and different people. But basically what happened is Billy, the spoiled kid, was, you know, in the car riding back with his dad, and he was on his phone, I don't know, right, playing some game or something, but he, it's not like he had AirPods in, he wasn't listening to music, because he heard what, uh, you know, Billy was, or Billy's dad was saying. So Billy's dad was on the phone with the principal, and they were having some kind of conversation or something. I think Billy's dad, like, I don't know, like, did some stuff for, maybe he did do some stuff for the school, maybe he gave, like, donated some, something, or maybe he volunteered, I don't know. So Billy's dad did have some affiliation with the school. However, Billy, the spoiled kid, was sitting there, and hearing that his dad was talking with the principal, somehow came to the conclusion that since his dad was on the phone with the principal, he must actually own the school. So I don't know what Billy's dad said that made him believe that, but I think Billy's dad must have said something that he wasn't like, oh, and since I own the school, he didn't say something verbatim like that, but he must have said something that made sense in context, but since Billy, the spoiled kid, didn't hear the whole conversation and also wasn't hearing what the principal was saying, must have misconstrued that whatever was being said was a conversation that confirmed that his dad owned the school and not that his dad was helping out with the school, which is what actually was happening. So right, after that, um, Billy kind of had like a massive ego blow up. And since he's a spoiled kid, he already has a pretty decently big ego for no reason. But now that he believes that his dad actually owns the school, his ego is like 3x what it was before. So the next day, Billy came in with like a newfound sense of confidence. It wasn't as if he wasn't confident before. I think, as I have already said, he was, you know, the spoiled kid. He was pretty confident, right? However, he had this newfound kind of sense of confidence after falsely believing that his dad actually owns the school. Um, so anyways, he comes into class. In the first period class, he has with the subscriber. So he sits down, not right next to the subscriber, but close enough to the subscriber, and um, so he's sitting there, and the subscriber is listening. And this, at this point, this is a firsthand account since the subscriber sees all of this. There's some kid who we're going to call Ben that was in between the subscriber and the spoiled kid sitting. Like if the spoiled kid was on the far left and uh, Ben was on, or the subscriber was on the far right, Ben was in between them. So, anyways, right, uh, the subscriber overhears Billy, the spoiled kid, drop his pencil, right? And he looks down and he looks at Ben. And he's like, Pick up that pencil for me right now, peasant. And Ben's like, dude, shut up. And the subscriber's like, do you know who my father... Oh, sorry, the spoiled kid is like, do you know who my father is? And the subscriber's like, what? Like, no. He's your dad. I, I don't know. Remember, at this point, the spoiled kid is convinced uh, his dad owns the school. Therefore, ah, yes, I can be a jerk to anyone I want. Hmm. So, yeah, uh, when Ben heard this, he kind of just rolled his eyes and was like, whatever, man. And the spoiled kid is like, your insubordinance is noted and will be reported to my father. And the subscribers just kind of like, oh my god. Because everyone kind of knew the spoiled kid as kind of being a spoiled, entitled kid. But they, this was like a whole new level of just like, wow, really? 
Really? Like, this is just a whole new level of, damn, this kid spoiled. Anyways, though, so yeah, sure enough, the subscribers come just like, okay, whatever. However, the thing is, things continue to go on, and things continue to get worse. And as the days went on, Billy the Spoiled Kid just became more and more unbearable. Like, this kid was becoming an actual pain to just live with. So, uh, yeah, basically the worst was in lunch. Um, so in lunch one day or the next or during that day, he went up to some kid and was like demanding, demanding like his lunch money. Basically, he was paying like it was a toll to the like it was it, it, Billy was set. You know, when you go on the road and you have to like make those stops if you drive really long, those like those toll booths where you have to pay money to pass through. Uh, basically, the uh, Billy, the spoiled kid, went up to some kid and said, You are now in, and he says his last name, family's property. You must pay the toll. Please give me five, like three, do or some amount, right? Whatever amount was like this kid's lunch money. And the kid was like, uh, Dude, no. He's like, Your insubordinance is noted and will be reported to my father. Uh, if you are banned from the school, then uh, don't come crying to me. That's all I'm going to say. And the subscriber overheard this, and he was like, oh my god, this kid is actually the worst. And so the next day, uh, you know, Billy, this the spoiled kid, was uh, walked into the lunchroom, and there was a massive line. The subscriber was about midway through the line. I, I think today it was, you know, some kind of, like, special food day that they all liked. Maybe it's Taco Tuesday. I don't know, man. Uh, anyways, though, so everyone was pretty excited, so the line was pretty long. Usually the line wasn't as bad as this, as kids wouldn't be as, you know, admin of being, like, getting in line, going for seconds, whatever. So when, you know, Billy, the spoiled kid, walked in and saw such a long line, he was like, this shall never do, and he starts walking to the front of the line. The subscriber notices this and is like, ah, oh, no, like, no shot this kid actually thinks he can just waltz on in to the front of the line like no one else is here. But sure enough... You know, the spoiled kid, Billy, starts walking and it tries to cut the entire line. So obviously everyone's like, dude, like, what are you doing? And he says, well, you know, I just thought you guys would want to be on my good side and let me cut the line. So obviously everyone was like, ah, oh, hell no, nah, bro. What are you saying right now? Everyone was just so confused why this kid is like, I think you want me to be on your good side. Like, dude. Why would they care if they're on your good side or on your bad side? Like, I, I doubt that, like, they care any bit about that at all. Anyways, though, but the spoiled kid is like, I think it would be a smart investment for you guys to allow me to cut the line. Because remember, at this point, the spoiled kid is working from a kind of perception that he is truly, like, the ruler of the school. And I don't know why he's acting as if everyone else knows that, too. Like, if he only... Let's say uh, let's say his dad owned the school, and he truly was the ruler of the school. Why did he not know about this until two days ago? And if he didn't know about this until two days ago, why is he acting as if everybody else knows as well? It just literally makes no sense at all. So yeah, everyone is like, uh, screw off, kid. Like, we're not giving you our spot in line. Stop being ridiculous, everything like that. And this spoiled kid, you know, gets super mad and is like, you're all going on the bad list or whatever. And he goes to the back of the line. So yeah, at this point, the spoiled kid shenanigans are not like getting him ahead in any way, but also they're definitely not helping. at this. And, and they're also starting to get really, really annoying. So anyways, Billy, the spoiled kid, his, uh, his, his attitude slash behavior got worse and worse and just continued being bad. However, this reached a breaking point for the subscriber and everyone else in Billy's class one day. So one day, after weeks and weeks of just utter nonsense coming from Billy, Billy just took it a little bit too far. So during recess, uh, you know, the swings are pretty popular. Um, the swings are kind of like the place to be. And the thing is, it's kind of like first come, first serve, and everyone kind of knows, like, all right, you spend five or ten minutes on the swings. If there's obviously some kids waiting around to get on them, just be courteous, be a, a good member of your community, and just, you know, get off the swings and then let them go on, and they'll probably do the same. It's definitely a kind of like, you know, the community is going to watch out for the community. And also, if you were known for hogging the swings, bro... The, the kids on the swings probably aren't going to give them up to you. So it's definitely like a big picture. You want to work with your group, whatever. So anyways, one day, 
someone was on the swings. And the spoiled kid, Billy, wasn't really known for liking to go on the swings, but I guess the day he decided to change things up and he was going to go on the swings. So he goes over to the swings and he says, Peasant, get off this swing for your king right now. Honestly, I think if Billy the spoiled kid was nice about it, and maybe said something like, hey man, like how much longer do you think you want to be on the swings? Like I think I'm gonna want like I would personally like to like get on there at some point, but just let me know. Um if he said it like that, I bet he would have had a decent shot actually of being able to get on the swings. But it's the fact that the spoiled kid said, Hello, peasant, get off the swings immediately before like I I off with your head, or before I just like absolutely just like decimate you in front of the court like bro what are you talking about right now anyways though so yeah sure enough the kids like no so at this point uh, some other kids are around some of them are waiting for the swings some of them just happen to be nearby and they witness this whole thing go down and the spoiled kid says you disrespect my authority because he's looking around and seeing that everyone else is noticing this you will be punished severely and he walks over and he pushes this kid off the swing and the kid falls over and like hits his head. So he has to go to the school nurse. The spoiled kid is like in timeout or gets a very light, moderate punishment. But at this point, all the kids kind of like get together afterwards and are like, dude, the spoiled kid has gone way too far. Real quick, if you made it this far into the video, comment school down below. That'll be the secret word of the day. And also, if you, are use, if you use Spotify and you don't listen to these stories on Spotify, my Spotify is linked, first link in the description, and also the only link in the pinned comment. And finally, up until the summer, we got a little bit of a challenge, a community challenge. It's the binge watch challenge. So uh, basically go down the comment section and comment how many videos you've watched today, how many videos you watched this week, whatever you want to put. Uh, here's some people on screen right now that have done so. Uh, thank you to these people. Thank you to you. And with that being said, let's get back to the story. So anyways, right, Billy has gone too far. The spoiled kid has gone way too far. And everyone at the school is in agreement on that. So yeah, sure enough, they come up with a plan. Uh, they come up with a plan of action to fix what's going on. So anyways, one day at lunch, or the next day at lunch, I should say, they all go, uh, Billy's sitting at a table alone. He can't eat with the peasants, by the way. He must eat at his own little royal table. But he goes up, they all go to Billy. And they all kind of like surround his table. And Billy looks up and he's like, yes, peasants. Mm. And the subscriber's like, dude, we've all come to agreement. You're acting like a little jerk recently. You got to cut this out or, you know, or in this, in you know, the spoiled kid's like, well, before even the subscriber could say or what they were going to do, the spoiled kid, who was just so shocked because he had never been talked back to before, and he just couldn't possibly imagine that the peasants would be so bold as in to talk back to their superior. You know what I mean? Is this like, oh my, oh good heavens, like you would talk back to your superior like that? Are you serious right now, guys? Um, so he's just so taken aback. And, um, you know, it, it, he's all just like... That's, you guys are making a big mistake. My father owns the school. And they're all looking at him. And they're just like, dude, your dad doesn't own the school. And you just can't boss us around like that. Even if he did, you can't boss us around. But he doesn't. So it's not even, not even if you're bossing us around on something that makes sense. And the spoiled kid just blew up on them. He was so angry that they would question his authority, right? Um, and he's just like... <sighs> Uh, uh, starts shouting, you're all just jealous of me because my father is rich. I can do whatever I want and you will always be lesser than me. You must submit. You're better off submitting before I destroy you all. And so everyone around the table is like, oh my God, this kid is so cringe and lame. I didn't know you could be both like that. Uh, so yeah, all the other kids just kind of look at him. And then they looked at each other, and then they nodded. They all nodded at each other because they were all in agreement that action needed to be taken. Yeah, so uh, sure enough, they, they're still at the table. And after, like, the spoiled kid finishes his, like, crazy explosive, like, freakout session, he's like, the subscriber says, look, dude, we're all in agreement. So either you're going to quit, you're going to cut out with all this, like, peasant talk and trying to cut us in line, bossing us around, and overall just being a jerk to us, and you know what you're doing. You know what, you're, if you keep on doing that, we're not going to allow you to do anything. And the spoiled kid's like, excuse me? And the subscriber's like, yeah, we've basically talked to the entire class. They're not going to let you play Foursquare. 
They're not going to let you on the swings. They're not going to let you do this during recess. They're not going to let you do that. And basically, the subscriber goes down a whole long list of basically everything at school that was fun. Um, the whole class was going to basically block them. Think of this of like some kind of like blockade or whatever, just as a leverage tool. Loki kind of smart from the subscriber and his friends. And the spoiled kid is like, you guys don't control me. I can do whatever I want. And the subscriber's like, all right, man, like, that's fine with me. You can do whatever you want. Like, that's fine. Like, kind of whatever, man. And the spoiled kid's like, ugh. It doesn't bother me at all. I will have fun all by myself. So sure enough, the subscriber, like, kind of looks at the other kids and kind of gives them a nod. And they all go back to everyone else saying that the spoiled kid was not being cooperative, so to block him from anything fun. So over the next couple of days, the, the spoiled kid is not allowed on the swings. The spoiled kid is not allowed to join them during Foursquare. The spoiled kid is not allowed to do this. No one is talking to the spoiled kid. Basically, hold it, like, basically saying, you're not allowed to have fun here until you stop acting like a jerk. So finally, after a week, the spoiled kid, when no one else is looking, goes up to the subscriber and is like, look call off your blockade, I'll stop being a jerk. And the subscriber says, okay, one more thing. So you guys might be thinking, what is that one more thing? And the subscriber's like, I need you to apologize. And the spoiled kid's like, oh my god, oh my god, I'm oh, sorry, oh my god, oh. And the subscriber's like, okay, that's good enough for me. And he says, I'll tell everyone to like, quit with the blockade. And the spoiled kid's like, good, like fine, I'm sorry. Spoiled kid walks away. Everyone lets the spoiled kid back into doing whatever they're doing. And uh, yeah, sure enough, uh, the spoiled kid was no longer a jerk. He might have still thought his dad owned the school, but he wasn't a jerk about it. If you want to support the channel, click on the video on screen right now. And if you're listening on Spotify, uh, click on another story and peace. Today we got a story time of a spoiled kid who literally thinks that he rules the world. Let's go. Call the subscriber Andrew. So this all happened when Andrew was about in like, I think like fifth grade or so, and there was a new kid who moved into his neighborhood. And this was over the summer, so Andrew has not met this kid yet as he would probably meet him next year or when school started in the fall. But the new kid's mom re got on Facebook and connected with all the other Facebook moms in the neighborhood and was kind of just reaching out to them, being like, hey, you know, my son is new to the neighborhood. He's going to be starting school in the fall, and I really want him to have a good time. Can, can he, like, meet some of you guys or whatever? So one night, one, like, summer night or whatever, Andrew's mom arranged that Andrew and her would go over to the new kid's house and so Andrew can meet the new kid and they can become friendly before school starts. And also so Andrew can meet the mom as well. Uh, anyway, so that night, you know, rolls around and, you know, they get into the car and they drive over. And, you know, Andrew is talking to his mom. He's like, Mom, I don't think I've ever been to this part of the neighborhood. And Mom's like, well, this is a very special part of the neighborhood as they approach a gate. Basically, this was like the gated community part. And a lot of times, gated communities are kind of like places and neighborhoods that are like protected by like a gate that goes all around them. And it normally costs a lot of money and the houses in there are a lot. A lot of people enter the gated communities just because they have a lot of money and they don't want people coming in or whatever. So this is the first time Andrew has ever been to this part. And he's like, wow, like I've never been to a place like this. And Andrew's mom is like, yeah, Andrew, it's probably gonna be a pretty nice house too. So, you know, have fun over there or whatever. So they get to the gate and Andrew calls up, uh, Ben, that is the name, but I'm, if we're doing names, Ben is the name of the spoiled kid who lives at this house. Andrew's mom calls up Ben's mom, and, you know, Ben's mom's like, oh, yes, the, the, the code for us is, like, 4772 or something like that. So she enters that in, the gate opens up, they go through, and they're going down, and Andrew's just looking out the window at all of these spectacular houses. And it's just like, oh, my God. Like, I never knew that this part of the neighborhood actually existed. So eventually they pull up to Ben's house, and it is a wonderful house. It is a obviously a quite expensive house, too. They pull up, they, you know, pull into the driveway, they get out. Andrew and Andrew's mom walk up, and Andrew's like, oh my god, this house is insane. And Andrew's mom's like, I know, but don't say anything like that when you get there. And Andrew's like, I know, mom. They get up, they knock on the door, and Ben's mom greets it. It's like, oh my god, hello there, guys. You know how moms greet each other. Hello. And Andrew's mom's like, hi there, and gives like a little hug or whatever. And, uh, you know, Ben's mom's like, well... 
Uh, ben is upstairs. I told him to come down, but he's in the middle of one of those video games. You know how it is. And they both laugh, and Andrew's like, what? And, and, and Ben's mom's like, well, Andrew, just, just run up there. Run up into Ben's room. He'll say hello. So, you know, Andrew's like, all right. Andrew goes up, kind of goes up the stairs, knocks on the door. It's like, yo, what's up? And you could hear Ben be like, like, go away, mom. And Andrew's like, hey, it's not your mom. And you just hear like a silence. And then you hear, open the door. And so, you know, Andrew opens the door, walks in. And Ben is in the middle of like, I don't know, like a Fortnite game or something. He's playing some game and he's completely like occupied. He's like, hello there. Uh, what was your name? Andrew's like, Andrew. Ah, oh, Andrew. Hello. Um, I I'm pretty busy right now. So feel free to just take a seat on my bed. Actually, no. Can, can you stand? Can you stand? Is that okay? Andrew's like, yeah, that's, that's, that's fine. That's fine, I guess. And so Ben is just going away, playing his, like, Fortnite or whatever, and Andrew can hear the two moms downstairs laughing at something that probably wasn't that funny that the other one said, but you already know how it goes. But anyways, eventually, you know, Ben, you know, he loses. He's like, boom, slams his fist on the table. He's like, God damn it. And he turns around. He's like, yo, what's up? Hey, sorry. Weird introduction. My name's Ben. What's your name? And Andrew's like, I just said that, but he doesn't say that. He's like, ah, my name's Andrew. And then Ben's like, well, uh, don't expect me to remember that. I might have to ask again. And Andrew in his head is like, dude, well, I'm coming to your house because you wanted to meet people. Are you serious? But anyways, right? Andrew just kind of like bites his tongue and is like, all right, whatever. So, and Andrew's like, so what do you like to do? And, uh, you know, Ben's like, I don't know. I like to play Fortnite. I like to take my uh, my parents' cars for a spin. What cars do your parents have? And Ben's like, oh, no, no, don't even tell me. Let's go to the window now. So Ben leads him to a window that looks outside, that, like, looks out at the cars because he's looking at the car that was parked. And Ben is like, oh, that's so sad. That's so sad. I don't even know what kind of car that is. And trust me, trust me, if it was a nice car, I would have known. And Andrew in his head is like, oh, my God. This kid probably had to leave the old place he was living because he, he burned all the bridges with anyone he could have been friends with. Oh, my God. And Andrew's like, well, um, yeah, it works. It's a car. It got me from my house to here, so it, it functions. And Ben's like, well, I guess kind of. I'm surprised it isn't falling apart right now. Like, when's the last time you get that checked for, like, raccoons living in there? Oh, my God. And Andrew's just, like, looking at him like, what? And Ben's like, come, come here, come here. They walk downstairs, and Andrew and Ben's mom's like, oh, look at those two. They're already becoming such great friends. No, 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 they weren't. But, but anyways, right, Ben leads them out, and he's like, all right, man, come over here. He brings them to, like, behind, like, the backyard of his house, and it, it, it's a pretty crazy house. Like, there's a massive backyard, and then there's this garage, and it's a car garage. So Ben's like, take a look at this, and he takes out this, like, clicker, and he clicks it, and then, like, this garage door starts to open, and there are four freaking cars back there, and it's, like, Mercedes S-Class, Aston Martin, it's, like, the fanciest freaking cars on planet Earth, and Ben's like, look at these babies, like, these are insane, these are all my dad's cars, like, my mom has this, like, stupid G-Wagon or whatever, but these cars, these are how you get all the women, bro, and Andrew's like, okay, and Ben's like, yeah, these cars go for at least $200,000 each at auction. Unlike most cars that depreciate and fall apart, these actually age like fine wine. I don't know how, but that's what my dad said. And Andrew's like, Andrew, do not beat this kid up. Do not beat him up. He deserves a punch in the face, but don't do it. Don't do it, Andrew. Don't do it. And Andrew's like, so cool. And Ben's like, of course it's cool. It's awesome. My cars are awesome. There's not even a question. There's not even a doubt in my mind that they are the best cars ever. Oh, wanted to take a look at your car again? And Andrew's like, nah, I think we took a, a, good, a, a good enough look. Anything else you want to do? And Ben's like, ah, uh, I don't know. Let's just go back upstairs, I guess. So they walk back upstairs. And Andrew, as he's passing his mom, Andrew's mom looks over. And Andrew makes his face of like, 
like kind of like does that like you know that like you take your hand and you kind of like make a quick movement next to your neck like nah 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 like is it not good bro and andrew's mom kind of gives them this look of like keep going like doesn't matter like shut up shut up and andrew's like okay fine i'm not getting saved from this i just got to deal with this kid so anyways ben's like so do you want to see my third floor and andrew's like you have a third floor to your house he's like yeah we actually have a fourth floor too but let me show you the third floor of the house and he opens it he goes up these stairs and they walk up and it is the most in same thing ever every game every toy every everything is on that floor it is the most insane thing ever there's air hockey there's a bolt like a mini bowling thing there's a mini golf thing it is ridiculous and, and andrew's like oh my god dude this is insane and ben's like i don't know my last house was actually even cooler this is such a downgrade like this honestly sucks this sucks so bad i don't know why i'm showing it to you maybe so that you could pity me or something and andrew's like pity you like this is the coolest thing ever like you gotta i, I love air hockey and he starts like going on there and so uh, turns it on starts beating it and andrew ben's like turn that off and andrew's like uh oh, okay Ben's like, sorry, I just don't want it to get scratched up. And Andrew's head, he's like, you don't want your air hockey set to get scratched up. You don't, I, 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 you don't want to use, you don't want to use the toy that's fun. The only reason this is fun is if you use it, but whatever, right? Anyways, Andrew's like, okay, fine. It's, it's his house. It's his rules, whatever. Sure enough, they walk around and this is when, you know, Ben is like, so... Did I ever show you my watch collection? Oh, by the way, what watch are you wearing? And he looks at Andrew's wrist, and bro, Andrew wasn't wearing a watch. And Ben's like, oh, that's so sad. Okay, come come with me. And once again, Andrew in his head is like, Andrew, don't punch this guy in the face. This guy probably has fancy lawyers, and you will be even more broke than you are now. Andrew, for the love of God, do not punch this guy in the face. I know you want to, but for the love of God, he will take all the money from you and buy another stupid watch. And so they walk over, and, you know, Ben's like, so, you see this one? This one I got for my 13th birthday, a Rolex. And Andrew's like, okay, that's nice, 13-year-old kid with a Rolex, that's normal. And he's like, and this is a, uh," and then goes on and says other fancy watches, and Andrew doesn't know. Andrew knows what a Rolex is, because they advertise everywhere, and they're known for being fancy. Then he lists off a bunch of other watches, and Ben's like, do you know what this watch is? And he lifts it up, and Andrew's like, no. And Ben's like, uh, uncultured, <laughs> kind of says that under his breath. And Andrew's like, Andrew, do not smack this kid in the face. I know, I, Andrew, I know you want to do it. I know you want to give him a, big, a clean sock in the face, but you just can't do it, man. You just can't do it. And Ben's like, yeah, man, that's crazy. You don't know what this is. <laughs> Anyways, this one is the most expensive one so far. Do you want to look at it? Do you want to touch it? Andrew's like, I guess. And Ben's like, false! You do not want to touch it. Wrong. <laughs> if you touch it, the value would, sh- it would just fall apart. The value would just go down to zero if you touched it. And Andrew then says, well, I mean, you're touching it right now. And Ben's like, yeah, it doesn't matter if I touch it, but if you touch it, the value goes to zero. And Andrew's like, Andrew, don't punch this kid in the face. Whatever you do. I know you want to. I know you got a clean shot right now to just sock him in the face, but don't do it, Andrew. Don't do it. Do it for me, buddy. Do it for me. You don't want to lose. You don't want to make this kid buy another car with your money that's going to be taken from your mother. Don't punch him in the face. He's got fancy lawyers. Real quick, if you made it this far into the video, comment spoil down below. I just want to see how many people made it this far, and I want to see the names and faces of the people who do. I'll try and heart a bunch of comments that's, that say the secret word of the day. Don't take it personally if I don't get to your comment. And if you want to support the channel even more than you already have by making it this far, which thank you, watch time is super important. If you can go ahead and binge watch these videos, meaning sit down and watch like two, three, four plus even more videos in one sitting, if you do that, go in the comment section and comment down below either how many videos you're wa- you've watched or what you're doing while you're watching them, such as like playing video games, trying to go to sleep, or if you're like putting on a playlist in the background or something, whatever you're doing, let me know. And so I can heart it, say thank you, and also shout out someone like this person on screen right now, shouting out people who tell me how they're supporting in videos. Anyways, let's get right back to it. So this point, right, Andrew, It's just like, Andrew, man, please, you gotta hold it together for your mother, your beautiful mother. Don't punch him in the face for your beautiful mother, man. And anyways, you know, he's saved by the bell because he hears this kind of ding noise and Ben's like, oh, whatever. And, you know, Andrew's like, dude, what was that bell noise? He's like, that just means 
dinner's ready or probably not having dinner, probably just our, you know, our entrees or whatever. And then Andrew's like, what? Because Andrew's just like, used to his mom being like, dinner. He walks down, it's like mac and cheese and he's done. So they walk down there, right? And they see Andrew and Ben's mom already sitting at the table. And they sit down and this like guy comes out. And that's when Andrew realizes that they have a freaking personal chef, bro. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And he comes out, he's like, today we will be having beef Wellington. And bro, I swear to God, dude, I don't know about you, but I, this, the, this the food name beef Wellington makes me think of like, oh, wow. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Like, of course, of all the meals they're going to be having, it would have either been like gold leafed sirloin steak or it would have been freaking beef Wellington. And literally when the guy says beef Wellington, Ben goes, oh, I had that last week. And Andrew's, Andrew's mom and Andrew just make eye contact. And she kind of looks at him and gives him a look of like, chill, chill, Andrew. And Andrew's like, my fist belongs on his face. Oh my God. Anyways, though, um, so they sit down and they start eating it. And it's so freaking good. It is so good, at least according to Andrew, right? Andrew's just devouring it. He's like, oh my God, where can we get some beef Wellington at home? But uh, Ben looks at it and kind of goes, <laughs> goes, takes a little sniff of it and like cuts a little bit, puts it in his mouth. He goes, Bleh! this is worse than last week's. And the personal chef comes around and be like, sir, how can I fix this for you? And Andrew is starting to get really angry. He's like, this kid is literally the worst person on planet Earth. But anyways, I mean, there's only so much you can do at that point. It, it, there really isn't that much you can do. And Andrew's like, if I punch him in the face, it's going to be really bad. He's got fancy lawyers. And, you know, Ben's like, whatever, I'll starve. And the, the chef's like, no, no, please, let me, let, let, let me get you something. And Ben's like, no. You had one shot, one opportunity, you blew it. And so the chef took it away. Andrew finishes it. And Andrew actually, like, like stops the chef and says, hey, I'll take that. And the chef's like, all right. So the chef gives him, like, Ben doesn't see it, but Andrew takes Ben's plate with, like, one bite into it and just immediately devours it as well. And eventually, right, in between that and, like, their dessert, uh, you know, Ben's mom is like, so... I'm so excited that you two got, are getting along. That's so nice. You know, how about, Ben, how about we go around, we talk about, like, our highs and our lows. Let's do rose and thorn. Tell me what was a good thing. That's the rose. And tell me what is a bad thing. That's the thorn. Ben, do you want to go first? And Ben's like, ah, fine. I guess the rose was the fact that I get to go to bed every night. Sleeping is so cool. But I guess my thorn is, my thorn's actually a lot of things. Let me, let me, ta let me, let me take a second. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I know exactly what my thorn is. You know that new kid, that stupid kid, mom? And, like, Ben's mom's like, what, honey? <laughs> He's like, yeah, you know that stupid kid that you had me hang out with yesterday? He totally was not respecting my authority. He did not understand that I was this intrinsically a better person than he was. And Andrew, at this point, was like, what the fuck? <laughs> what? I intrinsically a better person than you are? Bro, what are you saying? And then Ben goes on to go completely mask off. And he's like, yeah, you know how, like, the whole, that kid didn't have any money. <laughs> and Ben's mom's like, Ben, I think it's time to elaborate on your rose. I think we've heard enough of your thorn. Trying to cover up the fact that her son is a complete lunatic, a maniac, freakazoid, right? And, and Ben goes and goes like, well, no, let me finish my thorn. Yes, this kid, he, he didn't understand that, like, when I told him to give me a foot massage and I'd give him, like, five bucks because that'd be more money than he'd ever seen his entire life or something, he, like, totally flipped out. And then I went on to tell him that, like, we live in a society, like, the caste system. I was learning about that in history and how, like, he's the peasant and I'm the king in this society. And that, you know, the dynamics, right, the dynamics between the peasant and the king we're not really being reflected in the way that he was talking back to me, mom. <laughs> to me. <laughs> and at this point, Andrew's like, is this staring at his mom? Just staring at his mom. And Andrew's mom kind of like gives him like a kick under the table. Because like Andrew was like, bro, I got to say something, man. I got I to gotta say something, bro. Like I can't let this go on. And ben, Ben's mom is looking mortified because while she lives in a bubble, she also understands what is not polite conversation? And one could say that this was not 
polite conversation. You know what I mean? And Ben goes and be like, yeah, dude, this is like, it was ridiculous. It was insane. I mean, I offered him five whole American dollars for a foot massage. It was crazy. And he said no. And he got all upset or something. And, you know, I tried to, like, shove my foot in his face anyways. And that made him more mad. I was literally giving him a second chance to respect the kings of his society. I mean, mom, he's literally a peasant. I mean, did you, did you, see, his, did you see his whip? He's a peasant, mom. <laughs> At this point, Andrew's like, what, 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 how do you not expect me to punch this guy in the face? By the way, little disclaimer, don't punch anyone in the face, even if they deserve it. It's a bad idea. This kid, maybe. Maybe this kid. But in general, no, I don't condone violence. Off the record, maybe this kid. But anyways, back on the record. Um, And Ben is just like, <laughs> anyways, right? So, Andrew, what was your Rosenthal? Actually, I don't really care. Mom, this game sucks. What's the next, next thing we can talk about? And Ben's mom is, like, mortified once again. And ben, Ben's mom's, like, turns to Andrew, and Andrew's mom's like, isn't Ben so funny? <laughs> he's, like, a comedian or something. <laughs> he's, he's really funny. <laughs> and Andrew's mom's like, aha, yeah. And Ben then goes on, completely destroys whatever his mom was trying to do, and he's like, what do you mean I'm funny, Mom? None of that was a joke. You know that. You know what we talk about behind the scenes. Do they not know, like, what this is? And Andrew's mom's like, what do you mean what this is? And, you know, Ben's like, well, I mean, you know, the whole society thing, like, you guys are lesser than us. We just wanted to, like, I don't know. It just looks good. Like, it's, it's like a charity thing when we hang out with the lessers. And Andrew turns to his mom and says, he's like, quote, he's like, Dude, he just called us the lessers. And Andrew's mom's like, shut up, Andrew. Give me a second. Andrew's mom's like, what? And Ben's mom looks at Ben. And is like, shut up, Ben. Shut up, Ben. And Ben's like, what? I'm just saying it how it is. I'm just being real, mom. What's that whole thing about, like, being real and always being honest with each other? Well, I'm always being honest with everyone. And he looks at Andrew and his mom. And he's like, yeah, you know what? You guys are a charity case. You're a cha we're trying to find a new charity case, right? We're trying to find a new charity case. And when I saw your car roll in, I knew for a fact that you were a perfect charity case. And Andrew's mom looks at her, looks at her watch. It's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. We have a thing at 6.48. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. We're so late right now. We have a thing at 6, 6.48. Yeah, it's 6.48 at night on that moment. I'm so sorry. We got to go. Andrew's mom picks up Andrew. Andrew in his head's like, yes. Yes, escape! And they walk out, and Ben's mom, I hope to see you. Oh, I'm so sorry you had to cut this short. Also, Ben is being so funny today. Gives him a punch, and he's like, Ow, Mom, why'd you punch me? And he's, she's like, oh, he's so funny. I hope to see you guys soon. And Andrew's mom turns around and is like, yes, goodbye now. And they both walk out. They get into the car, and Andrew's like, um, do you think that if we stayed there long enough that they were going to, like, I don't know, put us in camouflage and then try and hunt us or something? Like, bro, that was insane. And Andrew's mom's like, you know what? I've never met anyone in my life like that. And we will not be seeing Ben again. And Andrew, you better stay away from Ben. Andrew's like, well, yeah, because if I was near him again, he'd be punched in the face. Andrew's mom's like, don't punch anyone in the face. I mean... Okay, that kid... No, that kid has fancy lawyers. Don't do it, click Andrew. Click on the video on screen right now. I know you'll enjoy it. Just click it. Do it. From a spoiled brat who literally says that he owns poor people... Yeah, dude. He actually said it. To a kid who starts crying because they have to fly public transportation. Oh, good heavens. These are the most spoiled kids of all time. Let's go. So we're going to call the subscriber who submitted the story, Jeff. So anyways, Jeff had an older cousin, and his older cousin's parents were very, very rich. And Jeff was very kind of middle of the line, middle class. He wasn't poor by any means, but he also wasn't rich by any means. So whatever you define that is, is whatever it is, right? So sure enough, uh, Jeff had not seen his older cousin in a really long time. So Jeff's mom it got, like, in touch with Jeff's aunt, which is the mom of Jeff's cousin, right? And I think they were just talking and they were just like uh, catching up or whatever. And they realized that it had been such a long time since they got together. So they decided that over the summer they were going to meet up. So let's fast forward to over the summer. And uh, sure enough, it comes to the time for them to meet up. 
Jeff's cousin lived like about an hour and a half drive away. So sure, so Jeff got in the car with his mom and they were driving over. And uh, Jeff was talking to his mom being like, hey, it's been like legitimately like four or five plus years since I've seen my cousin. And I also don't think I've ever been to my cousin's house before. So that's when uh, Jeff's mom has to like brace him a little bit. And she's like, hey, look, so, you know, you know about like Jeff's financial situation and they're like, or not Jeff, sorry, your cousin's financial situation. Jeff's like, yeah, I'm kind of aware that his parents do pretty well. And Jeff's mom's like, look, they don't just do pretty well. They do really well, right? They do really well. So Jeff's like, okay, cool. Good to know. And she's like, look, it's going to be pretty crazy once you get there. Like the house is insane. Like I've seen photos, but I'm sure in person it's even more like daunting, right? So Jeff honestly was kind of underestimating. Like he was thinking like, okay, my mom's just like exaggerating for effect or whatever. I don't know why she's exaggerating, but she's definitely exaggerating right now. Um, but sure enough, uh, she was not really exaggerating because they pull in, but they don't pull into the driveway. They pull into the, the pathway to the house, dude. Like this house legitimately had like a winding road up into it. It was one of those houses that just like existed on a massive plot of land. And this wasn't like a massive plot of dirt, dude. This was like the most beautiful plot of land you've ever seen. Like it just Ex like exquisitely done their gardener should be getting a raise right so they're driving up this pathway and uh, or this driveway i guess but you can't think of it like a normal driveway and jeff's like oh are we in the neighborhood right now and jeff's mom turns to him while she's driving is like this is not a neighborhood jeff this is the driveway to their house this is on their property and jeff's like how like i don't even see the house yet and jeff's mom's like that's what i mean so eventually they see kind of like a house in the distance but it doesn't look like a house man it looks like a legitimate hotel, okay? It doesn't look like a hotel, but it looks about the size of a hotel. Obviously, it looks much more like a house, but for sizing-wise, it looks like a hotel. And Jeff's looking at this thing. He's like, that's, that's insane. Like, Mom, there's no way. And his mom's like, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So they pull up, and it's like the, the biggest, most extreme thing ever. And they pull into the driveway of, like, there's multiple cars outside. Obviously, the cars are pretty sick. And they get out. And Jeff's aunt, like, comes out of the room, or not the room, the house, and she's like, oh, so excited for you guys to be here. It's really been way too long. And Jeff's cousin comes out. He's like, hey, what's up, little dude? Jeff's cousin is older than him. Jeff's about 16 at the time, and Jeff's cousin's, like, 20 or something. So at, at first, Jeff's cousin actually seems like he's pretty chill or whatever, but as the night goes on, you will see that is definitely not the case. I guess he's just pretty good at first impressions or whatever. So things seem pretty good at first, and Jeff is honestly just in awe of everything around him. I mean, he walks into the room, there's like a freaking crystal chandelier, dude. It's like marble floors, the stairway, the stairway, like, there's like a spiral staircase that goes up like four or five stories. This is like a legit house, dude. Like, this is insane. And, you know, so Jeff's uh, aunt is kind of, like, giving them a little bit of a tour. But for her to give an extensive tour of the entire place would probably take legit hours. So it's, like, a very quick, here's the bathroom, here's the kitchen, here's the movie room. <laughs> the movie room, dude. Dude had a projector and a movie. It was insane, right? Here's the bowling room. Bowling? What? Anyways, uh, so, yeah. Eventually, Jeff is goes up the stairs with his mom. There's a guest bedroom. Two of them actually, more than two of them actually, but there's two of them right next to each other for them to have. They're on the third floor. And it's just like, wow, okay. So Jeff gets his stuff in, plugs in his phone, walks over to his mom's room. He's kind of whispering a little bit because he doesn't necessarily want them to hear, but he's like, dude, this is insane. And his mom's like, yeah, don't call me dude, but yeah, I know this is like, this is, this is what I meant. Like, prepare yourself. So anyways, they're going out to dinner that night, and uh, so they get in the car, and they drive over, and honestly, like, Jeff and his cousin were sitting in the back seat, and they were just talking, and it was, it was cool, actually. Like, he seemed like a pretty chill dude at first, which you'll soon find out he is not, but, you know, so he never really went to college, which, I mean, I guess if you're with that much money, like, I can definitely understand, I guess... But honestly, I think even if you come from a ton of money, you should still go to college for the experience part. Um, you just, I mean, I feel like that would be the greatest experience ever in college because it's like, oh, well, I don't actually have to try. I just get to do the fun things. But either way, he decided not to go to college and he's a quote unquote, a entrepreneur, which most of the time just means unemployed. <laughs> but yeah, so he was quote unquote, an entrepreneur and he was starting like 58,000 companies Man, look, you're not Elon Musk. You can't run three, four, five companies successfully at a one time, right? 
try and get one to work in the first place. Like you think Elon Musk started doing six companies in a row that all worked? No. Look up uh, x.com, which will go to PayPal, which PayPal Mafia. Very interesting saga. You should look into it. But anyways, right, so he's talking about all that, and Jeff's kind of just, or sorry, Jeff's cousin. If I said Jeff, I meant Jeff's cousin. And Jeff is kind of just sitting there like, okay, dude. Okay, dude. Sure, you're an entrepreneur. Weird. Got it. Okay, dude. Cool. Mm, okay. Um, so they get to the restaurant, they sit down, and then they're talking about everything. And uh, so Jeff's aunt is, like, talking about, because, you know, they're just, catching up or whatever they're getting to know each other again just on is telling them about this like really crazy trip that they went on and i think jeff's mom was just a little or not jeff's mom just aunt i think jeff's mom's sister i think that's how that works but jeff's aunt is a little bit um well not a little bit probably pretty uh pretty naive or just oblivious of how ridiculous of a story she's telling and i don't mean ridiculous in the sense of like oh that's unbelievable right it was unbelievable in the sense that you believed it, but the fact that someone lived like that was unbelievable. Look, if you go on really insane trips like that, sometimes it's just better to keep the details to yourself. Like, if you went somewhere really cool, you can tell someone all about it and tell them about what you saw, but, like, they were adding in all the details of, like, oh, yeah, we rented out a Ferrari. It's like, dude, what? It's like, yeah, we, we yachted around. It's like, dude, what? It's like, that's fine if you did it, of course, like, whatever, but maybe not telling the random person, like, I, I get it, it's cool or whatever, but, like, bro, I don't know. Uh, so, like, Jeff is kind of sitting there like, dang, I could never, un like, this life is insane, right? So, eventually, they get back, and it's a little bit later, but uh, Jeff's mom, aunt, and uh, cousin, um, they all start having the, the, the adult apple juice. I think I can say that they're drinking, but, like... YouTube, dude, YouTube can be weird sometimes, so I'm just gonna say that they're all drinking special water. I'm just say they're drinking. No more word arounds. So you know what I'm talking about. YouTube, I, I, don't, I honestly don't think they care that much. So yeah, they all start, you know, they drink, some, I don't know, wine or something. And uh, the thing is, right, Jeff's cousin um, really starts going hard at it. And uh, he gets fairly drunk. And the thing is, right, when you say stuff when you're drunk, a lot of times you don't actually mean it, but you also kind of do. There's sometimes you just say stuff that is not true. But in a lot of cases, it kind of just brings out parts of you that maybe you try and just kind of push back uh, so that you can remain in civilized society. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, they were all kind of like sitting around and Jeff was not drinking because uh, maybe he did a little bit with his friends, but dude was 16. He was, his mom was not having that happen. So he got his like uh, club soda or whatever, which is what I get when I go to restaurants because club sodas are great. And he's kind of sitting there, and he's kind of like looking at them, and they're all talking about whatever. And I don't know how it got to this point, but Jeff's cousin just got so incredibly drunk that he started, okay, this is where the title, quote-unquote, spoiled kid thinks that he owns poor people, quote-unquote, right? This is where that part starts to happen. Because, you know, he starts to go on being like, man, I don't know, this is Jeff's cousin, by the way, he's like, man, I don't know if you guys can relate to this. But, you know, whenever I go in, you know, when I travel in New York City or I go anywhere near public transportation, dude, I just get the ick. And uh, so at first Jeff's mom's like, yeah, like, it's really grimy. I don't like it because I don't think most, I mean, look, most people have to use public transportation, but it's definitely not like the most fun place ever. It's definitely not like the greatest vibes ever. Like, that's just kind of a fact of the matter. But so Jeff's mom was like, yeah, I can relate to that. But then uh, Jeff's cousin went on to say something that was a little bit less relatable. Jeff's cousin's like, yeah, you know, it's just all, it's just all the poor people in there, man. I mean, no offense to you guys, which is, that's a, fun, that's a hilarious statement to say to someone. Like, no offense to you guys, poor people. Me, 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 right? <laughs> like, dude, seriously. And, but this guy, look, Jeff's cousin was drunk enough that he didn't care. He kind of like took off the facade of trying to care about other people, right? He's like, yeah. He's like, I wish that there was a social program that, like, got rid of them. Like, dude didn't even say, like, I wish there was a program to help the poor. He's like, I wish there was a program to get rid of them. Like, ship them off somewhere else, dude. So at this point, Jeff's mom, even though she was, like, a little bit drunk, she wasn't, like, drunk enough to deal with this stuff. So she's like, eh, heh, heh. But the thing is, right, uh, Jeff's aunt was totally out of it. Like, she was totally out of it. Like, she was about to excuse herself to bed in a, in a fast second. So she was not, a, she, so she wasn't able to intervene when, uh, Jeff's cousin was talking his crazy talk, right? So he goes on to say, and this is where the famous line in the title, he's like, you know what? I've been thinking about this. And, you know, throughout history, you know, there have been kings, there have been lords, and there have been peasants. And, you know, 
The kings own the peasants. The peasants do everything for the kings and they make sure that society works. He says, you know what? In this society, modern day, I'm the king and I own the peasants. And you know, it just works that way, man. It just works. Like, it's like when the rich people own the poor people and bro is literally saying this at this point, look, dude, remember, remember the subscriber, Jeff, all he has is a club soda. He is stone cold sober and he's hearing someone saying that, hey man, life was better when I owned the poor people. Like, dude, what? So Jeff is like sitting there super awkwardly trying to make eye contact with his mom and his mom is like kind of looking at him like, chill, 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 chill. Like, don't say anything, don't say anything. Because she doesn't want to like, look, they're sleeping over at their house that night. She doesn't want to cause a problem or anything. But obviously, I mean, it's pretty problematic what he's saying. He's like, yeah, man, society just worked better when like the poor people did exactly what people like me would tell them to do. Like, think about it. How bad was society in like, <laughs> he said like, I don't know, like a 1600s kingdom, which... I don't know if you've heard of the French Revolution before, but might want to look into that because people weren't too happy about that system, at least not for a long time. So just, just pick up a little, little book on the French Revolution and uh, learn a thing or two about the guillotine, my friend, because that system doesn't tend to work out that well. And maybe if you masked it or made it look like something else, then maybe it would function even in modern day society. And maybe parts of modern day society are more like that than you think. And it's just a bunch of smoke and mirrors, smoke and mirrors and not showing your entire hand. But anyways, I digress because Jeff is sitting there in the most awkward, uncomfortable situation because his cousin is looking at them and is saying this stuff but it's saying it as if he's saying the most rational stuff ever. And he's basically saying stuff like looking for them to like nod their heads and be like, yeah, dude, you're so right. You should literally own us and decide everything we do. We should be, we should be just be like working for you forever for free just because you make great decisions. You should be the dictator of everyone because you were born into a rich family. Of course, dude, yes. It makes so much sense right now, man. You're like legit spitting, bro. You're spitting facts. That, that's what this kid was wanting. But uh, Jeff is like, because ah, remember, Jeff's stone cold sober. Jeff's mom's a little drunk, so she can handle this. But Jeff's, Jeff is stone cold sober, bro. He's sitting there just like, dude, what am I going to do right now? Like, this is, what? Huh? Like, are you serious? Yeah, so eventually the cousin's like, hey, guys, I'm sorry. I'm tired. I'm going to go to bed. And he gets up. And his mom's already gone to bed at this point. Like, I think his mom didn't even... She either heard a little bit of it, but was too drunk to, like, realize and just went to bed. Or she just went to bed before the cousin went on this rampage. But eventually, the cousin gets up. And he's like, oh, yeah, like, I'm going to go to bed. Feel free to take anything from the fridge. If you need anything, let me know. I'll be up in the morning. Peace. He just goes up, walks upstairs. So Jeff is sitting there. And he turns to his mom. And his mom looks at him and holds up a finger, just, like, one finger up in the air, saying, like, wait. And they, they listen and they hear, you know, Jeff's older cousin walk up the stairs several flights up to his room. And then she's like, I know, I know, I know. Literally just says, I know to Jeff. And they both know what they're talking about. That's the craziest thing. And Jeff's like, wow, like I didn't expect that. And she's like, mm -hmm. I didn't expect it, but I'm not surprised. And then Jeff's mom goes on to tell about like how you know, uh, Jeff's aunt got into money really quickly and could, because, like, uh, Jeff's cousin's dad, I think that's Jeff's uncle, yeah, he just, like, basically, he didn't win the lottery, but he basically struck gold incredibly quickly. It wasn't, like, a gradual rise or whatever. And basically, Jeff's aunt was just really not sure how to parent correctly because his kid was, like, their kid was just kind of, like, as soon as they got into money, their kid was just starting to become of age of, like, four, five, six, seven when they started to, like, really develop. And she didn't know how to parent correctly, and it was a mess, and she feels terrible. But apparently, like, Jeff's aunt feels terrible about how things have gone, but they just don't know what to do. And, yeah, so she explains this all to Jeff. Jeff's like, oh, word, okay. They both go to bed. The next day they wake up, and Jeff's cousin is, like, just really quiet in the morning. And he says something like, hey, hey guys, like I, like, I have no recollection of what happened last night. Like, I, I think I was, I don't think I did anything bad, but, like, I was cool, right? And Jeff just looks at his mom, and they both look at each other. And, you know, they're like, yeah, no, dude, you're good. Like, we just had a good conversation. He's like, uh, what did I talk about? <laughs> and Jeff and his mom did not want to say what he talked about. So they're like, oh, you were just talking about stuff. And he's like, okay, cool, word. And so, yeah, the next spoiled kid 
is not as spoiled as this kid, but I think this story is honestly funnier. And we'll call the subscriber who submitted this one, Harvey. And I, call, I picked Harvey because I had a, an old animation series on my channel that I've recently unprivated. If you want to watch it, it's what I did in sixth grade, right? Harvey and Jeff were the main two people. So anyways, uh, we're going to call the subscriber who submitted this one, Harvey. So Harvey was in a French class in college, and uh, kind of the whole class was kind of close. They were tight. They got together. And they decided that they were going to actually fly out to France. So this wasn't necessarily something that was part of the program when you signed up in college to take French. However, this class just got really close, and they got close with a teacher, and the teacher, like, midway through was like, hey, guys, like, what's your comfort level? Like, I thought it'd be pretty cool because we've all done really well this year. I thought it'd be cool if, like, we took a, a trip to France, and I'd be able to guide you guys. And everyone was super down for it. They thought it'd be really cool. So fast forward to the time over the summer where they all picked that they went to France. So they're, fly so they're busing over. They all live in the same multiple state radius. So they all came together at a certain bus station and they were all getting on the same flight. So they're busing over right now. And, uh, you know, so anyways, Harvey looks over at this kid. We're just gonna call him the spoiled kid. He wasn't really known as being that terrible. And he honestly isn't that terrible. He just does something pretty funny. Like, it's just like, bro, live in the real world, please. But he would always like, I don't know. He would say a thing or two where you were like, okay, this kid definitely is from a different world or a different reality than me. And uh, real quick, comment spoiled down below. That'll be the secret word of the day. I'm trying to like splice these in. I keep forgetting. And also, we're on Spotify, or I, sh I should say I am because I'm a one-person operation. I'm on Spotify. You can listen to those these stories on Spotify and much more. It's in the link in the description. And also, if you're listening to this on Spotify... Thank you. I appreciate it. Make sure you rate us, uh, rate us, rated me, keep saying us, five stars and follow the, uh, the podcast. Anyways, so sure enough, right, uh, uh, I'll just get into it. So they're, they're bossing over and they get there and this kid, the spoiled kid looks super, super lost. And the thing is sometimes like a lot of people have never flown before and that's totally fine. But a lot of that reason is because they just don't have the finances to do it because flying is extremely expensive, especially nowadays. It's ridiculous. And uh, so Harvey was like, okay, this kid looks like he's never been in an airport before and he's never flown, but I also know it's not because he doesn't have the money because there was indications that, okay, this kid was pretty loaded, like this kind of a fact of the matter. And uh, so they get in there and this kid looks just so confused. And it's pretty funny because they, they go through the TSA, it's a whole mess, whatever, which it, it always is, man. It literally always is. And they get in there and their flight gets delayed like two hours. So they're just sitting in a crowded airport and Harvey looks over and this kid is like tearing up and Harvey's like, oh shoot, like what's up? So he turns over, he's like, dude, like, are you good? And this kid's like, this is too much for me. I've never flown public before. And Harvey's like, oh dude, you've never flown before? Like you should let me know, I can, I can help you out. And the kid's like, no, 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 no. It's not that I, I've never flown before. I've flown a lot. And Harvey's like, um, what, what? Like, dude, what does that mean? Because Harvey only imagines, because he knows that, like, quadrillionaires have their own fl planes or whatever, but he never thinks, that, he's like, okay, obviously, there's two options. You've never flown before, or you've flown commercial. So he's like, dude just said, I've flown a lot, but I've never flown commercial before. Like, what does that even mean? And the kid is like... <laughs> This is too much for me. There's so many people around here. The spells are weird and the food is bad. And, you know, our flight's getting delayed. This never happens to me when I fly. And Harvey's like, wait, like, what? Like, where do you fly? Like, do you fly out of the smallest? Because, like, Harvey was thinking, okay, this kid obviously, like, lives in a really small town that just happens to have an airport that just has, like, 20 people max at any time. Because that would have made kind of sense for what he was saying. But he's like, this never happens when you fly private. And Harvey was like, wait, dude, what? Because, like, Harvey was just, like, he never thought, like, okay. He knew this kid was, like, had some money, or at least he acted like he had some money. But he didn't know, he didn't know the bro actually, actually had some money, right? Even though dude was kind of, like, his parents were doing much better than he expected. So this kid was having a mental breakdown in the middle of the airport because... He wasn't flying private, man. <laughs> no! Right, so was, Harvey was trying trying his best to be as sympathetic as possible. But at the same time, like at the end of the day, I can't blame Harvey for struggling at least a little bit to be too sympathetic because look, I'm, look, man, 
you're going to get the smallest violin treatment if you're crying because you've only flown pub uh, private and oh no, you need to fly like the rest of us peasants. Oh no, dude, I'm so sorry, right? I can only be so sympathetic and Harvey felt the same way. So he's like, hey man, like we've all done this before. It's actually not that bad. And the spoiled kid is like, no, 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 it is that bad. I mean, look over there. Look at that guy. He's so weird looking. What if he attacks me? And literally just points at some guy. <laughs> now he's like, dude, like what? Like, it's just a guy, man. You're good. He's like, these smells, they're so weird. It's, they're all oily. And they were near some like, I don't know, some pretzel place. And Harvey's like, yeah, because dude, we're near a pretzel place. Like, bro, we're... <laughs> We're good. Don't worry about it, man. <laughs> like, like we're chilling. Don't worry. And the kid's like, no, this is too much. I want to go back to private. Yeah, so after a comic, so eventually Harvey's like, okay, I don't want other people to hear this because they will definitely clown on him and I'm trying to have a good dynamic, you know, during the whole trip or whatever. So Harvey calms him down, but he also gives him some pretty good words of advice. He's like, hey, look, dude, like, it's all good. I'm here. I'll make sure you get through this. But also, maybe don't tell other people about that because, look, they're probably not going to be that sympathetic to the fact that you're flying public because that's the only thing any of us have ever done. And I think the kid understood a little bit, but he was still in his little bit of a breakdown mode. So, yeah, they get on the flight. You know, the kid's not having it either, but whatever. A couple days into their trip into France, it's awesome. They're all getting along together. The kid actually, like, sign like, of, like finds her because they were, like, chilling. The kid was chilling. He was cool again. But he actually goes ahead and finds Harvey and pulls him out of the crowd. And he says, hey, man, can we talk for a second? And Harvey's like, yeah, dude, like, what's up? He's like, look, I'm so sorry for the way I just broke down the airport. Like, that's so embarrassing. Thank you for, like, not telling other people. But also thank you for just telling me not to tell other people. Like, I think I was honestly going to go and find as many people as possible to complain to. You kind of saved my butt there, and I really do appreciate it. Harvey's like, yeah, man, no problem. We're good. Click on the video on screen right now. I know you'll enjoy Today it. we got a story about a spoiled kid who acts like he owns the world, but then the principal brings him back to reality and it's super satisfying. I know you'll enjoy it, so let's just jump right into it. So we're gonna call the subscriber who submitted this story, Jeff. So anyways, right, there was a kid in Jeff's class who we're gonna call the spoiled kid because, uh, he was genuinely just like the most spoiled kid on planet Earth. His parents gave him everything, and because he always got anything he ever wanted, he just had an air of entitlement to him. He genuinely believed that he received everything that he's received, not because it was given to him, but because it was like his, like, his, his right, his, he was born into the right to have everything, right? Basically, he believed that, you know, everything that was going well for him in life, he genuinely believed that that was because of his own, like, his own grit or intelligence or, which, I mean, I guess some of it was, but the majority of, like, what he had was because it was given to him. So this can kind of mess up a kid when this happens to them because they'll, they'll basically have their ego inflated so bad that they'll end up doing ridiculous stuff. And this was a great example of it. So this spoiled kid, right? You know, one day, Jeff had a girlfriend. We're gonna call this, uh, what are we gonna call her? We're gonna call her Maddie, right? So Jeff's girlfriend, Maddie, they've been together for like a year. It, they were a solid relationship, right? So this was high school for uh, context for the setting. And uh, Maddie and Jeff were together for a while uh, and they were a very strong relationship. Like it just, there was no way that Maddie was gonna cheat on him. However, the spoiled kid who believed that he was entitled to everything in the planet saw Maddie thought she was beautiful and decided, you know what? That's my girl now, man. <laughs> he genuinely believed that if that, I mean, he genuinely believed that like, oh wow, if I want something, I will get it. So uh, yeah, this all started one day when uh, the spoiled kid started to hit on uh, Jeff's girlfriend, Maddie. And uh, so, you know, he's walking down the, walking down the aisle or not the aisle, the, uh, what's it called? The hot, the hallway. Um, Jeff went off to go get something and Jeff turns around to see that the spoiled kid walked up to Maddie and is like talking with her and you can kind of just tell by the spoiled kid's body language that he is definitely interested in something that he's definitely not just like asking for directions or oh do you know do you have a pencil or kind of like asking for something that you might ask anyone he was very clearly had a pretty strong intention for what he was doing and it was pretty obvious what he wanted right 
So, you know, Maddie started walking back to uh, Jeff, the subscriber, and Jeff was like, oh, like, what's that? Because Jeff thought, okay, maybe Maddie and the spoiled kid were friends or something, and he just didn't know anything about it. And Maddie's like, I think that guy just hit on me. And, like, the spo and, like Jeff turns around to see the spoiled kid, and they both look at the spoiled kid, and the spoiled kid turns around and literally winks at Maddie, gives her the two finger guns, and then walks away. Like, the cringiest thing you've ever seen, bro. So sure enough, Jeff looks at Maddie and is like, ew, what? Because, <laughs> yeah, the spoiled kid was very notorious for being, um, how do I put this, not the greatest guy ever. Like, he was just notoriously, he was just notorious for being super spoiled, entitled, uh, super arrogant, cocky, just not a good kid, right? And Maddie's like, yeah, no, this is, like, very unfor- like, like, this kind of sucks, dude. Like, I don't want to have to, like, reject him, but I also am going to reject him. And Jeff's like, like, I think it's pretty obvious. I think it's pretty common knowledge that you and I have been in a relationship for a while. It's not like we've been hiding it. It's not like some kind of big secret we have kept from everyone. And Maddie's like, yeah, I'm like 90% sure he knows that too. So I don't really know what he's doing. And uh, they kind of came to the conclusion that the spoiled kid did know that Maddie was in a relationship with Jeff. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you've gotten everything you've ever wanted, and if you wanted something, you get it no matter what, like, at the end of the day, I think the spoiled kid had the mentality of just because, like, there's a, you know, a goalie in the goal doesn't mean I can't score, bro. I'm still going to make my moves, which uh, he will make his moves in just a second. Don't worry, boys and girls. But anyways, so Maddie's like, oh, God, like, he definitely knows. And Jeff's like, dude, yeah, he definitely does know. And Maddie's like, okay, well, I'm going to have to reject him, right? And Jeff's like, okay, well, reject him if he asks for anything, but, like, we don't even know if he's totally into you yet. We, we don't know if he's going to do anything. And Maddie just looks at Jeff like, Jeff, I know how guys act. I know how guys act when they like me. It's the way that you acted around me well, like a year ago or whatever. And Jeff's like, well, okay, fair. He got me there. She's like, he's definitely going to try something. I'm just going to reject him when he doesn't. And Jeff's like, cool, okay, whatever. So uh, the next day they're sitting at lunch together because uh, Jeff would normally hang out with the boys a lot. But he always, he kind of like carved out lunchtime for a specific time with his girlfriend. So Jeff and uh, Maddie were sitting at lunch together, as they always did, right? And the spoiled kid came and sat down. So it was a four-person table, but there's enough tables in the cafeteria that people could sit by themselves, no problem. And so Jeff and Maddie were sitting together at a four-person table with just two of them, and no one else would really sit down because everyone knew they were basically just going on a date every single day at lunch. Like, it was their kind of their private time. And so many tables around that there was no need to sit with him. It's not like you'd have oh, we're out of seats, I gotta sit with you guys. But anyways, the spoiled kid literally sits down next to Jeff, and is like, what's up, Maddie? Like, my name's, like, uh, spoiled kid, like, nice to meet you. <laughs> and Jeff's like, oh my god. And Maddie's like, hello. It's like, a bit of a question mark, right? And the spoiled kid's like, oh, yeah, what's up? Is this your, this your, like, friend or something? Maddie's like, this is my boyfriend. And at that point, the spoiled kid looks, and it's like, oh, yeah, right, whatever, same thing. <laughs> you, dude, the spoiled kid literally says, oh, yeah, same thing. Yeah, right, a boyfriend and a friend are the same thing, dude. I mean, maybe in the spoiled kid's mind, and his perception, like, friend, boyfriend, you know, husband of 10 years with three children, same thing, dude. Potato, potato, it doesn't matter to me, because you're going home with me either way. But, uh, you know, truth is, that's not how it was about to go. So uh, he literally just, like, is, like, acknowledges Jeff's presence for a second, calling, saying, uh, yeah, same thing, whatever, kind of, like, trying to nullify the fact that he is literally Maddie's boyfriend, and then immediately turns to Maddie and just starts, like, talking her up. And I don't mean being, like, how's your day? I mean being, like, you look beautiful in that, uh, that whatever that you're wearing, like, oh my god, like, your nails compliment your eyes so much, like, oh, did you hear, I actually have this really crazy whip, and, like, all my girls, like, are able to drive in it, and you can take photos for your Instagram, like, literally the most blatant stuff ever, and it was really freaking cringy and uncomfortable for Jeff, because dude was literally sitting right there as this guy fails to, like, try and pick up his girlfriend as he's sitting right there, and Jeff wasn't some, like, crazy confrontational guy. Yeah, I don't think I'd be pretty happy 
if I had a girlfriend, sad, if I had a girlfriend and like some guy came up and like tried to like minimize my presence and started flirting with her super blatantly, like I, if I had a girlfriend, I, I don't think I would genuinely, I wouldn't care if she talked with guys because I have plenty of platonic relationships with women. I think having relationships with people across like that's not the same like gender as you. I think that's 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 a really cool part of life because there's kind of different energy with different people I've personally found. So yeah, like I personally wouldn't care. But at the same time, I think like if someone was very blatantly flirting with someone who's my girlfriend while I was sitting right there, I wouldn't be like, hey man, that's my girl, back off. Like, dude, I can definitely tell if she's able to manage it or not. I don't think I'd be very happy about it. I wouldn't be like, yeah, that's my boy. Like, yeah, no, no, no. Uh, like, come in for, I'm, I, I can share, man. I, can, I wouldn't be happy. But also, this guy is very clearly not a threat. So Jeff kind of sat there really awkwardly. Just like, what, dude, what do I do right now? Like, this guy's flirting out my girlfriend, but he's failing, and I know it's not going to succeed, but I have to sit here and listen to it? Like, this is just so uncomfortable right now. And, uh, yeah, man, he was kind of like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, as this guy was like, yeah, so, like, all my girls get, like, the best treatment ever. Like, I, I got it, uh, you know, they get, like, the craziest presents for their birthday, and, like, if you were my girl, it would be the same deal. Like, you don't understand. Like, you would be, like, sh you you'd be my princess and you'd be treated like one. Like, have you ever wanted to know what it would be like to be treated like royalty? And Maddie's just looking at him like, mm-hmm, dude. Like, okay. Like, sure, man. You might be able to buy me a cool bag or something, but that doesn't negate the fact that, one, I mean, I have a boyfriend, but even if I didn't, that still means I have to spend time with you. And you're such a trash person that that's like the... You'd have to pay me like a million dollars per... It's a full-time job, bro. It'd be a full-time, hard, arduous job for me to hang out with you. Like, you're gonna have to pay me a lot more than one really nice bag and a good time on my birthday only. Because I, I, it, it's a, it would be a full-time job, bro. You need to pay me a lot if I was gonna be with you, right? So she's kind of just sitting there with a very blank look. And look, the thing is, too, is Maddie was making it as clear as humanly possible that she was not interested, that she was not rocking with, uh, with the spoiled kid, right? Because she was just sitting there giving him a very kind of like glazed over expression, a very blank look, a very just like, bro, can you please leave type look. Like she wasn't like saying thank you to any of the compliments. She wasn't being like, oh, tell me more when he was like, yeah, oh, my girls get the best treatment ever. Eventually, though, the spoiled kid is like, so what are you doing this Friday night? So if you just tell me, well, like your home address, like I'll literally come in like the sickest whip ever and I will pick you up and we can drive around anywhere. And just so people can see you in such a cool car with me, if you'd like. Like, it's just a courtesy I give to my girlfriends. By the way, you'd be one of many girlfriends, because I'm an alpha male top dog, bro. Just so you know. But, like, I treat all my girlfriends really well. <laughs> Maddie's just looking at him like, bro, who are you, man? Who are you? And by the way, that was a bluff. He didn't have any other girlfriends. But he thought if he told girls that he had a thousand girlfriends, that they would be like, oh, wow. Uh, I don't know, a proof of concept, man. You must be great. Uh, if other people are your girlfriends, then I would love to be as well. Ha ha. No, it was the dumbest thing ever, right? So Maddie then is like, hey, no, I'm actually busy. I can't. And Spoil Kid's like, ah, whatever, it's fine. I'm actually, oh, oh, I'm looking at my calendar right now, man. I'm actually so busy Friday night. Yep, okay, it doesn't work for me either. I have a lot of business to do. Yeah, I'm on a business call. Complete bluff. Complete bluff, but whatever. He's like, oh, so what about that Saturday? She's like, busy. He's like, oh, um, what about any time this month? Which, bro, I thought you just said you were on a business call. I thought you're a busy businessman, right? Oh, but now you're free for the entire month? Like, really? Did it really just turn that fast? And she's like, nope, sorry. Um, I also actually have no interest on going on a date. I'm fine being friends but I'm in a relationship. I made that very clear. And he's like, yeah, but like, but dude. And the spoiled kid literally points at Jeff and goes like, oh, kind of like makes this motion of like, him, really? And Jeff turns around and is like, dude, I'm sitting right here, bro. Like, chill the frick out. Like, I'm sitting right here. Because this kid was literally pointing at Jeff, looking at Maddie and being like, him, this is a guy when you can choose me. 
And, the, and at this point, the spoiled kid just can't believe... Because here's the thing. The spoiled kid has never been told no. He's only received... He's received everything, and he's never had to work for anything. And he has just been told no. His entire world has just been turned upside down. Because someone told him no. This is, this is unheard of. This is unbelievable. The spoiled kid can't believe his ears. Someone said no to him. That's ridiculous, man. But sure enough, right? Sure enough. Maddie holds her ground. She's like, no, sorry. And the spoiled kid, since he can't believe that a girl would ever reject him, decides to turn to Jeff and blames Jeff and be like, bro, I don't know like what you did to make her say no to me. And Jeff's like, well, be her boyfriend. What the frick? What, dude? Huh? But he's like, dude, you're you're gonna like pay for it, man. I'm gonna make your life a living hell for this. Like, bro, you totally messed up big. You don't even know. The spoiled kid gets up and like storms out of the room. And Jeff just looks at Maddie and be like, well, that was one of the most uncomfortable situations I've been in. And Maddie looks at him and is like, dude, yeah, you think about me. I just had to listen to this kid basically just touch his own peenie for 25 minutes, talking about how great he is, and then ask me out. Like, what? Dude, I said I had a boyfriend in the first 30 seconds. He just kept going. He didn't care. Just like, yeah, how do you think I feel? I was emasculated for the... Well, actually, no, I wasn't emasculated. The whole thing was pretty funny. Like, I, I, I knew I was chilling, but dang. Well, I guess we're about to see how he's going to quote-unquote ruin my life. Jeff really thought this kid was bluffing. Jeff really thought that this, like, the spoiled kid was just saying this to try and get under Jeff's skin or whatever, which he kind of did a little bit because Jeff was pretty annoyed by the whole situation. But Jeff didn't really expect that the spoiled kid was going to follow through and do anything. However, the spoiled kid was a little bit more true to his word than Jeff imagined. Since the spoiled kid always kind of got anything he ever wanted, he kind of just assumed that, oh, he's, he's not actually going to follow through with this. Like, he's literally just saying this. But no, the spoiled kid actually went ahead and did something bad. So anyways, right, one day, the next day, Jeff is walking back home. So Jeff lives close enough that he can just walk back home. So every single day, he'd get his backpack, say goodbye to his girlfriend, say peace to the boys. Maybe they're going to hop on Fortnite later that night. Who knows, right? He just walks back. Normally, he'll, like, throw in some music or something, put in some, like, earbuds or whatever. Maybe he'll just, like, I don't know, enjoy nature for once. Nah, that's cringe, man. He puts in music. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but this one day, you know, Jeff is walking back, and he's just, uh, he doesn't have his earbuds in. Uh, I think he just maybe, I don't know, maybe his phone died, or he just wasn't feeling it. And that's when he hears a car drive by. Look, he walks back on a path that's near a road. Of course, cars drive by all the time. You might be thinking, why am I even saying this? Well, the car didn't drive by normally. It started to slow down. And when a car slows down, it normally, like, will either kind of, like, idle, it'll park, but there's no parking spots around this, like, this part of the path- pathway. So it was a little weird. So Jeff kind of, like, turns his head to look over, and he sees a car, a very fancy BMW car, and it was a very fancy one, right? And it slows down, and the window rolls down, and he sees the spoiled kid. The spoiled kid's like, Jeff... You didn't think I was going to let you go that easy, right? And so Jeff in his head is like, oh, okay, the spoiled kid has not forgotten about the events of today, I guess. Maybe he wants to embarrass himself more. Maybe he is a thing for public humiliation, because right now he is publicly humiliating himself, bro. Like, I don't know what else to say here. And Jeff's like, dude, like, what, what, what's good? Like, what, what's up right now? And the spoiled kid's like, I don't know what you told Maddie to get her to not go on a date with me, but that's not cool, bro. And Jeff looks at him with a kind of a look of just, how can I get this through your thick little skull? Like, dude, and he literally says, turns her, like it turns him, dude, I'm her girl, (laughs) I'm her girlfriend, I'm her boyfriend. We've been together for a year. She was not gonna say yes to you, even if she would have wanted to in the first place, which she didn't. And the spoiled kid's like, yeah, right, that's funny, bro. Like, you know how many girls that I've gotten with that have been in relationships? At least a hundred, which, dude, maybe if he said one or two, it would have been believable. But dude said a hundred, bro, has definitely not gotten with anyone who's been in a relationship. And so Jeff looks at him and says, well, okay, well, I guess those girls didn't have as good a relationship as Maddie and I have. I don't know how else to say it. At this point, 
the spoiled kid's like, dude, that's just not, not possible, bro. My Riz was on point. Like, 100%. Like, I, dude, you don't understand. Uh, bro, uh, bro, I'm a, I, I, I'm, I'm a god of Riz, bro. Like, all the chicks, I have a 100% conversion rate. I'm 100%. I've slept with a thousand women at this point. Like, dude, what? Yeah, so sure. <laughs> I'm having way too much fun with these impressions sometimes, guys. I'm just... Uh... Anyways, though, so Jeff is, like, looking at this kid. Like, this kid is a major cap artist. Like, this is so stupid. Like, why am I even giving this guy, like, the light of day? Jeff's like, I don't know what to say, man. Go, like, hit on some other girl. 99 are in a good relationship. She's not going to get with you. Leave me alone. Goodbye. So he starts walking away. And so the spoiled kid is driving by him in his car... And it's like slows down, but keeps up pace with Jeff's walking. Spoiled kid's like, bro, don't think you're going to get out of this that easy, right? Don't think you're going to get out of this. I'm telling you, bro, I'm giving you a chance because I'm a humble, respectful, nice guy, right? And Jeff is like, you're a what? He's like, dude, I'm going to give you 24 hours to untell Maddie whatever you told her, whatever lie you told her to get her to not go out on a date with me. I'm going to give you 24 hours or your life's going to freaking suck, bro. And so... Yeah, the subscriber, Jeff, kind of looks at this kid and says, uh, no. The, I didn't say anything, but also, no. <laughs> dude, what? And the spoiled kid's like, dude, okay, I'm going to give you 24 hours to reconsider. And, uh, yeah, you're lucky I'm even giving you 24 hours or even an option to get out of a life of pain. And Jeff's just looking at this kid like, okay, bro, like, br bring it, I guess. So yeah, uh, Jeff walks away and the kid drives away. And Jeff is kind of just thinking to himself, what the frick just happened? So he picks up his phone, calls Maddie. Maddie's like, oh, what's good? He's like, dude, the spoiled kid just came up to me and said that like, I had 24 hours to untell you whatever I told you that made you not go out with him. Because it definitely wasn't because A, we're in a relationship and B, because maybe he's just not attractive to people like you because of his character and how much of a skadoosh she is. Like, maybe that's the reason. And Maddie's like, yeah, I'm so, this kid's delusional. And he said, I have 24 hours or my life will be like terrible and he'll make it terrible. And Maddie's like, oh, well, well, that's not good. And he's like, yeah, I, Maddie, don't worry about it. Like, I, I really don't care. This kid, what can this kid do? So this kid actually did some stuff. Yeah, and we're going to get into that. So the spoiled kid, I I'm actually, I'm not going to tell you. I will tell you in a second. But the next day, Jeff gets into school. And Jeff is friendly with a lot of people. Jeff is friends with a lot of people, but he's only close friends with a couple. Honestly, that's kind of how it goes. You really only need two or three really tight-knit friends. And then what beyond that is kind of just gravy, in my opinion. I think it's really nice to be friendly with a ton of people. Maybe you have like boys in a class. Like you go, you know someone in your class, you always hang out with them, you chill with them in class, but you don't talk to them that much outside of class. Maybe you walk to class with some guys or maybe you chill with someone at one, like people you aren't that close with, but it's just nice to kind of have a network of people you're friends with. So anyways, Jeff got into school and there's kind of like a routine he'd go through. Like he'd see person X for a second. He'd see person Y as they're walking by. He'd catch up with person Z. All these people would see him, would turn away, basically run away from him. Out of like the 15 people Jeff normally spoke with every day, zero. Zero out of 15. They all saw him coming and turned and went the other way. Jeff didn't make the connection, but he was like, dude, something's really weird. And it was just really, it was just really weird, dude. Like, Jeff had no idea how to react to it. So Jeff, like, at lunch, like, sits down and talks to his girlfriend. He's like, hey, like, people are acting really weird to me today. And she's like, Jeff, like, I need to tell you something. And he's like, yeah, Maddie, like, what's good? And she's like, I heard, like, the spoiled kid did something crazy. And Jeff's like, um, crazier than yesterday? And she's like, yes, yes, much crazier. Basically... This kid has gone around and figured out everybody that you talk with. And basically, he, he's, he's paying them every single day to not talk to you and to avoid you. Apparently, he's paying them like $10 every single day just to not talk to you. And this, at this point, Jeff's like, what? Yeah, so the spoiled kid had access to a lot of money. And I know some of you guys might be thinking $10, like really. But you have to realize, first of all, this is high school. $10 is freaking huge. Like, even now, like, I'd do stuff for $10. But at the same time, it's like, especially in high school, $10 a day? 
And also the only thing you have to do is just not talk to someone you're not even super close with. Like all 15 of those people did it. Are they kind of snakes for doing it? Yeah, a little bit. But at the end, it was a good deal, like the free market, I guess. But anyways, so Jeff's like, well, that explains all the weirdness that's happening today. And Maddie's like, like, I'm sorry, like, like, this is my fault. And he's like, no, no, this is not your fault. This is this cringe kid who can't accept that he loses, right? He can't accept that he doesn't get everything that he ever wants. You know what? Let's play hardball. I don't care. So uh, Jeff only had one friend. He had his girlfriend, and then he had one friend. He used to talk to like 20, 30 people every single day. Social life got super reduced, completely cut down. Jeff kind of expected that the spoiled kid would just stop after a couple days, and he'd be able to talk to these people again, even though he doesn't even really know if he wants to talk to these people again, because he doesn't really know if he wants to associate with people that would completely drop him for BS reasons for only $10. Like, really, man? Really, dude? But anyways, uh, it just keeps going. And after about a week and a half, Jeff's like low-key not having a good time, dude. Because there's like one person that he talks with. And he kind of like, because this is like his close friend, right? It's his girlfriend and his close friend. But he misses like being able to talk with a bunch of people. And the spoiled kid is not letting down. If anything, he's paying off more and more people to not talk to Jeff, to exclude him from activities outside of school, to not let him like do stuff, whatever. And Jeff's social life is kind of getting crunched, which is really unfortunate. So uh, Jeff goes to one of his close, um, not friends, but someone that he looks up to, someone that he has a great relationship with, and that is the principal. Yes, finally, the main, not the main character, but the secret character that's in the title that is going to come in and save the day is finally being introduced. So Jeff and the principal went way back. So a long time ago, Jeff was a lot more of a rowdy kid who would break a lot more rules. He broke a pretty big rule and like him and the principal had to spend a lot of time together because like he, he, he did something kind of bad. It wasn't like terrible, but it was like for the time it wasn't great. And uh, him and Jeff actually bonded over a lot of stuff. They both had specific family life issues that they could relate on, you know, and he kind of became a secondary father mentor figure type thing. And uh, Jeff would go speak with the principal every once in a while about like life, about things, how things were going. Jeff was doing pretty well in school and he wasn't breaking any rules or anything, completely changed his trajectory. It was mostly all thanks to the principal. So this time, you know, he asked the principal if he could talk and they sat down. The principal's like, so what's up? And Jeff basically explains the last 25 minutes to the principal. I'm not going to re-explain it because you guys have already heard it. And by the end of it, the principal's like, Wow, like, I knew that kid was a little weird, but this is really extreme. And the principal, first of all, says, okay, well, as much as this sucks, first thing I will say is that the people that, you know, are being paid $10 to not be friends with you anymore really aren't good friends in the first place. And while this is really unfortunate, I guess it really does show you who is actually your friend or not. And the principal says, you know, I used to have a really big social circle, but, uh, you know, the second I wasn't reaching out to them every five seconds, they kind of just fell off, of, they just kind of like fell off the map. And the principal says, I really only talk to like two to three people every single day now. And uh, my life's okay. But that doesn't excuse what this guy is doing. And the principal says, you know what? I think I can help you out. So this is what the principal does. He calls in Jeff's friend and he says, hey, like, is there like any chance that, uh, you know, you're, that you've been offered money by the spoiled kid? And Jeff's friend says, yeah, he's been like texting me for like the last week or so asking every single day to give me $10 to start, stop hanging out with him. Like, it's so annoying. And he's like, I'd never say yes. Like, that's ridiculous. And the principal's like, whoa, 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 chill out. We're going to call Jeff's close friend, the only friend that stuck with him, Ben. And the principal's like, actually, like, can I see your phone? Like, I want, I want you to help me catch this guy. And then Ben's like, oh, okay, word, cool. So Ben hands over the phone. And the principal responds to the text message, like the thousand text messages, right? Saying, I'll give you 10 bucks if you stop hanging out with him. And the principal's like, hey, on Ben's account, acting like he's Ben, basically is saying like, oh, like, okay, yeah, actually I've changed my mind. Like I'll, ten I'll take the 10 bucks. And the principal starts going on to ask more questions about like, oh, so out of curiosity, how many other people are you doing this with? Like, are you paying all these people? Like, what's the motive? And at this point, the spoiled kid is spilling everything because the spoiled kid is just so excited because the spoiled kid truly believes that he just got Ben because he thinks, 
I got all of Ben's kind of close friends to stop talking with him. Now I just got Ben's last close friend to stop talking with him. Then the final nail in the coffin will be when I get Ben's girlfriend. Oh, not Ben. When I get uh, Jeff's girlfriend. Like, ha ha ha. Spoiled Kid really believes that he just won right here. So he's telling Ben, quote unquote, which is actually the principal behind the screen, right? Everything. The principal, like, airdrops or sends the, takes screenshots, sends the files to his computer, prints it out on, like, literal physical paper, puts it in an envelope, grabs the envelope, and starts walking towards the Spoil Kid's class. So he knows the Spoil Kid, he looked up on the computer which class the Spoil Kid was in, and, uh, went up to his class, five minutes before got out, was literally just waiting outside, and then the bell rang, the door opened, the Spoil Kid is walking out, and his chest is all puffed out, he's all excited, pumped up, because he's like, dude, like, I'm literally, I'm literally dancing on this kid, Jeff, right now. I'm literally dancing on him. And after I'm done dancing on him, I'm going to steal his girlfriend, dude. Like, I'm literally on a heater, bro. I'm never going to miss. And, uh, yeah, that's when he was faced with the principal who stopped him and said, Hey, can I talk to you for a second? And, you know, spoiled kid's like, oh, yeah, sure. Okay. And the principal looks at him and is like, So, out of curiosity, have you been asking people or paying people ten dollars to stop talking to a fellow classmate because that would be bullying and harassment by the way the spoiled kid's like dude no i'd never do that he's like have you talked to ben specifically about that just out of curiosity and you know at this point the spoiled kid's like oh dude no ben's a loser i never talked to him bro i've never even spoken to him on social media ever which the kid didn't know he was literally digging his own grave. And the principal's like, oh, so do you want to explain these to me? Total Chris Hansen style. Like, pulls out the manila envelope, shows all the screenshots on a piece of paper. And the spoiled kid's like, dude, that's not even, uh, what? And at that point, the spoiled kid knew he messed up. So yeah, the principal brought him to the front office. The principal also had a little bit of an investigation and interviewed everybody else that was paid off. Those kids didn't get in trouble because... While they did something a little snaky, they didn't technically break any rules or anything. The principal did tell them, look, what you guys did was pretty messed up, but you're not in trouble. Just don't do that again in the future, like just for life lesson or whatever. But yeah, the spoiled kid himself actually got uh, three days of suspension. But the most important thing is not just the three days of suspension. He had to write an apology letter to both Jeff and Maddie, his girlfriend. Dude. This is the greatest principle of all time. Click on the video on screen right now. I know today we have a story of this teacher who completely owns the spoiled kid. I know you guys will enjoy it. It's a perfect karma story. Let's just get into it. subscriber in today's story, John. So this all happened one day when John was in seventh grade, and John had a regular teacher in his history class. However, the teacher was sick and was pretty sick, had a pretty bad case of the cold, but happened to be out for an entire week. John didn't know this at the time, but you know, the substitute teacher just came in every single day that week, so his teacher happened to be out for the week. And this substitute teacher was pretty epic, was, was a pretty cool guy, as you will see. It's not apparent at first, but trust me, the payoff is totally worth it. There's also a bully in John's school, unfortunately, and the bully is in John's history class. History, yeah, okay. In, in John's history class, right? And this bully has been kind of known as like the bully for the longest time. John is in seventh grade and he's been going to the same school since he was in first grade. And this kid has always been known as a school bully since first grade, since the first year John has been there. And obviously as the kid has gotten older, he's gotten more, you know, crueler and more sophisticated with his bullying. But he just never stopped. And John would always tell his parents, and his parents were like, oh, well, he's gonna grow up someday. And let me just say, it has been eight, it has been seven years. It has been seven years of long, long bullying. And John's been waiting for long enough. So this all happened. Let's go to day one. So day one, John comes in the class and he's waiting for his regular teacher and the substitute teacher walks in instead. And John's like, oh, okay, I guess we have a substitute today. And the substitute is like, hey class, like my name is Mr. Davenport. I will be substituting for Mr. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Kavanaugh because you know, he, you know, he's sick today. And if he's sick for any other days this week, I'll be substituting as well. Like we'll be doing normal activities. Class will be continuing as usual. I, you know, I've studied the lesson plan and things will be like normal. So anyways, on the first day, Class was fairly normal, and, you know, John was sitting with his friend, Ben. 
Ben is not the bully this time. Uh, he normally is. Whenever I have a bad character, I always name him Ben because we're just calling the bully the bully. So John and Ben were sitting together and they were doing some kind of like, you know, some reading activity in the class or something. And that's when they look over and they see the bully. And the bully is with his other minions, you know. So a lot of times in school, like the bully will have like his minions that do whatever he says. And the bully had his minions in this class and they were sitting there and they were snickering because they were like throwing, like they were like chewing, like crunching up and chewing up wads of paper and then spitting them through tubes. So kind of like spitballing people in class and people would turn around and be like, hey, who did that? And they'd like look away and snicker. Everyone knew it was the bully, but they also didn't want to mess with the bully because the bully was known for like upping his bullying against anyone who kind of like fought back. So it was kind of just known that, that the best thing you could have done in that situation was kind of just ignore it because the, the more or, or the less you ignore it, the worse it gets and the harder it is to actually ignore. And, you know, John turned to Ben. He's like, you know what, this kid, this kid's been the worst for the longest time. Like, is anyone ever going to put a stop to this kid or is this kid ever going to grow up? And, you know, Ben is like, dude, I totally see this guy becoming some executive of a company and doing this exact same thing to his subordinates. Like, I see that happening. And John's just like, dude, I know that I told my mom this years ago that he was a bully. My mom's like, oh, he's going to grow up, John. He's going to grow up. Well, he's growing up to be a bigger butt than he was before. And the thing is, right, the bully overhears this. And the bully turns around and is like, hello, John. And John's like, oh, uh, hello there. And the bully's like, well, did I hear you guys talking about me? And Ben is like, no. The bully's like, I, well, I don't know. Last time I went to the doctor, last time I got my ears checked, the doctor said that they were pretty good, that I could hear quite well. So I really don't know what's going on. I really don't know what's going on because I thought I heard my name. And John's like, uh, nope, you must have heard it wrong. The bully's like, well, I guess that's the case. And... That better have been the case. Have a good day, fellas. Bully turns around, goes back to making spitballs. So John and Ben are kind of like talking with each other. And that's when John feels a wad of like wetness like appear on his neck. And he looks at it, and sure enough, it's one of the bully's spitballs. And the bully and his little minions are laughing or whatever. And Ben's like, uh, like you shouldn't. Don't react. Don't react, John. And John, he, he, does, he does kind of like the, he, he does the cool thing but also probably not the greatest idea. He takes a spitball and he throws it right back at the bully. And the bully, like, it catches him, like, on the eyebrow. And the bully peels the spitball off of his eyebrow and looks directly at John and legitimately just says, you're going to regret that. And Ben whispers, like, dude, why did you do that? Everyone knows if you just ignore him, he'll go away. And John turns to his friend Ben and says, bro, I've been ignoring him for the longest time. Everyone ignores him, and he just gets away with this all the time. And Ben's like, was that worth it, throwing that spitball back at him? Was that really worth it? And John's like, you know what? Yes, it was. So the bell rings, and everyone's leaving class. And John is like quickly leaving the class to go to his next class when he immediately finds himself on the floor because the bully stood in front of him, stuck out his leg very stiffly. John tripped on it and fell right over. And John's backpack like wasn't zipped up all the way and it kind of like flung over his head and everything spilled out in front of it. And the bully says, nice trip, John. Hopefully I'll see you next fall. <laughs> and John's like, you didn't even say the joke right. So Ben comes over, helps John get his stuff back up. And Ben's like, man, what did I tell you? You don't want to be messing with that bully, man. And John's like, you know what? I've had enough of not messing with them. You know what? Th this is war, man. This is war. And I'm going to be, maybe I'm going to be the first one. And maybe I'll be the only one to stand up to this kid. But you know what? I'll be damned if no one else stands up to this kid. I'll be damned if I let this kid like bully me again. And John and Ben's like, okay, we'll have fun being tripped. And John's like, well, that's not very funny, Ben. And Ben's like, I'm serious. Like this kid's going to go hard until you stop. And then John's like, well, I'm not going to stop. So the next day rolls around, right? And, you know, John goes into school and he doesn't really think anything of it. And he goes into class and this kid is just staring him down the entire class. And John and Ben are sitting together. And this isn't like an activity class. This is kind of a sit there and listen to the lecture class. And Ben kind of leans over and whispers, John. John's like, yeah, what's up, Ben? And Ben's like, dude, the bully's staring at you. 
And John's like, dude, I know. His eyes are piercing the back of my skull. Sure enough, right, the bully has just been, like, staring at John, kind of smiling. And his two little minions are, like, staring as well. And the substitute teacher at the front of the class doesn't seem to be paying any attention to this. Little did you guys know he actually is, but that's for later in the story. He comes in to be pretty epic later on. But anyways, John's like, you know what? I don't care, Ben. He can stare at me all he wants. If he really wants me like that, I'm going to have to let him down softly because I don't want to hurt his feelings. And Ben's like, dude, you're getting yourself in really deep. I don't know if this is a good idea. And Ben's like, this is a great idea. This is probably my best idea yet. Uh, it was maybe not John's best idea, idea yet because John gets up to leave and he's very careful not to have, not to trip over anything. And that's when he's met at the end. Like, as soon as he leaves the classroom, he bumps right into the bully who's standing there. He's like, oh, hello there, John. The bull, and John's like, hi. And the bully's like, well, you know, I, I don't know if you're available this afternoon, but uh, I just gotta have a word with you this afternoon. John's like, I'm actually busy. I gotta go home. And Bully's like, ah, I think you'll find time. I think you'll find time. And then the bully and his minions walk away. And Ben walks up to me. He's like, John, John, what just happened? And, and John's like, dude, what? He just came up to me and said, uh, am I free this afternoon? And Ben's like, oh, my God. And John's like, dude, what? He just said, if I'm free this afternoon. And Ben's like, dude, dude, no. And John's like, dude, what? what is going on? And Ben's like, bro, that's what he tells people before he beats them up, bro. And Ben's like, dude, what? And John's like, yeah. Or uh, Ben's like, John's like, what? And Ben's like, dude, you gotta hide. And uh, sure enough, John is starting to take this a little bit more seriously because while the bully is not that harmful, like physically, when you don't push back, in the rare cases people have pushed back, he is trying to continuously like show his authority, basically, show his dominance. Um, or however he chooses to do that. So Ben and John are like, John's like, all right, well, you know, this probably isn't a good idea. We got to find a way to sneak out of school because there's like one main exit and kind of like the place where people get picked up because uh, John rides the bus, right? There's like a place where the bus always arrives, but to get there, you have to go through this main hall and Ben and John sit down and realize that the bully is most likely going to try and intercept them in the main hall and like pull John aside and, you know, give him a few, uh, few one twos, you know what I mean? And so John is like, all right, Ben, well, we got to, we got to figure this out. So they look around, they find another exit. And so they basically decide to skip their next class. Normally a bad idea, but you know, this is quite the circumstances. So they're looking around and you know, they, they look and they're like, oh my God, here's another exit. And then it's, they see it's a fire exit. So if they push this, they'll push the fire alarm. They'll get in a ton of trouble. It'll just be a bad, it, it'll be a bad situation, right? It'll be a bad deal. Real quick, if you made it this far into the video, comment bully down below, and I'll try and hard as many comments to say that. I just want to see how many people, and I also want to see the names and the faces of the people supporting this channel by watching this far. If you don't know, the best way to support this channel is just by watching the videos. It's called Watch Time. YouTube really appreciates that. So if you want to really support the channel, maybe now or later, sit down and watch two, three, four. Watch as many videos as you possibly can. Uh, and also, you can do this while gaming, uh, drawing, trying to go to sleep, cleaning your room, literally whatever. And please go in the comment section down below and tell me what are you, you are doing while binge watching the videos and supporting the channel. And I'll shout some people out like the person on screen right now who is doing this. So thank you to this person on screen as well as thank you to all of you guys for supporting the channel by binge watching the videos. With that being said, let's get back to the story. So this point, right, John and Ben are looking around frantically, skipping a, skipping a class, right? So they're taking it pretty seriously, trying to find an exit, which is not going to be the exit that the bully expects, because there's normally one main way that everyone leaves the building and then goes to the bus or goes to get picked up. And they're assuming that the bully is going to know this, which, I mean, he is going to know this, and he's going to be waiting there, and he's going to pick John up and give him the whole one-two, right? So John and Ben are looking around, and they they do find an exit. However, unfortunately, it is a fire escape. And Ben is looking at his watch. He's like, dude, we got 10 minutes till the bell rings. And John's like, well, can't we just wait it out? And he's like, dude, like you're going to miss the bus and then you're going to be stranded here. And John's like, I could always call my mom and say I missed the bus. And Ben's like, bro, they're going to know that you didn't leave and they're going to come find you in this building, one of his minions at least, right? And then you're going to be stuck here probably for an hour without your mom coming to pick you up. You don't want to do this. And John's like, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to walk there and just like let it happen? 
And Ben's like, we still got 10 minutes. We can figure this out. So John and Ben are frantically like going around the school trying to figure it out. And that's when John or Ben actually has the brilliant idea of John, John, John. And Ben's like, what? And, or John, or, and John's like, what? And Ben's like, dude, I figured it out. We're not supposed to be looking for doors. And John's like, dude, what do you mean we're not supposed to be looking for doors? And Ben's like, windows, John. There are no fire exit windows. And John's like, oh. So then now they start looking around. And a lot of the windows are like glued shut or way too high or have like some screen in them. But that's when they go into the bathroom. And they find glass windows that when you like crank them, they go up. And when you crank them, they go down. There's no, there's no massive drop. It's like a three foot drop or something. They're not super big, but you, you can put your backpack through them and then you can crawl through them as well. And it's the perfect escape. And that's when the bell rings. And John and Ben are like, all right, or Ben's like, all right, John, let's go. So sure enough, John pushes his backpack through. Ben pushes his backpack through. John gets up there, goes through the window, drops down, says it's all good, not a big drop or anything. Ben goes through, does the same thing. They get their backpacks on and they sneak around the school and they see the bus and they sprint towards the bus. And they're sprinting towards the bus. They get on it and they both sit in the back. And when they both sit in the back, they're looking out and they see one of the, the, the bully's minions walk out to the bus and look around, right? And that's when the bully makes eye contact with John and calls back. And John's like, dude, they see us. And, you know, Ben's like, okay, what we need to do is we need to go to the front of the bus. And, and Ben's like, or John's like, why would we need to go to the front of the bus? And he's like, shenanigans happens in the back of the bus, John. And John's like, okay. And then Ben's like, the bus driver will not allow this kid to beat you up in the front of the bus. And John's like, all right, totally fair. That makes a lot of sense. So John and Ben go all the way up to the front of the bus. And that's when, as they're about to leave, the bully gets on and says, oh, John, I thought we we're having a little date this later tonight. And John turns to Ben and he's like, see, I told you he's into me. And Ben's like, pay attention. And the bully's like, so sad that you had to avoid us. Well, I'll be seeing you tomorrow. So anyways, the next day in history class, you know, John and Ben are sitting together and the teacher is handing back, you know, grades from a test that, you know, was administered the week before. And the bully was sitting behind this girl. Let's just call her Caitlin for the sake of this. She doesn't really come up again, so I'll call her Caitlin. And if I forget, who cares? So the teacher is giving back the tests and, you know, John and Ben did fine. John got an A minus, Ben got a B, like totally fine grades. And when the teacher gives the test back to Caitlin, Caitlin ends up getting a C. And, you know, C is, I guess, fine enough. It's not a really, it's not a grade you should be shooting for in a lot of cases. Maybe some math classes I can understand. But it was, it, either way, Caitlin was really not happy with it. And the bully turns around and it's like, oh no, the water works. And Caitlin starts crying a little bit. The bully's like, oh no, did you disappoint your parents again by doing bad? Well, next time, just try harder, Caitlin. And the bully turns around and his minions are laughing. And, you know, Ben is, or John is like, Dude, this guy is legitimately the worst. Do you see why I'm standing up to him? And Ben's like, are you really standing up to him? Like, you're just running away from him at this point. John's like, what would you do in my situation? And Ben's like, I don't know, be a bystander, stay quiet, <laughs> like keep my head down, and wait till I get to leave middle school. And, and Ben's, like, John's like, that's not the point, Ben. That's not the point. This kid is doing this and we're allowing it to happen. And, you know, Ben's like, yeah, we are. It sucks. What do you want us to do? John's like, I don't know. I don't know. And no one was noticing, but the substitute teacher was starting to really pay attention to everything that was going on in class, right? So after school again, John and Ben, you know, they're going around, they're walking around, and they're trying to find, they're going, they're going to the bathroom, right? And they're skipping the last class, or they're leaving five minutes early from their last class because they have to get, quote-unquote, picked up early. They faked, like, a absence tea note from their parents or whatever. So they're out of class five minutes early, and they're both walking to the bathroom. And that's when they run into the substitute teacher. Sub substitute teacher's like, hey, boys. And they're like, hey, Mr. Davenport. And Mr. Dav Mr. Davenport's like boys, I don't think you're supposed to be out of class yet. And, you know, Ben's like, yeah, well, we have a, we have a reason. It's, uh, and John's like, no, we left class early. And Mr. Davenport's like, boys, you know, you can't be doing that. And that's when John's like, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to tell him everything. So John lays it out and tells him literally everything. And Mr. Davenport's like, wow, wow. 
I was starting to pick up on some themes going on as well as, you know, what, uh, you know, the bully did in class to Kaylin today, but I didn't know it went down that deep. Are you boys able to get any, uh, any evidence for me? And, you know, the, the kids are like, what? And, you know, the substitute teacher's like, yeah, I've actually uh, been putting together a bit of a file recently on this kid. I uh, was a little disturbed when I saw him trip you, and I uh, wanted to really, really get some... I, I wanted to stand back. I wanted to be a bystander. I wanted to watch what was happening so that I could collect enough evidence so that this kid, who seems like a real systemic problem, could be dealt with properly. And at this point, right, John's like, wait, so you saw that all? And the substitute teacher's like, yes, but, you know, what power do I have as, a, what power do I have as a substitute? However, I do have the power if I sit back and watch and observe everything and write it down and get evidence that I can submit a real file and really get a mark on this kid's record and maybe stop him for good if he wants a future. And John's like, oh my God. And Ben turns him and says, like, dude, we need proof that this kid's going to try and beat you up. And John's like, I don't know how we're going to do it. He always words it weirdly. And John's like, well, maybe I should go meet him. And the substitute teacher's like, I don't think that's necessary, right? Like, I, I don't want like to put you in danger. And John's like, no, but I need to get this kid gone. And substitute teacher's like, well... I don't know how much the administration would like this, but I can stand guard, and right before anything happens, I can come and break it up. And John and Ben kind of look at each other like, okay, this is like some scrawny random substitute teacher. What if, like, he really holds no authority? And John's like, well, I mean, oh, I got to stop this kid somehow. So sure enough, right, John turns to Ben and says, Ben, you need to record everything. So Ben has his phone out, and he starts recording, right, and they walk down the halls, and Ben's trying to be, like, it's not super obvious with his recording, so he kind of, like, pretends like he's just on his phone, the flash is off. He's able to record it pretty well without it being super obvious. And eventually, so they're walking down the hall, and the bully's like, well, boys, I wasn't sure if I was going to see you today. It's great that you're here. And he's like, you know, Ben, I don't really have any issues with you. You can keep going. And Ben's like, well, I'm just going to wait for John. We ride the bus tomorrow. The bully's like, you know, I don't think that John will be riding the bus today. And Ben's like, well, then I won't be riding the bus today either. The bully's like, fine, well, then stand over there unless you want to become collateral damage. And so John, you know, Ben does step away. And, you know, the bully starts coming up to John. And John's like, what are you going to do to me? And the bully's like, no, I'm just going to, you know, we're just going to have a little time. And then the bully, like, kind of comes up to him menacingly. And he's like, why did you disrespect me in class two days ago? And John's like, You spat a spitball at me. I just threw it back to you. That sounds fair. The bully's like, there is a rule of law here. There's a hierarchy here. Some of us are above others at this school, and I'm just here to enforce it. And John's like, how are you going to enforce it? And the bully lifts up his fist and says, this fist will make contact with your face. That is the rule of law at this school. And as soon as that happens, the substitute teacher sprints out of there and is like, hey, break it up, boys, break it up. And, you know, the bully turns around and says, oh, Mr. Davenport, like nothing's going on here. I'm just having a talk with my friend. Mr. Davenport's like, well, it doesn't look like that to me. Um, John, I'm going to need you to come with me. The bully's like, no, John's staying with us. And Mr. Davenport's like, I can get the principal over here. And the bully's like... Fine, you know what, John, we'll have a little talk later. Go ahead, see you in class tomorrow, Mr. Davenport. And the bully and his minions walk away. And, you know, Mr. Davenport's like, oh my God, that was so close. Like, I'm like, that was really reckless of me to even let that happen. And John's like, no, we got it on a recording. He turns to Ben, he's like, Ben, you got that on recording, right? And Ben's like, yep, got it on recording. He's like, audio, checks it. He's like, yep, visuals. He's like, visuals are pretty good, a little shaky, because I didn't want it to be obvious. I caught it all. At this point, right, Ben, Mr. Davenport, and uh, <coughs> John, they all go back to Mr. Davenport's, like, classroom, or it's his substitute teacher, so it's, like, the other teacher's classroom, but they go to that classroom, and, you know, John's like, hey, can you call up my mother and say I'm not going to be, like, that I had to stay late for an extra help project, and that, you know, 
that I'm not going to be able to make the bus. So Mr. Davenport calls up his mom and his dead John's mom's like, oh my God, are John and Ben in trouble? Mr. Davenport's like, actually, the contrary. They wanted to help me with an assignment and they will be getting extra credit. And John's like, oh, that's so nice. Whatever, right? So afterwards, John, Ben, and Mr. Davenport sit down and they basically construct a case against this kid. They construct bits of evidence. John starts hitting up other kids in his class, basically asking for testimonials. They are making a full takedown of this kid, right? Of years and years and years of just everything, right? And at this point, they end up with a really, like, a really solid case file. They have enough to at least get him suspended, if not expelled from the school at this point. So the real nail in the coffin is when, you know, Ben turns to, uh, ben turns to John. He's like, John, do you remember James? And they're like, yeah, yeah, James, whatever happened to him? Ben's like, dude, that was the kid that, you know, the bully actually beat up. And so basically, right, there's this kid who they haven't spoken to in a while, but there was, like, a rumor that, like, the reason why he was gone for a week is because he was in the hospital and, like, because the bully, like, beat him up. And when he tried to, like, say, that like, oh, the bully did it, the bully was able to weasel out of it. And John's like, dude, with all this evidence, if we got, like, a medical record about James and put him in the case, we could get this kid out. So they contact James. He's not really responding. But Ben remembers, oh, my God, I was in, like, a sixth grade group chat with this kid. I have his number. So they call him up. And James is like, Hello? And Ben and Jan- Ben and John say, "Hey, I don't know if you remember us." They explain everything, and James is like, "Look, this kid has been giving me grief for the longest time ever. I tried to rat him out. I've been out like he isn't giving me any more grief. Like I don't know if I want to do this because, look, I will suffer the consequences if he doesn't get completely like kicked out of the school, and you know my name's attached to this." And then Mr. Davenport speaks up and says, "Hey, like James, you don't know me, but." I'm a substitute teacher, Mr. Davenport. I happen to be a decently good friends with, uh, you know, the, the teacher, well, to say Mr. Kavanaugh, that was the name I gave him, with Mr. Kavanaugh. It's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, he recommend, me, re- recommended me to come in for this week. And he said, I will make sure that this kid gets, ex- like, expelled. And the two boys were looking at each other like, wow, like, this guy's serious. And, you know, James is like, all right, well, I don't know how much I can help, but I can definitely get you the medical records. And they're like, can you do it by tonight? James is like, uh, yeah, you know, I'll talk to my parents, but we'll see. And, Jay, and uh, John and Ben were like, all right, we'll take, we'll see. Thank you so much. Like, tonight would be the greatest. We're trying to get this in by tomorrow. And things might leak if we don't. So anyways, later that night, you know, Mr. Davenport's like, all right, just send me the stuff on your school email. It doesn't matter it's on school email. I don't care. So sure enough, right, you know, the next day or that night, James sends them like a medical record. He said, this is the date. This is the injuries. Like this, like it wasn't enough to put this guy away or not put this guy away, but get him suspended before. But hopefully, James is like, hopefully with all the other evidence you have, this will be enough to get the bully out of the school. So they send it to James. James sends it to Mr. Davenport. And Mr. Davenport is like, all right, men, like I will need you tomorrow, bright and early. Um, I'm gonna excuse you from all your classes. You're coming with me. We're all gonna go into the principal's office and we're dropping this bombshell. So the next day rolls around, as it always does. But this was a special day. They all walk in, John, Ben, and Mr. Davenport walk to the principal's office. They sit down. John and Ben explains everything that's happened, not just this week, but ever. And Mr. Davenport explains all the things he's observed. And the principal's like, wow, this is quite a lot. And Mr. Davenport's like, well, this isn't it. And Mr. Davenport then sends like the the terabyte large, okay, it's probably smaller than a terabyte, but the very large file that they've created with all the evidence, with all the like the references, with all the people's testimonies. And the principal's like, wow, this is... This is intense. And Mr. Davenport's like, it's really thorough too. And so basically, right, the principal's office is like, we need a couple days to make, to like go through this. And the principal's office like, you know, Ben and John, um, like you guys can be excused for the next couple days. You're not suspended. You're not anything. But if you want to take the next couple days off just for your own protection as we vet through this, that's totally fine. So John and Ben were like, oh, shoot, like, of course. The school contacts their parents. They explain that they're not in trouble. It's for their own safety. And, the you know, John's mom's like, oh, John, you should have told me about this, whatever. So a couple days go by, and that's when Mr. Davenport emails John. And the headline of the email is, 
the verdict is in. So John immediately, he sees the, like the notification on his phone and he immediately opens up the Gmail app and he's just swiping and refreshing and refreshing. And he eventually opens up the app, gets in there, opens the email and it's one click line on the video saying, on screen we right won. now. I know you'll enjoy it. Just click it, do it. So spoiled rich kids tend to think that they deserve everything. And when they, things don't go their way, they normally get really mad. In this case, the spoiled rich kid gets so mad that he burns down his entire school. Yeah, a little bit of an overreaction. This is an absolutely crazy story, so buckle up and let's get right into it. So we're gonna call the subscriber who submitted this story, Sam. So anyways, there's a spoiled kid. And I'm going to go through the chronicles of everything that happened to the spoiled kid that led up to the point of him wanting to actually and successively burning down his entire school. Dude, the amount of spoiled kids who commit arson in some way is kind of ridiculous, but you know, it's a good story. So anyways, this all started. Sam was first aware of the spoiled kid because Sam was on the football team at his high school. Sam wasn't the star quarterback or anything, but he was, you know, he'd been playing football for a little bit. He was big enough and... You know, he was solidly on the team. Every single year, they had tryouts for the different positions just in case there was kind of a, I don't know, a dark horse that they weren't aware of. But most of the time, the coaches knew who was going to be what. And the tryouts were more just to see who would be on kind of like the lower levels of the team that might be able to work their way up next year. But anyways, at the school, at Sam School, there's a kid who we will call the spoiled kid. The spoiled kid, as every spoiled kid, right, has received everything that they've ever wanted in their entire lives. They've never had to work for anything. They don't know the they don't understand the value of, you know, of things or getting something or accomplishments because they just believed because I want something, I should get it. That is genuinely their mentality. And the spoiled kid went into the football tryouts with this exact mentality. So anyways, this all happened or this all started this long saga all started when football tryouts were beginning. So Sam was there, and Sam had been on the team the year before, as this was sophomore year. So Sam last year had to try out, had to put in a lot of effort, but eventually, you know, he got onto the team, and he kind of had a pretty solid place on the team now. Uh, he still went, everyone had to go to tryouts, but he kind of knew he was on. On the other hand, there was a spoiled kid. The spoiled kid was not built for football. Dude, I'm not built for football. It's fine. You don't have to be, right? Because, I mean, you can be smaller and scrawnier and be on the football team. But, dude, it's just going to be a lot harder because it's a very physical contact-on-contact -contact sport. But anyways, the spoiled kid, not only not being really built for football because maybe your skill and your flexibility and your mobility could get you around that hurdle, he also just didn't play that much. Like, he literally threw the football with his dad, like, twice and would just, like, sit on the sidelines when his kids would play touch football or tag football or whatever. And dude came at the spoiled kid. Basically, what happened was he heard about how the, quote-unquote, high school quarterback always got the ladies in the movies. He was, like, watching a lot of TV shows and movies over the summer, and he was like, okay, I know what I got to be. I got to be the high school quarterback because the ladies love the high school quarterback, man. Therefore... I must be the high school quarterback. So yeah, um, that's his that's his reasoning. Do you, do you, okay? So do you think that he trained? He uh, practiced? He at least understood the rules of football um, before that summer before trying to apply? No, no. He just went in cold, knowing that he wanted to be star quarterback, and since he's gotten everything that he's ever wanted before, then he shall receive star quarterback. So, anyways, it's finally the day of tryouts, and Sam gets there, and you know he. He, you know, links up with the coach. He's like, what's good? The coach is like, ah, oh, Sam, great to see you again. Like, look, these tryouts are just, uh, you know, they're important for everyone to do it. You've got a pretty solid spot on the team, though, but don't slack off. But yeah, don't worry about it, basically. And they get there, and so they're all lined up, and the football coach is like, welcome to the whatever year football season for whatever school, academy, you know, whatever, right? And he's like, these will be the tryouts. We'll let you know how things are shaking up by the end of this week. We will let you know with good, you know, pretty promptly if we don't think you're going to make the team. So we'll make, we'll make first round cuts by the end of tomorrow, just so you guys have a lot of flexibility to figure out what sport you're playing in the fall, as the school required everyone to either play a sport or do some sort of activity during this time block. And so, yeah. So sure enough, you know, they're all trying out or whatever. And uh, Sam overhears the spoiled kid walk up to the football coach and be like, 
So, do you guys have an open position for star quarterback? Dude really just said star quarterback. Like, he's really just paraphrasing what he reads on TV. But anyways, the, the football coach is like, uh, well, actually, we have, you know, we have a pretty good quarterback already, but, I mean, it's really, we're going to put the, we're going to put the best person for the position in the spot. So, if you really think that, yeah, I mean, if you're a dark horse and you come out and you're not on our radar and you're much better, then a probability of that is pretty low, but, you know, we'd always love to see. The spoiled kid was like, I would like to be the star quarterback. And they're like, okay, well, we'll watch you during practice and we'll let you know if we think that you're in the running. The spoiled kid's like, what? what was that? I, was, I said, like, you know, we're, we're, we're filling out positions, right? So I, I just want to be star quarterback if that's cool. <laughs> and I think the coach is starting to realize that there's a bit of a disconnect between this kid and, uh, well, reality, but also uh, the understanding of how this whole process works, which, first of all, just was an immediate red flag to them that this kid did not understand football in the slightest, but beyond that, American football in the slightest, right? But beyond that, um, they were like, okay, well, the way it works here is that, you know, you'll play and we'll decide who gets what, what position. And this boy kid's like, um, okay, well, I do want to be star quarterback, but sure, I'll do tryouts or whatever. So I think the spoiled kid thought that, like, oh, well, I just need to do what everyone else does, so it's not obvious that they're just giving me the position. And the uh, coaches are thinking, what on earth is this kid thinking right now? By the way, leave a like and subscribe to the channel or you're a spoiled kid. Yeah. So uh, the actual tryouts, and remember, uh, Sam has overheard all of this. And he thinks it's pretty funny, because, like, you know, he sees the spoiled kid, he knows he's not star quarterback material, and he just knows for a fact that this kid had just been like, has no idea what football is. Just the way he was interacting with the coaches, he just knew for a fact this kid was not going to get out there and just be obviously great material for star quarterback. At least it was looking that way, right? So sure enough, you know, they get out there and they're doing, look, I didn't play, uh, you know, American football as a uh, teenager. I went to some games and I actually still go to games right now as from in college. It's actually quite a lot of fun, even though I don't know what's going on. I know I want the bigger score and I want the enemy team to have the lower score, something like that. It's not golf. It's not the other way around. So they go through tryouts, whatever that entails. And it is super, super obvious that the spoiled kid has one, no idea what he's doing, two, no idea how to throw a football, and three, is just not even, probably not even going to make the team. Won't even make the bench, which was a little bit, it was actually kind of competitive to make the bench. They had a pretty good team. But he wasn't even going to be close to making the bench, which if you're not even close to making the bench, you are not even close, you're not even the same planet, right? You're not even on the same planet to make the, to make star quarterback, bro. That's crazy. So by the end of the day, right, the coaches said, what the coaches said was they were going to tell people on the, sec on the end of the second day who was making cuts, right? But the coaches just saw such a blatant discrepancy between the ability of the spoiled kid and what he was wanting that they thought it was, you know, kind of important for them to at least let the kid know that uh, things probably were not go about to go his way, correct? Things were probably not about to go his way. So uh, Sam overhears the coaches going up to the kid and being like, hey, what was your name again? And he's like, spoiled kid. They're like, oh, spoiled kid. Yeah, not obviously his name, but you know what I mean. And they're like, so, you know, we're watching you out there with your performance. We just want to let you know that, you know, we're happy for you to keep trying out and maybe get on the team. They knew who's not going to get on the team. But they're like, we just think it's really unlikely at this point that you're going to make star quarterback. It's a very difficult position. Um, we're not saying that you will never make it as maybe if you make the team, you'll be able to make your way up there, but we think you need a bit more practice. The spoiled kid's like, I don't understand. I said I wanted the star quarterback position. Like, I, I asked nicely. <laughs> and the coaches, one coach laughs a little bit and then stops laughing when he realizes that this kid isn't joking. The other coach kind of knows right away that this kid has, he's one of the spoiled kids who's just received everything that he's ever wanted. He's never been told no. And so the coaches have to inform him that Simply, that's just not how it works around here. That it's not a, you ask to fill a position and you will fill a position and it is really a skill-based position and you will show up and demonstrate your skills to see if the skills, you know, match. And uh, yeah, so by the end of it, you know, the spoiled kid was starting to get really mad. He's like, you know, I don't understand. I asked you guys real nice. I asked you guys real nice if I could be star quarterback and you're saying no. How on earth am I supposed to get all the ladies now? And they're like, uh, son, like, if your only intention to be star quarterback 
was to get all the ladies, then maybe being star quarterback in the first place wasn't a good idea. And also, son, if your intention is to get all the ladies, probably not the most efficient way is to dedicate your entire life to American football right now to try and get the 5% chance if you spend all the time from here on out to get star quarterback. Like, there are better ways to go about that at this point in your life. And the spoiled kid was super angry, cursed them out, and stormed off. And the thing is, Sam overheard him, and he was mumbling, they're all against me. They all hate me. Oh, I can't, I, I, every, 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 sorry, my brain broke. Every other time that I've asked for something, I've gotten it. And now I, I ask and they're not giving it to me. They're taking this away from me. They are, and then he kind of like goes off mumbling into the distance, right? So this was Sam's first interaction with the spoiled kid, but it simply does not end here because the spoiled kid at this point knows that he's not going to make star quarterback, but that doesn't stop him from wanting to ask out the prettiest girl at the school. We're going to call this girl Caroline, right? So Caroline was kind of not, not n- n- notorious means famous with like a bad nut. She was, but she also wasn't famous. I don't know how to say it. She was this well known at the high school as being like the beauty queen, I guess. I don't really know. I don't know if you guys like back in the day had that like one girl in your class. You're like, dang, like she's definitely like on top of the food pyramid here. I don't know how else to say it. Sometimes it's not very clear, but sometimes it really is. Like, there's that one, that one girl. And, right, the other thing is uh, Caroline, that kind of definitely went to her head. She definitely was aware of it um, as, you know, just the way that every guy treated you and, you know, the girls either completely did anything you said or they hated you. At that point, you kind of became self-aware. She became self-aware and used it. Like, she wasn't known as a great person. She was just known as winning the genetic lottery, right? So right off the bat, Caroline was very, very picky, and she was definitely the type that would have only gone for the star quarterback. And if anything, she was just probably already talking to the star quarterback by the time the spoiled kid wanted to get, you know, throw his hat in the ring, right? And uh, yeah, so Sam was like always kind of thought that Caroline was kind of pretty or whatever, but he knew better than to try at this stage in life. He's just like, no. You know, look, the things that she values do not align with me. I also, I'm just not this, I'm, I'm just, she's just not going to say yes to me because I'm not, I don't have enough clout or whatever stupid stuff, right? High school rules are stupid, but you know, there's nothing I can do about it. So I'm just going to let it be. However, the spoiled kid did not realize this, or maybe he did, but he just thought because he's always received everything he's ever wanted. So might as well, you know, ask for this and receive as well. I mean, who knows? Why wouldn't that work? So yeah, the spoiled kid decides that the best way, you know, actually, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a question and answer. You have, so the question is, how is the spoiled kid going to try and uh, basically woo this girl into liking him? A, he is going to make the effort to start to speak to him, and comment down below before you hear it out which one you think it is. A, he's going to make the effort to go and talk to her. He's going to really put in the time to speak to her. He's going to learn about what she likes and craft conversations based off of that. He's going to show his best face forward. He's going to be polite, yet he's going to be consistent and persistent with what he does, with his trying to like talk to her, all that kind of stuff. He is going to be, and then he's eventually going to ask, you know, ask her out on something a little bit more formal, a little bit more formally romantic. I don't know. Go to the movies, get ice cream, something very nice. Or B... He's going to not talk to her at all, but then make a massive scene in front of all of her friends with a big, like, basically, he's going to do something crazy and insane. If you answered A, God bless your soul, but no, (laughs) it is B. Yeah, so sure enough, one day in lunch, the infamous day that will go down in history, Sam is sitting there with his two friends. They're eating whatever. They're probably complaining about the cafeteria food, being like, dude, this sucks, bro. But uh, that's when they see, you know, or not that's when, but he sees that Caroline is sitting with some of her friends. The other two, like the second and third most popular girl, they're all sitting together. And it's, it's very interesting dynamics, but high school dynamics are just weird in the first place. But they're all sitting there. And if you made it this far into the video, comment spoiled down below, secret word of the day. By the way, we're on, Sp- I'm on Spotify. I don't know why I say we. These videos are on Spotify. Link is in the pinned comment. And if you're on Spotify, make sure you rate the podcast five stars. I think it gets help promote it in the algorithm. I don't know how Spotify works, my friend. I do not know. But anyways, Caroline is sitting with her friends. And that's when the spoiled kid 
walks in and he has an electric guitar. You already know that this is about to go south. You already know for a fact that this is not about to go well. The spoiled kid walks in with an electric guitar and a bass boost. So basically when he plays the electric guitar, it's very loud. And <laughs> he walks in and everyone kind of turns their head because it's not every single day that someone walks into the cafeteria with an electric guitar and a bass boost. It's just not every single day that that happens or an amp or whatever, right? So he walks up and like Caroline and her table looks over at him, kind of like laughs or whatever, talks to each other. But then Caroline and her table's expression starts to change from poking fun to genuine confusion to moderate terror as he approaches the table because it becomes more and more clear that he's beelining it right towards their table. So at this point, Sam is starting to realize this as well. And he's like, oh, good heavens. Like, oh God, bro. Oh no. Yeah, so sure enough, he stops right outside the table. And he's like, Caroline, I would like a moment of your time. And he's like, at this point, everyone stopped talking. Everyone has turned their heads and everyone is staring profusely at this. They're staring at this kid intensely. And <laughs> he's just, he's like, Caroline, will you be mine? It is the worst thing you've ever seen. And I, I don't know what the rest of the lyrics are. I could totally make them up for you guys. But all I know is it's a lot of poor drum playing. Because here's the thing. Since he's a spoiled kid, he is not actually, he doesn't know how to play guitar. No, that would take time. That would take effort, which is one thing he doesn't know. And it would be so, so much easier for him to just go in to the guitar shop, buy the most expensive electric guitar, and think, oh, well, I spent a lot of money on it, then it should just play itself. So he's going like, boom, boom. Yeah, so that's about what it sounds like. Um, think of that, but like that's the nice version of what it actually sounds like. And also, he's just saying random stuff like, you're so pretty, you're so fine, will you be mine? Like, it is, I'm trying to like replicate how bad it is, but as uncomfortable as the thing I just did was 10x that, 10x that. At the end of it, he basically says like, will you be mine and go out to, with me on Friday night, and then just stops. Dead freaking silence for a whole 10 seconds, which sounds like not a lot of time, but you have to realize it is a cafeteria full of like 50 to 100 people that are all staring and watching at this. 10 seconds of pure dead silence is extremely difficult to come across. Like it is extremely unlikely to come across. And yeah, let's just say that, that silence didn't last forever though as literally everyone like bursts out laughing because bro, I'm not gonna lie. I might laugh as well if I hear that. Dude, all I'm saying is maybe this is not the best way to go about it. Look, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the best way is to not talk to this girl ever, go up to her, completely embarrass her in front of everyone, show off that you don't know how to play guitar, show off that you don't know how to sing, show off that you don't know how to song write, and show off that you have no social awareness at all. Maybe that is the best way. Maybe I'm an idiot. Maybe I'm stupid. Who knows, dude? So uh, yeah, Caroline and her friends, instead of responding and saying no, they literally stand up and they walk out of the lunchroom like in single file line. Dude, when they say, oh, the worst thing she can say is no. Oh no, dude, you are so wrong. So yeah, the spoiled kid is literally just like standing there in the middle of everyone, right? With his guitar, his bass, whatever bad, bad situation. And he's like, he's getting really mad. He's like, the only reason she didn't say yes is you guys convinced her otherwise. She was totally gonna say yes to me if you guys weren't here making her feel like she shouldn't. And everyone's like, dude, what? And he just like runs out of there. He's like, it's all your guy's fault. It's your fault. Basically pulling a Nico Cavo avocado being like, it's your fault, whatever, right? Uh, and yeah, so uh, sure, <laughs> sure enough, right? Um, this is not the end of it because the spoiled kid is so angry about this that he decides to go on a week-long vacation. Yeah, I told you guys, he was a spoiled kid. And this means that, you know, he has access to go on a week-long vacation to a tropical place if he wanted to. Even though he was just a sophomore in high school, he went home, he's like, Mom, if 
buy me a ticket to the Bahamas right now. I'm going to go. So yeah, sure enough, he doesn't attend school for an entire week because he gets on a private plane and he goes off to a tropical resort in the Bahamas and he just kind of like messes around for a little bit. Uh, and he was like, oh, mom, I'm so stressed out from school. I need to do it right now. And if you don't, I'm going to be so sad. It's going to be all your fault. Meh. So yeah, he's able to go on a private trip to the Bahamas, which is <laughs> pretty cool for him, I guess. And uh, the thing is, though, this was very bad timing because Sam and him had a class together. And in this class together, they had a pretty major test coming up. And they were going to spend the entire week going over important materials for the test. Sure, the spoiled kid, in theory, could have studied over his trip. I'm not going to say that wasn't possible. But we both know the spoiled kid. And we know for a fact that he is not going to spend his, uh, his impromptu Bahamas vacation studying for an Algebra 2 exam. We both know that's not going to happen. So the spoiled kid legitimately misses an entire week of class. And the test was on Monday. So sure enough, the entire week goes by and Monday comes around and it's finally time for the test. They all walk in and the spoiled kid is like walks in and looks confused because everyone's kind of like sitting in their desks. They are getting pencils out. They're putting their backpacks away. Instead of the more chill environment where people are kind of talking, they're very casually walking in. They have their computers out. No, these people are dialed in. So the spoiled kid looks around and I think he whispers to someone like, what's going on? They're like, dude, we have a test. He's like, what? So yeah, he sits down. The teacher starts handing out the test and the teacher's like, spoiled kid, I haven't seen you for the last week. He's like, yeah, I was doing something. <laughs> the teacher's like, okay, as long as you cleared that with the front office, which I think his parents did, said, oh, he has a medical emergency. He can't be here or something, which is a lie. He just went on a vacation. But he didn't get in trouble for not being in class. But at the end of the day, if you're not in class, you're not in class. <laughs> Ooh, genius statement, Connor. But uh, that, that means he just didn't get the information, right? So he sits down and uh, bro completely bombs the exam. It's not like he was really trying that hard beforehand, but missing out of an entire week of really dedicated review uh, kind of messed him up a little bit. And he got completely destroyed on this exam. But the spoiled kid wrote on top, like, I wasn't here for a week, so I should get plus 40% for all the stuff I missed. Because the thing is, like, Sam, when he went to hand in his test, he handed his test in right after the spoiled kid did. So he saw what the spoiled kid wrote on his exam, which he was like, dude, just because you miss time doesn't mean you should get bonus points on it. Like, why should you get compensated for not being here and going on a fancy vacation instead of, you know, suffering through class like all the rest of us have? No, like, that's obviously ridiculous. And Sam knew for a fact that he was not going to get a 40-point boost for not being here. Like, if anything, it, he's lucky he doesn't get any points deducted from his participation for not being there for a week, dude. But anyways, right, eventually on Wednesday, the, the teacher grades him pretty quickly or efficiently, and the tests are being handed back. When the spoiled kid gets his test back, he immediately screams, this is an outrage. This is ridiculous. Which the entire class immediately turns to look at him because bro literally just screamed, this is an outrage. This is ridiculous. I mean, I think I'm going to be paying attention to what he's saying as well, dude. So sure enough, you know, the teacher's like, uh, yes, spoiled kid. Like, what's up? He's like, this is a ridiculous grade. I deserve at least a 90 for effort. And she's like, I'm sorry. Like, I was a little surprised by your grade too, but... I was pretty generous with my points on, the, on, on your test as well. I don't know what else to say, man. He's like, you know what? I'm sick and tired of this school. All you guys hate me because I'm rich. <laughs> and everyone in the class is like, what? <laughs> Dude, what are you saying right now? He's like, everyone's been against me from day one because I come from a wealthy background. <laughs> it's your fault. Playing a, doing a complete Nico Cotto right now. And he goes on to say, the reason I didn't get star quarterback is because the coach hated me because I was from a better background than him. And the reason why the girl didn't say yes to me, the reason why, what's her name? Caroline didn't say yes to me is because she knew she couldn't keep up with me and my whip. Uh -huh. And the reason why I got failed on this test is not because I didn't do well, which I'm, he didn't do well. It's not because I didn't do well. It's because the teacher was big mad that I went on a fancy trip. You guys are all haters. Goodbye. He gets up and he just like runs out of the class. And uh, yeah, you guys might be thinking, okay, well, that's a pretty big overreaction, but that must be the end of his overreaction. Oh, no, 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 no. 
This is where things get crazy. And I did not clickbait you with the title. This is where the title comes into play, man. So the spoiled kid was super big mad. And he thought to himself, I need to teach everybody a lesson for discriminating against me because I'm rich. Which, no, he didn't get the position as star quarterback because he didn't play football, dude. He just never played football. So obviously he wasn't going to get it. He got rejected by that girl. Well, one, she probably wouldn't have said yes to him in general. But also the way that he asked her out was super embarrassing for her. She doesn't even know who he is, and this is the only impression she has? I doubt any girl would say yes under that impression, bro. And finally, he failed his final exam because he was so mad about the last two things that instead of attending class and or studying, he went on a big long vacation because he could. Because, you know, he, he could. He's gonna do whatever he can or he wants because he, in general, he can get whatever he wants. But the spoiled kid had twisted this reality into everybody's against him and he needs to teach them a little bit of a lesson. Which I think the spoiled kid just doesn't understand the difference between teaching someone a lesson and burning down the school. But uh, yeah. So anyways, the spoiled kid somehow gets access to um, gasoline. <laughs> what the frick, bro? He gets access to gasoline and, light and ma matches in the lighter. And um, yeah, this is where things get, okay, uh, okay, I'm gonna put this disclaimer in because I think I have to, but also I hope you guys aren't literal zero IQ individuals. Don't do this, okay? God, I, I mean, if you guys watch this video and think, oh, I should just go burn down my school, then you actually have a zero negative IQ individual. Like, I, I, don't, know how to, I don't know how else to say it. But I think I'm just gonna say it just because, right? So anyways, the spoiled kid, um, so, Sam's in class one day, and the fire alarm goes off, and he's like, oh, okay, whatever, this is, like, cool. I get to get out of class for another stupid fire drill. So they all get in line, and Sam realizes that this is not a fire drill because the, 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 it's like the air around him is less clear. It is dense. It's not smoky yet, but it's, like, dense, and it's a little hazy, and he smells a little barbecue in the air. And that's when he realizes, oh, word, this is actually an actual fire, bro. Like, this isn't some drill that's annoying that genuinely is just made to make us, like, <laughs> waste time, basically. Oh, this is legit. So everyone is, like, walking a single file line. Some kids are freaking out because they're starting to realize it's legit. But thankfully, everyone gets out of the building safely. And when they get out of the building, they start to see, like, smoke come out of the windows and stuff. They see the fire truck come. They see all the firemen go in. And uh, yeah, they're, you know, a big message, big mass email, text message, phone, whatever, uh, was sent out to all the parents saying, look, there's emergency at the school. Your children are safe and outside, but we do need you to come and get them as soon as you possibly can. We understand some of you guys have like arrangements already. We'll have staff here until seven or whatever, right? Or still whenever, um, but please come pick them up as soon as you can. So Sam got picked, home, picked up and his mom's like, oh my God, like the school, because they're looking at it now and there's just billows and billows of smoke coming out of everything. It's, it's, it's legit, right? So they're just like, oh my God, whatever happened? And at this point, Sam had no idea. Two weeks go by and uh, basically they are on uh, the equivalent of Zoom at this point because the school is in really bad shape and they're trying to find a new place for them to go. But it's getting close to the end of the year, or it's not getting close to the end of the year. It's getting closer to the end of the semester. Um, so there's a little bit more spacing between the first three mini stories I told you than it might have seemed. Because now they're getting close to the end of the semester. And they were going to go home anyways pretty soon. But they're basically on Zoom at this point. And uh, so that's when one of his friends comes over to Sam's house. And he's like, bro, I got the whole inside scoop. And Sam's like, okay, like lay it on me. And basically he goes on and says, so the spoiled kid was caught like by one of the teachers with a can of gasoline and a, like a lit match or whatever, or a lighter or something like that. And that's when the teacher's like, what are you doing over here? And that's when the teacher like picked up the gasoline can and realized that it was 95% empty. Like there's just a little bit left. So she's like, was this full when you got here? And the spoiled kid's like, yes, it was. I'm here to teach you guys a lesson. <laughs> yeah, so eventually she immediately called like, oh, we have to get the kids out of here. Um, and then immediately, like fire alarm went off like 30 seconds later, things were, it was, it was crazy. So yeah, um, the kid was, uh, the school got, like school investigation, police investigation, 
the spoiled kid no longer goes to that school. He's underage. He's not 18, I should say. So it's kind of a weird litigation of what actually happens with him. The spoiled kid's parents are furious. Like they move neighborhoods or they just moved entirely, right? Spoiled kid, you know, his parents like lived around the world anyways. So they barely, <laughs> barely gave him any attention, which is probably why he turned out the way he did. But they're currently trying to find a new place to live and trying to have that stuff not follow them. They basically spent like a million dollars on lawyers just to chuck lawyers at this problem. Because if they, if they throw enough lawyers and enough litigation at this, maybe they'd be able to slow it down so that they'd eventually just like give up on trying to persecute their kid. So yeah, um, the spoiled kid no longer attends the school. He goes to school somewhere else, exactly where nobody really knows. But um, that was quite an overreaction to getting rejected, bro. Click on the video on screen right now. I know you'll enjoy it. Just click it. Do it. So spoiled kids think that they're entitled to everything. This can sometimes backfire massively, as you'll see in this story. Today is a story of a rich jerk getting the karma that they deserve. It's super satisfying, and let's just jump right in. So we're going to call the subscriber who submitted the story, Ava. So anyways, Ava was a senior in high school, and uh, most of the time, by the time senior year rolls around, you're not getting a lot of new people into the school. However, there was a girl who recently moved into the area code, so she started high school senior year with this new high school, right? So immediately off the bat, it's, it's a tough start. It's tough if you move in, like, to a high school, especially at the end. I mean, even if you come in freshman year, if this is a high school of people who've lived together for like the last, I don't know, 14, 15 years, that's already hard enough. But to go in at senior year when basically oh, most of the friendships have already been made, hard enough. We're going to call this girl who's coming in Sarah. So Sarah comes from a very, very, very rich background. And I just want to say, preface this, just if you have access to money does not mean you're a bad person. Of course not. I hope that's common sense. However, there are a lot of cases of, you know, especially children or teenagers, when they're way too overexposed to money, it corrupts them, it makes them bad people, and that is really the job of the parents to step in and make sure that, you know, you're raising your kid correctly, even if they have a lot more resources. So even though I might be bashing on Sarah a little bit in this story, it really is bashing on the parents here. So anyways, you know, in Ava's class, there's a new girl called Sarah, and she gets in there, and from right away, the first, like, pulling up to the school, because parents would either, kids would drive in or maybe parents would drop off, some of them, right? There's this car, right? And they lived in a pretty middle-class-ish neighborhood. So when an actual Roy, Roy, Rolls Royce, yes, I'm, that's not going to roll off my tongue well. When a Rolls Royce drives into the parking lot, and for you guys who don't know, that is a very, very expensive car very expensive car. Even the cheap models are very expensive. So when a Rolls Royce rolls into the parking lot, everybody knows, everybody's heads turn. Even the kids who don't know exactly how expensive of a car that is can just tell by the way that the car is rolling in and by the way that the parents' heads snap, right? That this is, a, this is something. So a girl gets out of the car and the girl happens to be Sarah. And Sarah is all dressed up in like expensive looking clothes, right? She comes out, she is like very confident, whatever, walks onto the scene, which I mean, if you are entering high school super late, you, you kind of have to be a little confident to break into these friend groups. They're probably not going to be looking for a new person. So you need to tell them that they are looking for a new person and that person is you. So anyways, like, you know, Sarah rolls up and immediately, you know, people are, are start talking to her because she's like, oh my God, it's like the new very pretty, rich, confident, whatever woman walks in. And so, yeah, she, she's going to draw a lot of attention. So she immediately gravitates to the group that Ava's already a friend of. So Ava's very, like, normal high school girl, nice, friendly, and the high school isn't too big, so a lot of the girls are friends with each other. There's, like, two to three major groups or cliques of people that hang out, but it's not very rigid or anything. So there's a pretty big group of girls that Ava hangs out with, and Sarah, who will be very soon, you'll see, is not a great person, clings on or starts to enter Ava's friend group. So they sit down, and immediately Sarah comes off very nice, but 
Ava can almost kind of tell in the back of her head that this is a bit of an act. I don't know if you guys have ever noticed this, but sometimes like you can just tell if someone is not genuinely nice and they're only acting that way because no one wants like eat like you the thing is you can if you act nice right away and you get situated in a friend group i've seen a lot of people who just turn almost right away and they become really mean but since they've already situated themselves into a friend group it's like it doesn't even matter it's like it's totally fine so yeah almost right away sarah like uh, elevates to the top of the social hierarchy I think high school social hierarchies are pretty dumb as they really don't translate to anything in the real world 90% of the time. But yeah, she immediately becomes top dog, which is impressive in the fact that she just joined the high school senior year. But at the same time, like high school dynamics are probably gonna push someone like that to the top anyways. By the way, like and subscribe or you yourself are a spoiled kid now. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, anyways though, so yeah, this girl, Sarah, is not a very nice girl. And after about a couple weeks, she really starts to show her true colors. So Sarah starts making really rude, rude remarks at the table of other girls. And here's the thing. A lot of high school girls are very petty. High school guys are jerks, but they're not petty. High school girls can tend to be very petty, right? This is just kind of a fact of the matter. Not all of them, obviously, guys. Don't extrapolate from what I'm saying and draw conclusions that aren't there. But yeah, girls can be petty sometimes. However, Sarah was at a whole new level. And the other thing is Sarah's pettiness would sometimes be targeted at like the quality of clothes someone would wear. If someone was wearing the same thing twice. If they looked poor, basically, right? So Sarah was really going after like the, a lot of the I'm rich, you're poor dynamic. And it, she was going after it super, super hard, right? And this girl was also just not nice at all. Like, that girl's ugly. You know, she sucks. She looks so dumpy in that outfit. Stuff that, like, you know, girls sometimes say in high school. But basically, Sarah was like a caricature of the girl from Mean Girls, right? Basically a caricature of that, right? It's, it's crazy how that movie actually accurately represents some people. And Sarah definitely falls under that category. So, yeah. As, you know, Ava's like a little bit not super happy about the whole situation and how it's turning out because Ava was pretty happy in high school. The freshman year is a little bit difficult for her because, I don't know, like it, freshman year is difficult for almost everyone, man. I know freshman year was not great for me, but after a lot of failure and a lot of being alone, I eventually found some really great people and had a great time. Similar for Ava. She eventually found a group of people that she thought we you know were really quality and whatever and sophomore and junior year were really great and she was excited to finish out the year strong with people that she genuinely enjoyed hanging out with. So, you know, Sarah, uh, not Sarah, Ava was very like excited to go into senior year even though there's a lot of stress with SATs, college essays, stuff like that, right? And APs, whatever type of stuff, right? It's, it's college season, so it's gonna be stressful, but she was really looking forward to senior spring where, you know, she could enjoy the last bit of time with her friends. But now what ended up happening was this new girl who, you know, at first she was very, like, receptive because she was like, Ava put herself in the new girl's shoes and was like, I know for a fact if I was new at some school, I would really want people to be open to me. I would really want people to, I don't know, I, I, I just would, I, I would feel so bad. Like, I would want, like, let me just be nice and let her in, right? But uh, yeah, Sarah, uh, Ava wasn't a big fan of every single day at lunch instead of talking about things that they used to talk about, such as school, boys, I don't know what girls talk about, but nice things, right? And instead, they were talking about how trashy someone looks or how, you know, what a terrible hairstyle. Like she really is going down the drain. Just really just petty comments. And Ava noticed that, you know, the friends of hers, quote unquote, that she believed were kind of of higher caliber were kind of going in as well. They were definitely being influenced by Sarah in a really negative way. And Ava wasn't a big fan of it. So uh, one of these days, right, you know, Ava kind of pulls aside one of her friends and is like, maybe we should talk about Sarah for a second. And in this situation, Ava believed that, you know, this girl who she's known for years and who's only known Sarah for a couple weeks would definitely not betray her. So she pulls aside this girl and she's like, have you kind of noticed that, uh, you know, the ever since Sarah joined our group that, I don't know, the way the conversations have been going 
have just not been that good. Like it seems like our conversations are always about targeting other people and a lot of times targeting other people on stuff that they really can't control, you know, how they look to an extent, their parents' money, you know, it's a lot of stuff that they can't control. And Ava's friend responded in a way that she did not expect. Ava's friend kind of went to Sarah's defense and was like, you know, I don't really see that. Like, are you coming after like Sarah just because she's new? Like, it's so difficult to like join like a high school so late, which is a true fact, but is not really relevant in this conversation, bro. Like, I don't know how else to put it. This is not that relevant in this conversation. And Ava kind of like immediately sensed the hostility and was like, okay, I got to back up a little bit. And she's like, oh no, I mean, I like Sarah a lot. Lie. I like Sarah a lot, but I don't know. I just, I, I feel like the conversations have been a little bit of a downer recently. So the next day at lunch, um, Ava sits down and she immediately feels something is wrong. And she almost immediately knows that the girl that she had been friends with for the longest time most likely pulled Sarah aside and told on her. Because there's this kind of this like awkward tension of like all the girls and Sarah and then there was Ava. There was almost like, I don't know if you guys have ever felt this. I've witnessed it. I don't know if I've never necessarily firsthand felt it. But when everyone knows something about you, but they don't like, it's, it's like it's as if there's like a, a divider between the two of them. And it was just awkward when it normally wasn't awkward. And Ava knew that she was the reason why it was awkward. So yeah, they had a pretty bad lunch or whatever. It wasn't great. Like Sarah would kind of like whisper, like they would all whisper to each other. It was very weird. Ava was like, oh boy, like this is, this is just not good. And uh, yeah, so later that day, Ava was walking to her locker or she was going to do something. And her friends, or who she thought were her friends, right, were with Sarah. And they were all talking like together in kind of a circle. And they didn't know that Ava was there because Ava was like around the corner or something. And Ava would have normally like just walked up to them or whatever, but she just for some reason decided to stop right before she turned the corner. And she just listened in for a second. And Sarah was like, Ava's looking so terrible today. Like, she's really gone off hill. Like, what does she think about that outfit? Like, I could have found that, like, in a dumpster. Just saying, like, what she was saying about every other girl. Which I will say, I have heard that in high school, this is not, this is not a generalization. This is just from the girls I'm friends with. A lot of them do happen to say not so nice things about their friends. But Sarah was going in deep. She was going in hard and it was super, and then like one of the other girls, the girls that Ava pulled aside was like, yeah, Sarah, I can't believe like Ava was going after you when she looks like that, ha, 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 whatever. And Ava was like, wow. She kind of backed away. Ava didn't want to hear any more of it because she, she knew the rest. She knew the extent. She's just like walking away and she's thinking to herself, wow. Like those are people that I considered as my friends. Like I genuinely believe that those people were like my friends. Like I thought that those people were good quality. I thought that like I was gonna have a great time with them. And Ava definitely thought a little bit, okay, they're being brainwashed by Sarah to an extent, but only to an extent, dude. But at the end of the day, it's their choice. Like this is their choice to make. Sure, they wanna be like with the new cool, cool girl. They wanna do what she says. And it's very tempting, but you still have a choice in the matter. You always have a choice. And uh, Ava's like, wow, I got to find new friends, right? And so sure enough, over the course of the next couple months, uh, Ava just, like, would start to like intentionally talk more to people in her classes because she was always very nice and very friendly, but she would never go out of her way because why would she? She already has a good group of friends, or so she thought, that she was secure with. So now she would like ask people to hang out after school, whatever. And after months and months, she eventually found a group of people that seemed a lot more down to earth, a lot cooler, and also really hated Sarah and her group, right? Just, I mean, they weren't, they weren't like, I don't know, talking smack about her all day because then they wouldn't be any better than Sarah, but they would, whenever Sarah and Ava's ex-friend group would come up, they'd be like, yeah, those girls are so petty. Like, they're so mean. Like, that's ridiculous. So yeah, Ava found a pretty good, gr a pretty good group. And uh, the thing is though, the story doesn't end here. The story goes on for the entire year, but you might be thinking that, uh, Connor, I was promised a, karma, a funny karma, epic, rich, spoiled kid gets destroyed moment, and I guarantee you that that will be coming. 
All you got to do, real quick though, comment, what should I make you guys comment? Comment tree down below, because I'm looking at my Christmas tree right now. So comment tree if you made it this far into the video. By the way, these stories are on Spotify. It's in the pinned comment. And if you're listening on Spotify, please rate five stars. I'd love you for it. Kiss. Anyways, so yeah, college application season. I mentioned very briefly that they're in the midst of college application season. And going to college is a choice. I think if you know what you want to do, it is a much better choice than going in not knowing what you want to do. But I think that's also totally fine as well. Uh, as long as you understand the, the debt you're taking on and the risk to reward, as long as you understand it, I think that's totally fine. I also think that choosing not to do college shouldn't be as stigmatized as it is, as the ROI for college is not as clearly good as it used to be for everyone. However, especially in kind of like, well, especially, especially, especially in wealthier communities, not just going to college, but which college you go to is almost like another status symbol to put on your chest, right? So the parents of like kids, especially in the wealthier communities, tend to really care, like care a lot, even though their kids probably benefit the least from going to a good name college, right? It's just kind of how this works. So Sarah's parents, who've made a ton of money, right, were in all these communities or whatever through their social clubs or something, and they cared a lot about where Sarah went to school. And they cared so much that they were willing to go above and beyond and maybe some not so, I don't know, against the rule type ways, if you know what I mean. So yeah, anyways, SATs were coming up. And I think the last time you can take the SATs or something is like October, or there was some major test, something that was SATs, AP, uh, whatever, honors types, whatever, right? So this happened before you submit your college applications. And uh, basically, Sarah was an okay student. She was smart enough. But these people wanted to get her into, you know, the top eh, United States institutions of whatever, right? You want to be in the top 10. If you're not in the top 10 rankings, then you're trash. What? Something stupid, right? So they wanted to get into a really, really good school. And they met with, like, like Sarah's parents met with, like, college counselor prep type people. And they looked at Sarah's results and they were like, yeah, dude, um, I don't know how to break it to you. But your daughter is not getting to Harvard, Stanford, Yale combination type thing with these grades. She'll do fine, but she won't get into that place. But, you know, the parents were not willing to hear that as an answer. So instead of, like, I don't know, asking Sarah, like, hey, I, we, we need you to do something really cool as an extracurricular, or we need, like, a really banger essay, essentially what they do is they try and cheat her on one of the tests, right? They try and assist her to cheat on one of the tests. And Sarah was totally in the know on this because way after the fact, one of the friends that Ava was... Fr so the reason why we know all these personal details is because one of the friends of Sarah, who used to be a friend of Ava, eventually kind of like realized that she was being stupid and went back to Ava and was like, I'm so sorry. And Ava was like fine with it or whatever. And they became friends and they talked over the summer. So the reason why we know these extra details about what went on here is because Sarah's ex-friend and Ava's ex-friend, now re-friend, told her over the summer, after the school year, everything that went down. So basically, Sarah realized that, okay, my scores and stuff are not that good enough, so they kind of like Sarah went to her parents, and they figured out a way that she would be able to basically have some other girl who would be given Sarah's ID, who looked kind of like her, but no one really cares that much, no one really checks, and was like, a really good college student who was on top of it and worked for an agency that's like, yeah, you pay me $50,000, I'll do whatever you want. Like, I'll bend my morals. And so sure enough, right, the day of the SATs, uh, Ava's ex, -fr or the friend that was used to be, let's call this girl uh, Beth, because wh whatever, right? So Beth is a girl who told Ava about this. So Beth and all of her friends and Sarah, studying for the SATs or whatever test they were taking, right? Super hard. They were studying really hard, and they noticed that Sarah really wasn't studying, right? When they'd have group study sessions or whatever, Sarah would kind of be on her phone the entire time, and they knew that Sarah's parents really wanted her to go to X or Y college that was very difficult to get into. So they kind of would ask her, like, Sarah, what's the word here, bro? Like, what are you doing? And Sarah's like, oh, no, I'm studying a lot at home. I'm just, you know, texting whatever, some guy or something. 
And eventually, a couple days before, Sarah confided in them that, you know, the reason why she wasn't studying is because she's not even going to be taking the exam. Because I think they asked, like, oh, do you guys want to meet up, like, an hour before the exam to get, like, breakfast or whatever and quick review or something? And they're all like, what? And, yeah, Sarah's like, yeah, basically my parents found someone to take the exam for me. She's really good. She'll score a great score. Whatever. And since these girls were, like, friends with Sarah but also kind of, like, sucked up to her, bro, so they couldn't really say anything. That's the funny thing. They kind of trapped themselves into a place where they couldn't say anything because they didn't want to upset Sarah or whatever, right? So they're all like, oh, okay. But obviously they were all kind of mad because they had been spending all this time studying and Sarah would just have someone go in and take the exam. However, not all things, like, something like that doesn't always work out seamlessly, right? I mean, we saw with the college cheating scandal or whatever that doesn't matter how much money you have, you still can get caught. This was not related to the college cheating scandal. This was a separate thing. So, yeah, basically, Sarah had someone go in for her. They took the exam. But the person who was administrating the exam, after, like, the exam was handed in, they knew that something was up because the ID really didn't match the person. So after a further investigation, they figured out that Sarah was not the one who took the exam. And this was announced to the school. The score was voided. And Sarah was not allowed to take the SAT whatever tests type thing or something. She just wasn't, she was banned from it. She could not take this exam. So not only did she have like on her record that she tried to cheat on it, she just couldn't take it. And all the schools like that wanted it, like all the school, no, no, all the schools that she want, or her, not she wanted, she probably wanted to go to some chiller school or whatever, which I get. All the schools her parents wanted her to get into so that she could brag about it or no, not that she could brag about it, so that they could brag about it to their friends because they're always competing for the next greatest thing, even though that doesn't really bring them any happiness or fulfillment, right? She could no longer apply to any of them because they needed the test and they would see if they, like, they, they looked into it or she gave a reason, oh, I just can't take the test. Oh, you can't take the test because you cheated? Of course we're not going to accept you. So basically, Sarah got screwed over majorly in this, in this part, right? And because of this, her parents were super freaking mad, which they should have been mad at themselves for even saying that, like, my daughter needs to cheat to get into one of these institutions. Like, if she needs to, is it really that important? But anyways, basically, Sarah was, like, cut out. Like, she was literally pulled out of school at this point because, you know, Sarah's parents had multiple houses or whatever, and they basically were like, oh, like, we got to, you're taking a gap year now. We're redoing everything, like, whatever. They kind of panicked. And they said, there's no reason for you to still be in school right now. So they literally yank her out two weeks after she gets caught cheating. And so it's kind of a weird period where all of uh, Ava's ex-friends, Beth and all those people, no longer have their cult leader, Sarah, to be like, to talk with or to lead them or whatever. And eventually they have a moment of like reflection. And uh, slowly but surely, they all eventually come back to Ava and they're like, look, we messed up, dude. Like, I don't know. Some, the allure of her, I don't know. She was so cool. And we really just let ourselves down. We're sorry. And that was fine. Ava accepted all their pol- apology. They kind of, Ava kind of meshed together her old friend group that low-key betrayed her and the new friend group. Maybe she shouldn't have done that, but she kind of was like, you know what? We're all graduating. We're all not going to see each other consistently again, like this at least. So why, like, keep, let, let's just put this behind us. And Ava actually had a really good end to her high school experience. All the friends got along well. And uh, moral of the story is, one, don't, like, fall for someone because you think that they're cool and you, be, you become a jerk yourself. And two, don't cheat. As, just don't cheat, bro. You're going to get caught. Spoiled rich kids think that they deserve everything. And when they don't get their way, they'll usually throw a fit. And in this case, by throw a fit, I mean commit frickin' arson, bro. Yeah, this story is absolutely crazy, so buckle up and let's just get right into it. So we're gonna call the subscriber who submitted this story, Ryan. So anyways, this was gonna be Ryan's first time ever going to sleepaway camp. And uh, I don't know if you guys have ever been to sleepaway camp before, but it's almost like a little bit of a, not a rite of passage, but it's your first time for a lot of kids being out of the house 
and away from their parents for more than one day. They might have had something like a sleepover before this, but sleepaway camp is kind of like the next level, right? And uh, so anyways, Ryan definitely was going to have a very unique sleepaway experience, as you guys can probably already tell by the title of this video. So anyways, Ryan and his parents are, you know, driving up to the, the camp or whatever. It's like camp something. And, uh, you know, he's driving up and he's kind of like, you know, I'm a little nervous about this. Like, I don't know how I feel about it. And Ryan's mom's like, Ryan, you have nothing to worry about. Your father and I went to this camp when we were kids. That's actually the first time we met. I mean, basically Ryan's parents met the first time at the sleepaway camp and then they didn't see each other for like six more years and then they met again and then they eventually like got in a relationship. But so it was very special to them. And they were really insistent that their son Ryan go to it as well because they were both hesitant, but their parents forced them and they thought it was a great experience and they want their son to have the same thing. So they drive up and they get there and they start walking towards it. And Ryan's parents are reminiscing about the good old days or whatever. And they're like, oh, I remember, oh, the dining hall looks just the same. Like, I remember like we met each other and we sat under that tree like on our first night. Or, I, I don't know, like stuff like that, right? So Ryan's walking in and, you know, he's a little nervous and he's looking at all these like families around with like, you know, you got the parents and their kids and there's a lot of nervous energy and chatter going on as you'd expect in the first day of an event like this. So anyways, they, they walk up to the table where the person that kind of like the administrates or whatever is like, oh, like, hey, buddy, what's your name? And Ryan's parents is like, this is Ryan, last name. And they're like, oh, Ryan, last name. Okay, let me look. Ah, yes, you're in cabin B. So uh, anyways, uh, feel free to walk over there right now. I think some kids are already in the cabin. You'll meet your uh, counselor that you're going to be kind of like paired with the whole time. And yeah, Ryan, it's going to be a great experience. I know you enjoy it. And he's like, all right, like, okay. So anyways, Ryan and his parents, they, you know, they're bringing his like backpack or whatever or a suitcase going over to the cabins. And, you know, Ryan's dad is like, oh, my God, Ryan. Like, I totally forgot. They must have renamed it. Like, they used to have different names for these cabins. But this used to be my cabin. Like, that's so awesome. Whatever, right? So they go up there, they knock on it, the door's opened, and, you know, sure enough, the camp counselor or the counselor that is, like, with them is like, oh, what's up, dude? Like, you must be uh, Ryan, right? And Ryan's like, yeah. He's like, all right, all the other kids are kind of already here. Come inside. So Ryan walks that in with the parents, and he sees all the other kids, like, unpacking their stuff, sitting on the bunk beds or whatever, and the guy's like, all right, Ryan, this is your uh, place right here. So he sits down and right across from him is a kid that we're going to call Ben. Ben is the spoiled kid. Little does Ryan know that this is about to be one of the craziest weeks of, in, of his entire life, right? Little does he know this is about to be one of the most insane weeks of all time, partially thanks to Ben. So anyways, uh, you know, uh, Ryan starts introducing himself to all the other kids and Ryan's parents eventually are like, all right, and we're going to go. So Ryan hugs them goodbye, whatever. And uh, yeah, so uh, on the first, like before, like the, because they got there right around like three or four in the afternoon. So it's getting a little bit late, but they're talking with each other. Ryan's starting to get to know the other kids. He seems to really like them at first. And uh, so anyways, Eventually, it's dinner time. They all go as a cabin to get dinner together, and one of the camp counselors says, hey, guys, or the one that, the counselor that's, like, with cabin B. He's like, hey, guys, so tonight's actually really special. I know that all you guys are new, and I just want to let you know that, like, you know, tonight will be a lot of fun, wink, wink. So everyone was like, you know, they got a little excited. They're like, oh, what's happening tonight? And so let's skip ahead to them. They're all in their cabins, right? And it's getting kind of late. It's like 9 at night, so they're kind of thinking, oh, is nothing really going to be happening tonight or whatever. And uh, they see the camp counselors like constantly checking his phone. I'm assuming that he's talking to the other camp counselors or other staff members because it was like a no phones policy except for staff members. And they were really, they were set, like it was like kind of a rule that the staff members could really only be using their phone to, to communicate with other staff members. They couldn't just be going on like TikTok or Instagram or something like that. So anyways, you know, he sees that, like Ryan sees that this guy's checking his phone a lot. And that's when you hear, that's when Ryan hears a horn from very far away. It's like one of those blow horns that like, I don't know, you could make. It's not like an industrial horn, but it's one that you'd like blow into and make a loud, like a really loud noise. And like, he hears a, like a faint horn sound in the distance. And the camp counselor is like, all right, guys, that's a signal. Everyone get up. So everyone gets up and they kind of like, they don't go single file, but they exit the camp cabin in like a group or whatever and it's dark outside and they see other groups of kids walking out as well 
and the horn is blaring. They hear this horn in the very far distance and all the groups of like cabins, so cabin A through X or I, I don't know how many cabins, right? They're all walking towards the woods. And as they walk closer towards the woods, they see a faint like burning glow, like a faint burning glow inside the woods. And they all get excited and they hear drum beats like bum, 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 bum. And then there's the horn like a and they all start walking in. It's really cool, a really cool atmosphere, right? So they're all walking in and they're just like, they hear the drum beats, whatever. And they see like a big roaring fire and they're all instructed to sit around it, right? And Ryan already knows that this is gonna be something special. So anyways, uh, the, the leader of like the camp counselor leader, uh, we'll, I'm just gonna say the president of the camp. I think there's like an actual real name, but we're gonna say president of the camp. So, you know, she gets up there and after all the groups have kind of settled around, the drums stop and the horn stops. And she's, she's like, all right, attention, everyone. Welcome back to camp. I don't know. We're going to call it uh, uh, Camp Tree. That's a lame name, but okay, whatever. Welcome back to Camp Tree. This is our 223rd or like 115th year, very old camp, whatever. This is our 115th year of operation. And we're commencing the like the hundred like sixteenth semester or whatever, and everyone cheers and Ryan's kind of clapping, looking around like, all right, this is really cool. And the camp the camp president is like, as the recurring like kids know, but uh, that we have a tradition every single year. But I, it's time for me to introduce it to the new kids. I would like to welcome you to not only the hundred sixteenth year of operation, but this is the fiftieth year of the camp tree games and everyone starts cheering and obviously like Ryan doesn't know what's going on but he's like oh the camp tree games that sounds pretty cool and uh, they're like yeah since it's the 50th year like that's really prestigious she's like I'll go over very quickly throughout this week at certain events you will be challenged with uh, different activities and you will be awarded points based on your you know the effectiveness of or how well you complete them by the end of the week Whoever has the most points as an individual will win the Camp Tree Cup. And you will forever be etched. Your name will forever be etched in the, like, the sacred wall or something. And she references, like, there's, like, this wall in where the, uh, the cafeteria is. And when Ryan went in there, he saw this big wall uh, that has all these names etched into it. And she's like, and especially if you win the 50th, that's a little extra prestige as, like, you know, 50th is a very... It's, I don't know, it's more memorable than, like, 42nd or something, right? So she's, like, a lot of pressure for who's going to win this year. And, you know, so Ryan is sitting there, and he's sitting next to Ben, the spoiled kid, right? And the spoiled kid's, like, where Ben's, like, dude, I really want to win that. I really, really want to win that, man. I really want to win that. And Ryan's, like, yeah, it'd be pretty cool. So Ryan didn't have any expectations of winning it. He honestly was just, like, this is a really cool environment. I'm just happy to be here, bro. Uh, but he's like, yeah, obviously if I won, that'd be awesome, but I don't expect it because I don't know, he's new. So eventually, you know, the ceremony ends and they're like, all right, camp like campers, the games start officially today. Like the games are officially started. Your first task will be tomorrow. Go get some rest. So they're all walking back and there's all this kind of like excitement jitters in the air. And I don't know, it's a really cool environment. It's, it's, it's really sick. And, uh, so Ryan and the, you know, Ben, are actually talking about it a lot. And, you know, Ryan's not super like, I gotta win this, but Ben is really, I gotta win this. Like his mentality is like, I win this or bust. Like there is no in between at the moment, bro. Yeah, so sure enough, you know, Ben is just like really going on about how much he needs to win this and like how this is so important. And Ryan doesn't think that much of it. He at least doesn't think that, you know, you, you guys have read the title of the video, Things Got Pretty Crazy, or the spoiled kid has a very bad reaction to potentially not winning, right? But Ryan doesn't realize how serious he is about winning, right? So they get back to the cabin, and the camp counselor comes around. And he's like, boys, I just want to let you know, it would be cool if someone here won the cup, because, you know, us counselors do kind of have a little competition of whose cabin's going to have the cup winner, so no pressure, but it would be pretty cool but also, guys, remember, there's, like, 200 kids at this camp. Just have fun. And if you happen to score number one, that's great. No pressure, wink, wink. But uh, if you do win, that would be really cool because I do may or may not have a bet with the other counselors for $50 for who has a kid who wins the cup. So no pressure, but I'm just saying it would be pretty cool. So with that, they go to bed. Next day, they wake up super excited, super energized. It's just a really cool environment. 
And anyways, so the first, so they don't only do camp games, right? They have, so there's three official events. There's three official games, which kind of puts a lot of pressure on each game. But also in between that, it is a sleepaway camp. So they spend a lot of time just doing non-camp game activities. So I don't know, learning how to, you know, you go into the, for example, Ryan on his first day was put into a random group of people, no one from his cabin, just randomly, right? And they went out into the woods and they were given a bunch of sticks and they said, okay, you're going to learn how to make a lean-to. You're going to learn how to make a shelter if you need to in the woods with literally just sticks. Yeah, this will not be the greatest shelter, but it will keep you sheltered from the rain or any other, you know, uh, I don't know what it's called, any other like weather conditions or something like that. And Ryan was able to meet some new people and he was just genuinely having a really good time. And the only time that at lunch and dinner and breakfast, every single meal, you ate it with your group, like your cabin or whatever. Just because they really wanted, look, they want you to bond with as many people as possible. But the camp did believe that like, you are go, like the best, like it, you, we, we're only here for a week and we want you to really bond with some people. So we're going to have you have the most time as possible with your cabin. So you're going to eat with them. You're going to yeah, sleep in the same place. Like you live with them, whatever, right? So anyways, at lunch, you know, the spoiled kid, Ben, and everyone there really, not just the spoiled kid, right? Ben and everyone else, including Ryan, were just going on about like, they were just asking a million questions to the counselor about the first game. And the counselor's like, guys, I'm sworn to secrecy. Look, I want to help you because I want one of you guys to be the winner. Don't get it, don't get it twisted, right? But uh, I really can't say anything. I might actually get in trouble if I let you know too much. So they're all trying to like ask him like tricky questions. Like they're trying to be like, oh, you don't have to tell us. But if you were going to tell someone, what would the game, what would you tell them if some random person who didn't go here was asking what the first game was? What exactly would you tell them? And camp counselor is like, dude, I'm not the smartest cookie in the cookie place, but bro, like I'm not that dumb, dude. So uh, yeah, they don't really get any good information out of him, but they have a lot of fun trying to. And uh, they're also not allowed to know when the game is. So they can't even prepare for it. Obviously, they know they're told that there are three games. And uh, some of the games are group games. Some of them, or one game is a group game, which is by Cabin. The next game is partner game. And the final game is an individual game. So the idea is kind of like you'll pretty much know off the bat where your rankings are because like if your cabin is really bad it's gonna be really hard to claw back up but whatever right but they're also not allowed to know when these games are so the first day ends like uh there's nothing no game on the first day they're even like up at like 9 10 or whatever in their beds like all like excited or whatever thinking oh my god we might hear the horn uh, like the game might happen at any moment now but no they eventually are like oh, okay it's not. We're going to go to bed. And even the camp counselor, like, knocked on the door. He's like, what are you boys doing up? It's like 11. They're like, what if the game happens? He's like, okay, I'm not supposed to say this, but look, the game's not happening tonight. Go to bed. They're all like, oh, dude, what? So, yeah. Next day comes around, and they're, they have some morning activities. They have breakfast, but they're sitting at lunch. And they're sitting, like, literally, they're halfway through lunch when they hear the horn and they all drop their forks or whatever. They're like, oh my God, it's the horn, it's the horn. So sure enough, the horn is going halfway through lunch. They all get up and the camp count, the counselor for their group is like, or their is it count, camp counselor. Yeah, camp counselor, right, is like, oh, all right, guys, like, this is the first activity. This activity we're doing as a group, so follow me. Everyone's super excited. You can feel it in the air. Things are going crazy. Everyone's really excited, and they start walking out, and uh, the first activity, the first activity is to build a fire in the woods. So they're going in, and each camp counselor for each of the cabins, they have a backpack that's full of, you know, a lighter and some, basically just very few activities, but a lighter and a little bit of, like, thin, thinly sliced wood to give, like, a nice little spark or whatever. But yeah, that's it. So they're all led into the woods and there was like other camp counselors that would be assigned to your group that would score you based on a preset score or whatever. And basically every single kid in the group would get the exact same score, but one of them maybe could get a bonus point, but that one bonus point really wouldn't change that much. So they get out there 
And the spoiled kid is super, super intent on, guys, we must win. We must be the best. And, you know, Ryan is trying to win, but he's also trying to have fun, and he also doesn't really know. I mean, bro, does, bro didn't come out the womb knowing how to make a fire, dude. Like, chill out a little bit. So they're doing their best. They're in the woods, and they can kind of see, like, the other groups, but the other groups are far, far enough away in the woods that it's just kind of hard to see what they're doing. But I guess you could kind of see what they're doing, but not really, right? So they're going in there, they're getting wood, they're putting stuff together. And at one point, Ryan puts down a log on there or a piece of like a stick or whatever, or I guess it's close, it was kind of thick. It was kind of closer to a log on their fire. And it, the fire hadn't been lit yet. So it's just a pile of tinder at this point. And uh, the, the, like, the log was kind of waterlogged. So it probably wasn't a good idea to put it on there. But instead of the spoiled kid, Ben, just being like, oh man, I think that's not a good log. He's like, dude, are you trying to like sabotage us? Are you working for the other team? And like everyone in the cabin just like looks at Ben and they're like, chill the frick out, bro. And Ryan's like, dude, sorry, I didn't see that this like log wasn't that good. I was putting something on. He's like, bro, well, pay closer attention next time because all of our points are on the line. And even the camp counselor is like, Ben, like chill out, man. It's not that serious. He's like, it is it's that serious to me, dude. You don't get it. So anyways, they eventually get something together. They light it on fire and they do get a fire, right? And they score the second highest points. So everyone, except for one person, everyone is super happy with the result. They're all like, dude, we got the second highest. That's awesome. Like we got a fire going. I heard half the teams couldn't even get a fire going. And, but you know, one person wasn't happy, Ben. And at one point, like, kids were starting to realize, or the people in the cabin were starting to realize that Ben was sitting there, all grumpy, all upset, all angry, and they're all like, dude, like, what's, what's the deal? Like, what's the word, man? Like, why are you so upset right now? And Ben's like, dude, I'm not settling for second. We should have gotten first. And the camp counselor was like, oh, Ben, like, we did really well, bro. Like, chill out. Like, the other team got first place or more, slightly more points than us just because they finished a little bit quicker. And Ben looks at Ryan and is like, dude, you putting on that wet log really put us back like 30 seconds. And that 30 seconds was the difference between us winning and like us losing. And Ryan's like, okay, bro, I'm sorry. I don't know. And the camp counselor is like, Ben, like, come on now. Like, it's really not that deep. We all did really well. Can we just celebrate from here on out? And Ben's like, I guess, whatever. If you guys want to celebrate being first loser, then whatever, dude. And, like, Ben literally walks back into his room and, like, shuts the door. Which, his room is, like, everyone's room, so it's a little awkward or whatever. Cam Counselor kind of looks at all the other guys, is like, dude, what's his problem? And they just decide to celebrate, because it's a win. It's a win. So, anyways, the next day comes around, and um, it's just more kind of activities, whatever. And for all of Tuesday, once again... It's just kind of their own activity. Like, it's just no games, no no camp tree games or anything like that. Nothing that makes, like, points or whatever. And oh, also, there's a scoreboard so you can see your name or your points versus everyone else. That was posted on the... There's, like, a really massive whiteboard. Maybe they put, like, six whiteboards together or whatever. But it was in the cafeteria, and it had your name, and it had your points next to it, just so you could kind of see where you rank next to other people. At the current moment, like, everyone's score was in groups because it was, like, your group... Basically, every group got the same score. So everyone in Cabin 2 was tied for second place, right? But in all reality, they just had the same score. And uh, so, sure enough, the next activity was a partner activity, but it wasn't a just any partner activity. It was a randomized partner activity, which is always a little tough because you don't know if you're going to get someone who is just going to mess around the whole time or is going to take it as seriously as you or vice versa. Who knows, right? So, uh, yeah, it's on Wednesday. It is, you know, right. It's at dinner and all of a sudden you hear the horn again. So the camp counselor for cabin B is like, all right, guys, this is your second game. Like this is official. So he says, okay, so you guys have all been assigned with random partners. I have a list right here. I'll tell you like where your partner is. And I'll tell you where you're supposed to go to make this easy. You know, all the, so all the tables had like table A, table B, and that was associated with the cabin you're at. So he basically was like, all right, so Ryan, you're with this guy named Sam and you're at table C, you can go over there. So all the kids started going to the tables they were sent to. And uh, yeah, you were given a randomized partner. Ryan's partner was pretty cool. He was definitely more chill about the competition than Ben was. Um, 
But, you know, whatever, right? So this, so this next competition was that they had to make the best tool possible in the forge, an iron forge. So yeah, I, this is actually is something that I did when I went to uh, sleepaway camp, and it's really cool. It's like you get a piece of like a metal rod, you stick it in something really hot, and then you slam it with a hammer, right? It's really cool, actually. And uh, real quick, if you made it this far into the video, comment tool down below. I'm trying to make my secret words a little bit more tricky now. You can't just comment spoiled in the first 30 seconds. There's this one guy who gets the secret word, no matter what it is, in like literally 30 seconds, and I have no idea how. Uh, also, if you want to listen to this on Spotify, you can. The link is in the pinned comment and description. And if you're listening to this on Spotify, please rate five stars. I think it helps. So anyways, the next competition was to make a tools with the iron forge together. And whoever, the tools were based on, there's a whole point system where it's like, oh, I don't know, the best, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know, man. It's like the most tool looking or the most effective, a huge, lot of points you could get. And also, the points for this event were double the points you could get for the last event. So it didn't like make the last event completely irrelevant, but anyone who got a low score because your team wasn't good kind of had an opportunity to, I don't know, get a better score, right? So anyways, Ryan and this guy, they were definitely chill about it. I honestly think Ryan took the best route about this whole thing because he was really just there just to have fun. He was there just to chill. He was there just to have a good time, man. And Honestly, that's the way it's supposed to be. So him and his partner, um, Sam, will say, they just went in there and like they even said to each other, like, I don't really care what our score is. Let's just make something cool. So they go in there. They're having a lot of fun. They shove the metal in the really hot thing and start slamming it into something cool. And what happens is they, they make it too thin. They like they make the metal too thin at one point and it breaks off. And Sam's like, oh, dude, my fault. And Ryan's like, bro, I don't care. Like, this is cool. Like, we just made a, instead of making, like, a hammer, we just made a poker. Like, that's awesome, bro. So, yeah, the person comes over. They're like, oh, look at this. And, yeah, so Ryan and Sam did not get a great score. But Ryan wasn't trying to win anyways. He already won, bro. He had a good time. At the end of the day, like, he knew he wasn't going to get first place because he knew that there's people like Ben who are going to sweat their little butts off to get first place anyways. So he didn't really care, dude. So he had a good time. Anyways, so they start walking back to the cabins. It's nighttime, and they sit in there. And Ben is in this most stink of a mood ever. And after about, like, 30 minutes of, like, aggressive silence from him, you know how, like, some people, like, I, I don't talk all the time. Like, I, like, I do talk when I'm with my friends. But there are definitely times where I'm just, I don't know, I'm either low energy or I just... Don't have anything to say, but you know, you're just kind of chilling there. And then there's also times when people, you know that they're in a bad mood, you know that they are gonna make a big stink over something and their silence almost is like an aggressive silence. I don't know if you guys can relate to that, comment if you can. Uh, but anyways, so he's just like 30 minutes of aggressive silence, making little grunts, <laughs> whatever, right? Having this big angry face or something. And uh, so eventually he speaks up, he's like, I got robbed. And everyone's like, what? He's like, I got the worst partner ever. He didn't take the game seriously at all. I got, I got, and he started to like tear up a little bit. He's like, I'm not going to win this. And so the camp counselor comes in. He's like, hey, bud, like, look, this happens. Like, it's randomized. You can't choose who you got, like, a partner, right? You can't choose that. However... I'm not totally supposed to tell you guys details about all these things. I'll let you know a little something to make you guys feel better. For any of you guys who didn't do too well today, and just so you know, the next games, I can't tell you when they are, but they are single person. So it's only you. Your score will depend on your abilities alone. And while this game that you're in with a partner was twice as many points as the first game, well, this single game is gonna be five times as many points as the partner game. So 10 times as many points as our group game. So yeah, the, the, it's always been the case that the third activity really kind of depends who wins anyways. And the first two are kind of just to get you to have fun and bond with people. And it really is the last one. But I just thought I'd let you guys know. So almost immediately, Ben is like, oh, so I have a chance now, even though I screwed over by everyone else. And 
obviously kids in the cabin start looking at each other because he said, oh, when I screwed over by everyone else, meaning them when they got second place, like, bro, you could have been put in a different cabin and gotten like last place, dude. Like maybe you could have gotten first place, but you could have gotten a much worse score. Second is a decent score, bro. And obviously like, you don't need to say that, dude. So sure enough, Ben is in a good mood. He's out of his stink. And uh, uh, two days or not two days go by, Thursday. So the next day, actually, I have to make sure I don't accidentally add like six days to a week or something, six extra days. But anyways, so the next day, it's Thursday. The event happens on Thursday. So at lunch, once again, they hear the horn. And everyone, instead of kind of having that super excited, this is new, this is interesting energy, people almost have a excited yet serious energy. And Ben literally just has an only serious energy especially table B, because they know that this is like, this could literally make or break if someone wins or not. Like you could be number one from the first two activities and it literally wouldn't even matter because this is like 10, so many multiples of points bigger than the other two events, right? So uh, yeah, eventually the camp counselor is like, all right, well guys, this was actually like, this game was my, like the most fun like game. Like the first two games kind of changed depending on the year. But this game actually was like it when I was a when I was a counselor when I was a counselor when I was a camper here like we played this as the last game always. This one's really fun. It is a camp wide hide and seek event, and he basically wanted to say yeah. So I I don't know if I'm supposed to say this either, but basically the winner of this wins the whole thing. So all of a sudden all the kids were like oh shoot so we got a chance now, and so sure enough. They all are instructed to go to the field. There's a big field in the back of the camp. And the president of the camp is like, all right, campers, like this is the final event. And this one is going to be worth five times as many points. So she says all the stuff that they were told beforehand. And she said, here are the rules. One of us will be the one who's seeking, one of the counselors. If you're caught, you now seek with us. It's going to move really quickly. We will play one round of this. Because we're only playing one round, and because we're going to have so many seekers at a certain point, you are allowed to hide anywhere on campus. You cannot hide in a locked room. You cannot hide on top of a roof. You cannot hide in a dangerous place. But other than that, you are allowed to hide anywhere on campus. In an hour from now, we are going to like set off this siren just if anyone else is not still has not been found yet. If you hear the siren... It's not a trick, like you outsmarted all of us, please come back, can't leave campus, whatever, huge violation if you do, you already know the campus grounds, you hear the siren after an hour, that means we'll do something special to decide the winner from there, but yeah, hopefully it doesn't get to that. Um, Go back to your counselors, they're gonna give you a little rundown, and then I'm gonna blow the horn, and after blowing the horn, you have five minutes to find a hiding spot. So obviously, all the kids were pretty excited. Yeah, so uh, they go back to the camp counselor. He tells them, all right, I'm not going to tell you any of the good hiding spots, but there's a lot of good ones around here. And uh, yeah, so sure enough, the, uh, the horn is yell or the horn is blown, and they go off, and they find a hiding spot. And uh, so they're not grouping up. It's all individual. Um, Ryan goes find. Ryan finds an okay hiding spot. Like, he knows he's not going to win the game, but it'll be okay. And uh, yeah, pretty quickly, Ryan is found. Um, he's like, ah, oh, okay, you got me, cool. So now Ryan is one of the finders. And so it's Ryan and this other kid have kind of like grouped up together and they're going to go around finding people and they do. And it's kind of like this big, long group of people. So they all walk by, they walk down like the, the, the cafeteria, they walk into the cafeteria because everywhere on campus is open. Some of the buildings are locked and you can't go in a locked building or whatever, but the cafeteria is open. And Ryan, for some reason, is like, we should check that closet. And they're all like, okay. So sure enough, Ryan opens the closet, and who does he see? He sees Ben, the spoiled kid. And Ben just looks at him with this look of, you, you destroyed my chances. And Ryan's like, ah, ha, ha. and some other kid is like, oh, found you, dude. All right, come help us. And Ben is like, you didn't find me. He like slams the door shut. And like they open it again. They're like, no, bro, we did. And he's like, no, you didn't find me. He slams the door shut again. Eventually, a counselor comes around. He's like, oh, what's going on here? And they kind of like look at him and they look at the, the door. So he opens it up and the counselor is like, all right, dude, we found you. 
and Ben is about to scream, no, you did, oh, because then he sees it's like not a kid, he sees it's a counselor, so he has to agree. Ben walks out, so defeated, so angry, he just doesn't look at anyone, he storms off. He storms off to go do his own thing. Little did anyone know that he was about to do something absolutely crazy. He was storming off to do something insane. So anyways, yeah, yeah. So anyways, uh, they're all just kind of like, they're going around and uh, finding people. And that's when they hear the siren 30 minutes early. They're with a camp counselor and the camp counselor has been constantly on his phone, right? Constantly on his phone for like the last two minutes. And they're all like, oh, why are we hearing the siren? Like, isn't there like a little bit more time to go? The counselor is like, yeah, there's been a change of plans. We all need to go to the field again. So they all walk towards the field and they're just like, this is really weird. Like, I don't know what's going on right now. Like, why are the games ending early? Is, did someone like leave campus and they need to shut down for some reason? Like, it's really weird. They're all standing in the fields, right? So kids are starting to pour in, whatever, right? Kids are saying, I wasn't caught, I wasn't caught. And like the counselors normally during the sirens, if the sirens were called, they would have cared. Like they would have listened in and been like, oh, okay, we'll mark your name down. They didn't even care. Like the counselors were not even paying attention to who was it and who was caught and whatever. It's like they had something more important to think about, which in fact they did. Little did anyone know. So that's when, so Ryan is sitting or the standing with some guys and they're just talking, being like, what's going on? Like this kind of weird. And that's when they hear a kid say, look, look. And so all the kids turn around and he points at the field and he points really far out at the trees. And they see this like smoke coming out from the forest and they see little bits of like fire. They think someone like lit like a, just a normal fire, like in the fire pit, but they see way too much smoke. And they start to realize that there's like a fire going on. And within like, as soon as they realize it's like the fire trucks come in and they see the fire trucks come in, which probably took a while because the camp's off the beaten path, right? Fire trucks are coming in, you know, the camp counselor, counselors are like, all right, guys, we need to do roll call. You need to get with your groups right now. So everyone starts realizing, okay, this is really serious right now. So group B is together. There's one kid who is missing from group B and it is Ben. And so the camp counselor for group B is like, calls up like the staff or whatever. It's like, you guys need to come down here. We're missing a kid. And the staff member comes up, whispers something into the counselor's ear and the counselor's face is just is like shocked. The craziest face ever, right? He's like, oh my God. And after that, he doesn't care that Ben is missing. So at this point, Ryan realizes, okay, Something just happened because this counselor was freaking out that we couldn't find Ben, who's in his group. This woman comes over, says something to him. He looks completely shocked, and now he doesn't care that we can't find Ben. Something happened. So later that night, every kid is picked up. All the parents are grumpy or angry that they have to come a day early because they have to change their plans. The fire was spreading a little bit, but thankfully only one or two buildings got hit. I think one of the cabins got hit. A lot of trees took damage, but the fire department was able to get in there just in time. Before Ryan left, do you remember his friend Sam? So his friend Sam and I were chilling, or he was, Ryan was chilling with some other guys and his friend Sam came up to him because they were all sitting in the cafeteria, whatever, waiting to be picked up. And Sam's like, dude, you're not going to believe this. So Sam goes on to tell him, that through other people and through various reasons, he learned what happened. Basically, Ben, the spoiled kid, was so unbelievably angry that he did not win the number one place, that he did not win the cup, camp tree cup or whatever, that he went into the kitchen and he found all the, the, like the lighters, lighter fluid, everything flammable, anything to make a huge say, a big middle finger to the camp basically. Got all the lighting supplies, went into the woods and just is doused everything with as much flammable stuff as possible, started lighting stuff on fire, and honestly would have gone on a tear through the entire woods, through all the buildings. That's when he was caught by one of the counselors who was like doing hide and seek or whatever. This counselor apparently, because like some other kids were with the counselor when they caught Ben, that's how the word got around really quickly. And so this counselor apparently like tackled Ben, like straight up tackled him, took the lighter out of his hand, 
called for backup. It's like, kids, stay back, stay back, whatever, right? All these other camp counselors come rushing in, whatever, to this location. They call the fire. Crazy, right? So Ryan never hears from Ben again. Ryan goes back the next year because he loved his experience up until that. And apparently all the kids who went that year got like a bit of a, if you want to come back, we'll give you 10% off type deal. So his parents were like, okay, sure. Maybe there's not going to be another arsonist kid who shows up this time if we're lucky. But uh, yeah, um, Ben obviously was not invited back. But the legend of Ben, the kid who got so mad that he tried to burn down the camp, lives on till this day. Spoiled brats think that the world revolves around them. So it's honestly not a surprise that in this story time, the entitled rich kid tries to make the subscriber's birthday all about himself and only ends up ruining the entire party. This is pretty crazy, so let's just jump right into it. So we're gonna call the subscriber who submitted this story Brody, right? So anyways, it was Brody's birthday, and uh, one thing that happens at Brody's school is if any kid there has a birthday party, they must invite every kid in the class. I know this was actually true for my middle school and when I was in like kindergarten through, I don't know, eighth grade probably. But the thing is, the way that they see it is like, they don't want some kids to feel left out. It's a little kind of a bit of it like encroaching on your own ability to pick and choose because it's like, I'm doing this on my own private time. Can I not at least choose the people at my own birthday party? But I kind of do understand where the school is coming from. However you feel about it doesn't matter because either way, Brody had to invite everybody. So there was a spoiled kid in Brody's class. There were maybe a few, but there was one that was really, really bad. And we're just going to call him the spoiled kid. And like every other spoiled kid, he kind of believed that the world was meant to revolve around him. The world did not revolve around the sun. No, that is incorrect. It revolves around the spoiled kid, in fact. Just, I just want to get your facts straight a little bit. So sure enough, you know, the spoiled kid has to be invited to Brody's birthday party as well. So let's jump ahead to the day of the birthday party. So Brody has a really cool birthday party planned. So there's a local mall that is uh, close to everyone who goes to Brody's school. And that mall is pretty well known for putting on pretty good birthdays. So they have a laser tag event. They'll give you pizza. They'll facilitate a really cool birthday party. So anyways, at 3 p.m. on a Saturday is the time for Brody's birthday party. Brody and his mom get there a little bit early so that they can set up and get every, make sure everything is ready. So they get there and people start arriving around three. So the kids and the moms, they all start to show up and Brody sees some of his close friends. We'll say Ben and Tyler, right? They show up. So Brody's really excited. He kind of like pairs off with them. And like, since everyone in his grade is going to be there, Brody knows he doesn't need to talk to everyone or be super like involved with everyone since they're going to be able to pair off with their friends anyways. So the first activity is laser tag. And I don't know if you guys have ever played laser tag at the mall, but it is such a fun activity, dude. Like I genuinely would like to go with my college friends and look, I'm 20, bro. Like this is not just for kids. Laser tag is for all ages because it's a lot of fun. But laser tag, especially back in the day with birthday parties, was just such a fun event in my, like, in my, retro, in my opinion, right? So Brody was really excited for laser tag. So anyways, the, one of the administrators, or st we'll just say the staff, right? So this staff member comes out and says, hey, like, little announcement. Anyone who wants to play laser tag, like, make sure to meet over here in the next five minutes and we'll get you suited up. We'll give you the safety instructional video and then we'll let you go in. Brody was really excited and, you know, he turns to his friends, Tyler and Ben, they're really excited too. And basically everybody in the class wants to do it. I think there's a few kids who didn't want to do it because that's not really their cup of tea or whatever. So they were going to stay out and chill and do some, I don't know, some of the arcade type activities. Because was, there was also like a whole arcade area. So it's like, it wasn't like they weren't going to have fun, right? So sure enough, five minutes passes and everyone's anxiously awaiting for the staff member to come back outside because, you know, he's going to give them the you know, the good news of, all oh, right, like, let's, let's get right into it. So anyways, he brings over all the uniforms. So if you don't, if you've never played laser tag, basically you're given this big metal vest or whatever, or mechanical vest that has like two big, like it has something on the front and something on the back. And you're also given a laser gun that is attached to your metal vest or your mechanical vest. So basically you try and shoot people either in the front or the back because there's a big kind of like target on the front and the back. And if you shoot someone, it will like disable their gun so that they can't shoot other people. And so the goal of it, it's gonna be 2v2, or not 2v2, two, two teams, right? So one team versus the other team. 
And basically, uh, you're trying to eliminate all the other people. And uh, so the guy goes through the safety instructional video, basically says stuff like, don't hit other people. Like, uh, once this is how you do it. This is how you strap it on. Obviously, like, don't climb up on top of anything that isn't supposed to be, like, climbed on top of. So there was a lot of, like, obstacles or whatever and, like, fun decorations in the laser tag room. He basically just said, like, dude, don't climb all over our stuff, please. Like, come on now. And, uh, yeah, so that was it, and they were let in. So uh, the Spoil Kid and Brody were on two different teams. And Brody definitely wanted to win because, I don't know, like, everyone wants to win a laser tag. But the Spoil Kid wanted to win at just the whole new level. Like, the Spoil Kid was willing to just go and, like, he wanted to win. And since, you know, the whole world revolves around the Spoil Kid, obviously, you know, he wasn't going to let anything stop him from, like, letting, from winning, right? Nothing was going to stop this kid from winning. So sure enough, right, uh, they go in there and they're have first round, they're having a lot of fun. And the spoil kid is very, like, going very sweaty, very trying his very hardest to, like, dodge bullets and shoot people down. I mean, everyone is. You can't really blame the spoil kid on this. But uh, basically, the spoil kid gets shot in, like, his little vest thing. So his vest lights up, and then his laser gun stops working. And the spoil kid's like, that wasn't fair. And the kid who, like, shot him was like, dude, what do you mean that wasn't fair? He's like, I wasn't ready. Which, like, bro... What do you mean you weren't ready? Of course you weren't ready. That's the whole point. Like, they got you when you weren't seeing it coming or you just weren't prepared. If you were prepared, the person wouldn't have gotten you. That's the whole point of the game, dude. But yeah, so sure enough, the spoiled kid starts, like, yelling or whatever. And most kids aren't even paying attention to this. But, you know, uh, Brody, the subscriber, is aware of this. Because I feel like Brody, as, like, the guest or... He's not the guest, the host of his party, he needs to be... He's always, like, a little bit more aware of how things are going how people are talking with each other, stuff along those lines, right? Um, so, yeah, he kind of notices all of this, even though most people don't. The thing is, though, the spoil kid, right, he is starting to get really upset. Like, he's like, I wasn't ready. I demand a redo. Like, this is unacceptable. So the spoil kid walks up to the staff member who's in there just to make sure everything's going normally. And oh, the kids go back to playing, right? If you get tagged, you kind of sit to the side and watch as other people play, like, with the laser guns, right? So this kid, the spoil kid, goes up to the, the, uh, the, the staff member, and he's like, I, this guy shot me when I wasn't ready. And the staff member looks at him kind of like, dude, what do you mean you weren't ready? This isn't really all about, like, are you ready or not? It's, and he, he says to him, like, oh, sorry, man, like, we're playing another round, so just wait until then. The spoiled kid very angrily is like, fine. And he kind of like walks over to the side and like grumpily sits against the wall. And it's like, dude, like chill out. It's literally laser tag. And it's not even like the one game and you're done. You have multiple more rounds to go. I don't know, man. Ne next time, just do better. <laughs> just don't get shot, bro. Like, I don't know. Is it really that hard? So sure enough, eventually there's a winning team. Because the birthday kid, a.k.a. Uh, Brody, his team has three people, the other team has zero at the very end, so they win. And they decide, so the teams are reshuffled, um, and they go again. This time, Brody and the Spoiled Kid are on the same team. And the Spoiled Kid is like, goes up to Brody and is like, yo, dude, we gotta be like doubles or whatever. Basically going up to the kid being like, you and I, let's like flank them together. And you know, the Spoiled Kids or the Brody, the birthday kid's like, yeah, sure, dude, whatever, cool. So they start the round, and they're going in, and Brody and the Spoil Kid are actually a pretty good duo. They're doing pretty good. So Brody and the Spoil Kid are kind of, you know, taking people down, taking big Ws. They're doing really well, but this one guy outflanked both of them and was able to shoot both of them and get them both out really quickly. And the Spoil Kid is like, what? And Brody's like, oh, well, good shot, man, whatever. And Brody's like, all right, man, let's go to the side and see how our team does. And the spoiled kid is like, no, -uh, I'm not doing that, man. That guy was obviously cheating. And Brody's like, what? And the spoiled kid's like, yeah, he was like hacking IRL. And Brody's like, dude, what do you mean hacking IRL? Like, how does someone hack IRL? Like, I, isn't that just called cheating? Like, I, I just don't understand where you're coming from here. And so anyways, right, you know, Brody keeps going on about, like, or the spoiled kid goes on about, like, ah, uh, yeah, it's, uh, he was cheating, he was doing something. So he goes up, right, goes up to the staff guy, and he starts complaining again. And the staff guy remembers him, the spoiled kid, as the last kid from last time who was complaining over nothing. 
So the staff member looks at him and is like, little bro, like, you got to stop. Like, you got, you got tagged by the laser gun. You got to chill out, and you're good, whatever. So at this point, the spoiled kid, instead of just going back, returns back into the battlefield. But remember, his laser gun no longer works because he got tagged. So instead of fighting people with the laser gun or, like, shooting people with the laser gun, he takes the laser gun and he starts swinging at people on the enemy team. He just starts swinging at them with the laser gun, trying to, like, hit them with it. And remember, this is a pretty big, chunky piece of plastic, right? This isn't, like, some, I don't know, some big metal sword or something. But it is, like, if you make good contact with someone's head or something, it's definitely going to hurt a little bit. Like, it, I don't know. So, sure enough, uh, the staff member sees this, and he has to literally pause the game. Like, he has to shut down the whole game. He's like, no, 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 you can't be doing that. Stop, stop. And the spoiled kid's like swinging. He's like, meow, meow, meow. He's just like swinging on it. They have to pause the game. The staff member has to escort the spoiled kid out of the whole game or whatever. And because the staff member has to go escort him out of the game, the game is turned off. And it's like 15 minutes of like the staff member like dealing with the spoiled kid. And by the time the staff member gets back, he's like, hey guys, I'm so sorry but your time slot is up. There's another party that's coming in in the next five minutes. So we got to call this short. So yeah, basically because of the spoiled kid, um, they had to stop playing. Like they had to cut their, uh, th their laser tag a little bit early, which is just the first of many things the spoiled kid has done. Real quick comment tag down below. That'll be the secret word of the day. Uh, also, if, if you want to listen on Spotify, it'll be the pinned comment in the description. There'll be a link in there. And if you're listening on Spotify, please rate five stars. And finally, the best way to support the channel, the very best way to support the channel on YouTube, is to just binge watch these videos. So please let me know how many of these videos have you watched today? Because the more videos you watch on the channel, the more you support it, and I really appreciate it. I'm just curious who's watching the videos, and I'd love to hear it. So anyways, let's get back to it as as Brody's birthday is about to be completely destroyed by the spoiled kid. So anyways, laser tag was the first activity, but now it was time for cake. Yeah, so sure enough, uh, the Brody, the birthday kid's mom, is like, all right, guys, let's go to the whatever lunch table type thing, because it, like it was like an arcade setting. So there's a lot of arcade games, a ball pit, obviously the laser tag, but you needed to reserve that. And then the... Sorry, and then there was also kind of like a, a, a lunch type area that they reserved for like parties or whatever. And Brody's parents reserved one of the tables. And so they're all heading over and they sat down. So the first thing that they had was like pizza or whatever. And there was no issues there. The spoiled kid didn't like eat all the pizza or something. He's not, he's not that big of a boy, right? Um, but the issue comes when it's time for cake. So in a, a lot of, at least a lot of people I know, the tradition for your birthday is you come out with a cake and you have a bunch of candles and the person whose birthday it is blows out the candles. And it's really not a thing for anyone else to blow out those candles unless the birthday kid explicitly says, hey, I want everyone to blow out the candles with me or I want someone to, like unless the kid says it out loud, like it is just super, super not a cool thing for you to just go ahead and blow them out. However, right, you have to remember the spoiled kid truly believes that the world revolves around him. He genuinely believes that if he wants something, he should get it, and it's justified, because if he wants, he should get. So sure enough, right, the spoiled kid felt like he wasn't getting enough attention. I mean, he just came off of not winning uh, the laser tag, which made him big mad, right? So at this point, he also isn't getting all the attention from literally everyone, which is an absolute crime, I 100% agree. Sarcasm. So uh, the spoiled kid is noticing that, you know, after eating all the pizza or whatever, like some parents go behind, like they walk away and then they come out. And so the spoiled, uh, sorry, not the spoiled kid, the birthday kid, Brody, his mom comes out with a cake, it has a bunch of candles on it, they're all lit, and they all start singing happy birthday. So happy, like they're singing the happy birthday song. They're moving like, uh, sorry, the spo not the spoiled kid. The birthday kid, Brody's mom, has come walking over very slowly to the table with the cake. And Brody's sitting down, and the spoiled kid happens to be sitting down right next to him. So uh, Brody's mom puts the cake on the table, and the idea is at the end of singing happy birthday, Brody, as the birthday kid, is going to be the one who blows out the candles. 
But right before the song ends, the spoiled kid is like, <sighs> blows out all the candles. And literally everyone goes dead silent. They don't even finish the song. They just go dead silent. It's a super awkward situation. I really don't know what went through the spoiled kid's mind. I think he was like, oh my God, I'm not getting all the attention at this very second. This is unacceptable. I must get all the attention always. So he decided that he wanted to be the one who blew out the candles. Uh, so yeah, the spoiled kid's mom sees this and is like, oh no, dude. Cause look, everyone knows that you don't blow out someone else's candles, bro. That's the worst thing you can do. I'm sure there's worse things, but you know what I mean. Not a great thing to do. So, uh, you know, Brody doesn't take it that, like, he doesn't, like, take it that personally. He doesn't really care that much. He's like, okay, well, I kind of wanted to blow the candles out, but whatever, I guess, right? I'll just have some of the cake, right? You know, it's, it's cool. It's whatever. But so the spoiled kid's mom, like, immediately after the spoiled kid, well, after, like, 20 seconds of an awkward silence, after he blows out the candles comes over and the spoiled kid mom like grabs him by the scruff of his like shirt or whatever and drags him out to like another room, a private, like a private room to go talk with him or something to give him a little bit of a talk because he needs a little bit of a talking to right now. So the spoiled kid was out of the picture for a little bit. So they're all having cake or whatever and the spoiled kid's mom eventually walks back into the room. But the spoiled kid does not walk back into the room with her. So uh, Brody, the birthday boy, overhears his mom walk over to the spoiled kid's mom and say, hey, does your son want a piece of cake? Like, we can walk, like, where is he? And the spoiled kid's mom says, oh, he's in a timeout right now. I'm so sorry for what my son did, stuff like that, right? Like, I'm sorry, I feel really bad. He will not be getting any cake. He will not be, re be rewarded for such bad behavior, stuff like that. And Brody's mom was like, oh, okay. Brody's mom was not going to like push back on this because I think Brody's mom 100% agreed that it is totally not okay behavior to like blow out someone else's candles. And yeah, maybe I don't think she really wanted to give the spoiled kid any cake, but I think she felt like she, like she kind of needed to just out of like, I don't know, out of common courtesy or whatever. So yeah, uh, anyways, uh, the spoiled kid is not done. You guys might be thinking, oh, the spoiled kid, you know, destroyed like the, uh, the laser tag game. He blew out the candles. That's pretty bad. Nope. The spoiled kid is not done yet because while he was put in a quote unquote timeout, that basically meant that the spoiled kid had free reign to go wherever he wanted and do whatever damage that he wanted. Because the spoiled kid's mom was not staying in there when he was in the quote-unquote timeout. She came back. And uh, yeah, that was about to be a pretty, mis pretty big mistake by her. So sure enough, after cake, it's time to open the presents. And so anyways, when people first arrived at 3 on that Saturday, there was a big table right in the front of the room that said, Brody's party, put presents here, whatever. So all the people went over there and that's where they put the presents. So the whole idea was after cake, everyone was gonna walk back into the main arcade type area and they were gonna like watch as Brody went through and opened up all the presents. I know at least for a lot of birthday parties that you know I went to and even my own back in like fourth, fifth grade or whatever, I would never have this section. Like I would just, people would bring presents sometimes but I wouldn't open them in front of them because I feel like if you don't you either have to give everyone the same reaction or no reaction because I kind of feel like when you're opening presents in front of people like if you're like oh thanks and then you're like oh my god thank you to a different one you know you just make the people feel bad and so it was just so much easier just to not open presents in front of people but a lot of people do do it either way so anyways the plan was for Brody to go in and open up all the presents However, the spoiled kid, who has ruined everything up until this point, has also ruined this. So anyways, everyone's kind of done eating their cake. So, you know, Brody's mom says, all right, guys, let's get up and let's go into the arcade room so we can open some presents. And by we, she meant they can watch her son open presents, as that's how it normally goes. Why would anyone else besides him open the presents? Hint, hint. So anyways, they all walk in. And when they walk in, they see a crazy sight in front of them. They see something that they were not expecting. 
Basically, this is the spoiled kid's revenge. So they walk into the arcade room, and instead of seeing a big pile of wrapped presents, they see a massive pile of shredded wrapping paper on the floor. And uh, they see all these like presents like all over the place, unwrapped. Some of them have literally been opened up and played with. And sure enough, the spoiled kid is sitting right in the middle of all this chaos. So basically what happened is when the spoiled kid was put on a quote unquote timeout, instead of just sitting there, he decided to wander around and he saw a big table full of presents that he did know were for Brody. And he was like, you know what, I'm bored and the world revolves around me. So I'm just gonna open up all these presents as if these were my presents to open up in the first place. Yeah, I'm not even kidding right now. So sure enough, the spoiled kid had opened up every single present and had actually like, not just like unwrapped them, had literally broken the plastic off of, he was building some Legos when they came in there. And at that point, the spoiled kid's mom was like, oh my God, like Jeremy, let's call the spoiled kid Jeremy, like Jeremy, what have you done? And obviously like Brody, the subscriber is pretty disappointed. He's like, dude, what? Cause like, the presents you get are cool, but honestly, such a big part of the present, like the, the, the joy of it, is the anticipation as you're opening it up. Like that's sometimes better than the present itself, I'm not gonna lie. So the spoiled kid basically stole that from him. The, the spoiled kid at this point has stolen the laser tag, stolen blowing out the candles, and stolen the joy of opening the presents. So the spoiled kid's mom grabs him goes up to the Brody's mom and is like, you apologize to Brody and his mom right now. And the spoiled kid's like, I'm sorry for, I don't know. He gives some like really trash apology. And she's like, I'm so sorry. I'm going to take my son out of here and punish him or something. So yeah, the spoiled kid's mom, I'm sure, quote unquote, punishes him by saying, that was very bad. Okay, here's some ice cream. Just give some like trash punishment because if she was a good parent in the first place, stuff like this just wouldn't be happening, bro. That's all I'm trying to say. So yeah, the spoiled kid is escorted out of there. Um, and uh, you know, it was just kind of Brody and all the other people. Like the parents were like, oh, we're so sorry this happened. And Brody's like, no, it's fine. Um, can you guys just tell me who gave what? Cause now I don't know. So what ended up happening was it was almost like a little, it, they recovered a little bit. So basically, each kid would run into the pile of, un, of opened presents and they would go and like Brody would turn around with his eyes closed. So the kids would run in, they would grab their present for Brody and then they would like walk over and hand it to him. So there was still a little bit of a surprise factor. So yeah, shout out to Brody's mom for kind of saving the birthday at the end. And also moral of the, spo moral of the story is don't be a spoiled kid, dude. Look, if you have a sibling, you may find them annoying sometimes. But hey, at least they won't try and sell your cherished pet behind your back like the siblings in today's story did. This is quite a crazy one, so strap in and let's just jump right into it. So we're gonna call the subscriber who submitted today's story, Sebastian. So anyways, Sebastian was the older of, or the older of one of two siblings. So we had a younger brother. Sebastian was 18 and his younger brother was 16. Sebastian was a senior in high school. His younger brother was a, a sophomore in high school and they both lived with their parents. This story all happened oh, after over the course of like a couple weeks, but it all started one day when Sebastian was going out to see his friends and he was leaving for the weekend. At this time, Sebastian's and Sebastian's brother, we're gonna call Sebastian's brother Ben for the rest of this video. So Sebastian and Ben's parents were gone on a very long kind of vacation, whatever. Basically, Sebastian and Ben's parents had been, their relationship was kind of rocky for a little bit. So, and they've just gotten it back together and they wanted to kind of just have basically another honeymoon, like 20 years into their relationship. They kind of try and rekindle things. And uh, yeah, so they were gone for many, many weeks. They trusted Sebastian to be the good older brother to take care of his younger brother, Ben, and to make sure that the house was in order. However, they were also okay with Sebastian going out for a little bit and seeing his friends. So Sebastian went over to his friend's house one night. More context, Sebastian and Ben and his family, they have a dog. 
However, it really is Sebastian's dog because Sebastian, many years ago, for his birthday, really wanted to have a dog and his parents were not really looking for a dog in their life. It was, they had a lot of responsibilities already. They were stretched pretty thin between their two kids. But they said to Sebastian, we will get you this dog as long as you promise that it will be your responsibility. Sebastian, you know, got the dog for his birthday. It was kind of the family dog, but it really was Sebastian's dog, which makes what the younger brother is going to do even worse. You guys kind of have a hint by the title, but let's jump into the story with all that important context given. So this all happened one weekend. Sebastian was heading out just for one night to go see his friend who lived in another town. So Sebastian was getting his stuff together and he saw his brother was in his room on the computer or whatever. So Sebastian walks by, he's like, hey bro, you know I'm going out tonight? And you know, Ben's like, yeah dude, I know you're going out. And Sebastian's like, all right, well, uh, make sure to feed the dog, make sure to lock up. Um, you, there's food in the fridge, just heat it up on like the oven or microwave or whatever. And if you need anything, you know, you got my number. And Ben's like, dude, don't worry. I'm only two years younger than you. Like, you don't need to worry about me. Thank you, but have a good night. And, you know, Sebastian's like, all right, word, cool, whatever. Sebastian gets in his car and he drives off to go see his friend. Sebastian has a good time seeing his friend, but that's kind of irrelevant to the situation. As Sebastian comes back and, you know, drives back into the house and he opens up the door. He also sees that the second car that they left there was missing. And that basically means that, you know, probably Ben was out of the house. So Ben would go sometimes take like one of the cars that they had in their driveway, go to the mall, go see his friends. So it wasn't really surprising to see Ben leave randomly. But one thing that was really surprising that was a little bit strange right off the bat was when Ben walked, or sorry, when Sebastian walked back into his house, he didn't hear his dog bark. And I don't know if you guys have dogs. I have dogs or I have a dog and I've had dogs in the past. And I think I've always lived with dogs except for very short periods in between when they've passed away. In every single case, when the door is open, the dog comes running down, barking, saying hello. It's always a very, very powerful greeting. One of the reasons why I love dogs so much is no one will give you, and I mean no one, will give you the same unconditional excitement to see you coming home. You know, you got a girlfriend, boyfriend, partner, mother, father. They might love you more because they have more co emotional capacity to love you, but they are not going to have the same level of blind enthusiasm to see you every single day. So Sebastian was a little bit taken aback by the fact that when he opened the door, no one came running to him to say hello. So he thought, okay, well, uh, my dog is probably sleeping. So Sebastian kind of walks in the house. He puts his stuff away. And after just being there for about 30 minutes, it just feels really weird. So he starts going around the house yelling the dog's name. We're going to call the, the dog Teddy because that was one of my old dog's names. So he's like, Teddy, my Teddy, Teddy. And uh, after going throughout the entire house, Teddy's nowhere to be found. Uh, looks in all the sleeping spaces. Teddy sometimes sleeps in specific little corners or whatever. Teddy is nowhere to be found. So Sebastian is starting to get a little bit nervous. And uh, he's kind of looking all around. And that's when he hears the door open. It's Ben. Ben is coming back from doing whatever Ben is doing. Sebastian was pretty sure that Ben was going out to go see his friend. Little did he know that, Seb that Ben was doing a something a little bit more nefarious. So when uh, Ben walks through the door, Sebastian immediately says, do you know where Teddy is? And Ben looks a little like taken aback. He's like, oh, what do you mean? Is uh, Teddy not here? And you know, Sebastian's like, no. Like when I came back, you know, he, he didn't greet me at the door. So I just thought he was asleep. And after a while, I decided to look around for him. I looked all over the house and he's not here. So Ben's like, oh, well, maybe he's in the house and you just didn't see him. And Sebastian's like, maybe, maybe I, I don't know. Like, do you want to help me look? And Ben's like, aha, uh -huh, sure. So Ben kind of, it, I don't know. Sebastian was so worried about where his dog was that he wasn't picking up the slight signals that Ben was being a little weird. The Ben was just being a little strange and awkward and uncomfortable. He didn't put two and two together because why would you? Anyways, so, you know, they're walking around the house and Sebastian's like, Teddy, Teddy, where are you, right? I mean, this is, this is his beloved dog, dude. Like, I would be really, really concerned and sad and frightened and all that stuff if, my, if I came home and my dog was gone and she was supposed to be here, right? So they're going around, you know, Teddy, Teddy, like, where are you? Whatever. And by the end of it, like after about 20 minutes later, Sebastian kind of comes to the conclusion, Teddy's not in this house. 
So at this point, they think, like, Ben's like, well, maybe, I don't know, Teddy escaped somehow. Like, I don't know how, but maybe he did. And so Sebastian's like, I don't know how that's possible, but that's, like, the only thing that makes sense. So they start walking around the neighborhood, or they're driving around the neighborhood, and Sebastian's like, I'm going to keep driving. How about you get out? You start walking around. And Ben, who really does know the truth here, is like, oh, okay, sure. And obviously Ben doesn't put the same effort into it because he knows exactly where Teddy is. Because he just sold Teddy to a, someone in their, na- not their neighborhood, but someone who lives near them because he wanted some money. Yep, I'm not even kidding you. But here's the thing, Sebastian doesn't know this yet and all, this, all the truth will be revealed shortly. So anyways, after about three to four hours of driving around, Sebastian is completely distraught, but he also feels extremely defeated. So he goes back home, and at this point, he realizes, okay, I, sh- I gotta be efficient about this, I gotta be quick about this. If you guys have ever watched, I don't know, there's like TV shows or dramas of like when someone goes missing, you know, the first 24 hours is the most important. Obviously, that's a different situation, but definitely, like, the, the, 